This is Audible. Alexander's Cherished Submissive, Submissive's Wish Book Three, written by Anne Mayburn, narrated by Edo De Angelis and Stephanie Wiles. Chapter One. Seven years ago, Dublin, Ireland. Alexander Novikov lounged in a not so well lit back corner of a cavernous room, relaxing in the boisterous atmosphere. Rain had dampened the wool of his jacket, releasing the musk of the fabric every time he shifted. A hint of the sweet scent of pipe tobacco had seeped into the bones of the building, which, on damp nights like this, released the ghostly smell of phantom smoke. In a neat twist of fate, the place he found himself in tonight was a high-end working man's bar that had seen more than its fair share of violence, but still managed to retain its weathered glory. One of his favorite places on earth to visit, even if he was here for bratva business, the pub had been around since the 1700s and was controlled by the Irish mafia for almost as long. In spite of the frequent fights and roughhousing, the bar itself was crafted of rock-solid aged wood that had taken on a rich patina over the years, giving the thick planks an almost silky look. The mullioned windows and stained glass, which looked out into a bleary view of the street, were either original or excellent reproductions. Carefully trimmed ivy grew over portions of the intricate brickwork on the exterior of the building, and well-maintained flower boxes on the upper-level windows allowed the bar to blend in nicely with its upscale neighborhood. Regardless of the fact that the pub was often filled with clientele of a rougher sort, there were rarely any conflicts. Anyone who came here for a drink knew better than to make any trouble. Peter Cleary, the owner of this establishment and a good portion of Dublin, didn't suffer fools gladly. Probably one of the reasons Alex got along with him so well, and nothing that was about to happen tonight would endanger their friendship. While he would do everything he could to minimize any disturbance, the man he was hunting was at the top of a long list of assassinations he'd been assigned. As powerful as Peter was, the Novikov Bratva was a deadly leviathan lurking in the criminal depths that sharks like the Cleary Mafia could only begin to imagine. Still, that didn't mean Alex liked creating problems for one of the few men he considered more than a business acquaintance. Alex had been coming to this bar for over ten years for work and pleasure, and even though it almost felt like home, he was on high alert. Without being conspicuous, he constantly scanned the crowd while sipping his pint of dark lager, knowing that he blended in perfectly. When he traveled abroad on family business, to dress like a local and not to draw attention to himself, and even if he hadn't, no one would have been stupid enough to try and pick a fight with him. He'd grown up in a landscape saturated with violence, and it had marked his soul. Despite being in a heightened state of readiness, he kept his mask of indifference in place, and carefully nondescript indifference that could be interpreted by people in many ways. Most of those assumptions would be wrong. As he scanned over the crowd again, his gaze invariably honed in on the pretty, auburn-haired young woman tending the bar at his end of the long room. She was new. During his frequent visits, Alex had bedded most of the waitstaff who worked here, but he had an unusually powerful desire to be balls deep in the oddly beguiling young woman. He'd been with some great beauties, females so amazing they'd won prizes for their attractiveness, and none of them had drawn his attention like this. The redhead was attractive in a sweet way, but she didn't hold any of the exotic, sultry promise he preferred in his conquests. But he was unable to stop watching her. As he stared at her, he tried to puzzle out why he couldn't keep his eyes off of her and focus on his hunt. Being distracted by a female while on assignment never happened. He was calm, cool, analytical, and focused. Even when he was a boy, he could concentrate to the point where he was impossible to distract. Yet here he was, daydreaming about long, dark, cherry red hair wrapped around a pale, slender body. She reminded him of a dancer, all grace and flowing motions. Then she grinned, and his heart gave a hard thud. In that one second, she transformed from merely pretty to stunning. He'd never seen anyone smile with such open happiness before. 
It led her from within, making her pale skin seem almost luminescent in the dim golden lighting of the pub. Her teeth revealed by her parted pink lips were perfect, lovely. She must have been some dentist's pride and joy. Alex imagined her smiling at him, and something funny twisted in his stomach, a craving to know her in a very intimate way that only grew stronger as he observed her. The first time he'd seen her three days ago when he arrived in Ireland, he'd made note of her. He'd been fascinated by the tall, graceful woman with the most beautiful hair he'd ever seen. It was natural. Her red eyebrows and fair lashes along with freckles attested to that. And when she happened to look his way, he sucked in a breath at the sight of her feline-like bright blue eyes. Exotic eyes that would haunt the man lucky enough to see them. The dazzling gaze of an enchantress in the face of an innocent. When she grew into her unusual beauty, she would be breathtaking. He hoped she'd notice him, but she seemed to be ignoring his part of the room. The more he studied her out of the corner of his eye, the more he realized she was avoiding looking at him on purpose, doing everything she could to keep from turning her face in his direction. Right now, she was talking to a customer who was getting a good eyeful of her bare belly while she reached for a glass from the rack above the bar. The skin of her slender torso was pure, creamy perfection, and he wondered where her freckles stopped. The purple silk blouse she wore with its artful draping complemented her lean form, and he knew her small, firm tits would fill his mouth perfectly. When she bent and reached a certain way, a sliver of the delicate curve of her breast was revealed by the loose armhole of her shirt. Overhead speakers hidden among the scrolling crown molding piped out Sarah McLachlan, singing some song about being happy. His breath caught as the slender woman unconsciously danced to the beat, a flowing movement that reminded him of the way the women of the Russian ballet moved. Her breasts swayed while she shifted her arms in time to the music, even her graceful fingers becoming part of the dance. His mind drifted to thoughts of slipping up behind her, of filling his hands with her warmth while he buried his face in all that fabulous hair and ground his erection into her pert bottom. Shifting uncomfortably as his dick began to harden, he tore his eyes from the new bartender and returned to scanning the crowd while nursing his beer. She distracted him far too easily, and he needed to focus. This was not a vacation. This was work. There was a man here, Jake, who Alex needed to follow home, then dispose of. Jake had crossed the wrong people in Russia, and Alex's unique skill set had been called into action. So far, the man had proven hard to track down, but Alex had cashed in a favor with a female business associate, and she had managed to lure Jake here tonight. He should be focusing on his hunt, not hoping for another glimpse of the bartender's bright smile. Jake's bellowing laugh rang across the room, drawing Alex's attention back to his target. He was a red-faced, sweaty, wasted-off-his-middle-aged-ass mess, and Alex couldn't wait to be done with this assignment. Damn that stupid fuck for being so greedy. Jake lived well, but like so many, was never satisfied with what he had. He always wanted more, and he thought he could get it by stealing from Jorg Novikov. Thought that because the head of the Novikov Bratva was old, he was also weak. Jake was about to find out how wrong he was. The drugs Alex had slipped into Jake's drink should have been kicking in, so his mark was probably only minimally aware of his surroundings. Alex wished he had more time to make the man pay, but he needed this job to be over with. The disgusting pig of a man was now pawing at the woman he'd come in with, his meaty, sweaty hands leaving invisible trails of slime on her. He could see the disgust on her face from across the room. Alex would have to throw a couple extra thousand euros her way for enduring the fat man's touch. Watching his mark, Alex tried to get the taste of anger out of his mouth by taking a long drink. The fucker had left behind a young son in Russia, who was now living with his grandparents, his mother already dead, and his father about to be. A child who could have been used to punish Jake could have been killed for his father's sins, while this waste of humanity sat in a pub in Ireland, getting drunk with stolen money. Alex curled his lip in disgust and stood, 
cursing the stupid fuck for making him fly all the way out here to get rid of him. There was nowhere, nowhere on earth the fat man could run and hide. Nowhere that the Novikov Bratva didn't have eyes, ears and friends willing to die for them, and powerful people who owed them favors. Even if Jake went to the Arctic Circle, Alex would be there with a rifle waiting behind a snowdrift to finish his pathetic life. Then again, Jake fleeing to Ireland did give Alex the excuse to be away from the craziness of Moscow. They'd just taken over another Bratva's prostitution business, and there had been many replacements made with management, meaning he'd had to end the lives of a couple dozen abusive, monstrous pimps, a necessary evil that had been assigned to him, and a task he hadn't minded doing. A year ago, the old leader of the Sokolov Bratva had been overthrown, and the new man in charge didn't give a shit about the women working for him. As a result, the prostitutes decided to leave the Sokolov Bratva's protection for the Novikov Bratva, which took care of those who worked for them. A few of the pimps had tried to reclaim their girls, but Alex had taken great pleasure in helping Dimitri send a brutal message of what would happen if anyone hurt the women. This time, in the form of the tortured body of one of the pimps dumped in the alley behind one of the Sokolov's brothels. Thankfully, Dimitri was slipping into his role as head of the prostitution arm of the Novikov Bratva nicely, a heavy responsibility for any 22-year-old. But Dimitri was passionate about the safety of the women working for them and took his job seriously. This allowed Alex to focus on the more legitimate businesses of the Novikov Empire, to be the public face of the organization. An odd job for someone who was also his father's favorite assassin. Over on the other side of the lengthy antique bar, which took up the far wall, two balding old men threw their arms around each other's shoulders and sang a Novki Celtic song with their eyes closed and faces tipped to the ceiling. Other men laughed and held their drinks up, singing along with gusto. Even the bartenders got into it, and he found himself and the young redhead were the only people in the bar not singing. Their eyes met through the crowd, and he had a moment of feeling a deep connection. Her gaze held his, and her lips parted, and her hard nipples pressed against her top. He needed to kiss her until the taste of her filled his mouth, and suck on those unbelievably puffy pink lips. She turned away first, her eyes lowered, and then looked up and laughed as the old man finished their song, clapping and giving them a smile that put roses in her cheeks. Irish beauty through and through something he'd developed a taste for over the last few years. Not that he didn't think Russian women weren't the most stunning women in the world, he did, but he'd been spending more and more time in Western Europe at his father, Jorg's command. It was no secret Alex was the favorite son for inheriting control of the Novikov Bratva after the old man passed. Jorg wanted Alex to spend time with the various organizations, criminal and otherwise, that supported the Novikovs to remind them that the Novikov Bratva was something to be feared. But Alex spent more time forming bonds of friendship than he did menacing their allies, much to his father's aggravation and reluctant admiration. Ruling wasn't just about violence and intimidation. A wise man valued willing loyalty more than fearful service. Or, at least, Alex tried to. Jorg was perfectly fine with being one of the most dreaded men in the deadly world of the Russian Mafia, the boogeyman criminals warned each other about. He believed might made right and expected his sons to feel the same way. Unfortunately for Jorg, Alex and his brother Dimitri had been heavily influenced in their upbringing by their uncle Petrov, a man just as powerful as Jorg, but with a devoted following of men and women who would die for the Dubinsky Bratva. Petrov Dubinsky was Alex's mother's brother and successfully ran a powerful bratva of his own. Uncle Petrov offered not only power and money to the people who worked for him, he also offered peace and safety for them and their families, as well as prosperity. Something more valuable than gold and diamonds, something his men would do anything to protect without hesitation. Alex found his gaze wandering back to the girl, smiling at a customer as she filled his mug with dark beer. When her slender, pale fingers gripped the old brass spigot, he couldn't help but imagine what it would be like to have her hand wrapped around his cock. 
He wanted to fuck that delicate redhead until she turned pink all over. His erection started to get harder, and he tried to calm himself down. This rampant, almost uncontrollable arousal irritated him. He wasn't ruled by his dick. He had better self-control than this. He could sit in a sniper blind for days without moving more than an inch in any direction, and he'd never lost his head over a female. Because of who he was, he could have hundreds of the most desirable women in the world on their knees begging for him if he wanted. Back home in Moscow, he had over a dozen women, gorgeous, refined, experienced, and all eagerly waiting for his phone call. Of course, he never seriously dated any of them, but he did shower the one he was currently fucking with expensive gifts before he set her aside. And when he was done, he was done. The women he picked were aware of the reality of their situation and were fine with how things worked. Perhaps he should see if the lovely bartender would be open to such an arrangement. Across the room, Jake pushed back from his table on unsteady legs and headed in the direction of the bathroom, occasionally bumping into someone with a muttered apology. With his empty glass in hand, Alex approached the bar, his view of the windowless bathroom and hall perfect. So if his drunk Mark tried to leave out the back, Alex would know without hovering too close and tipping Jake off. The redhead behind the bar ignored him until he cleared his throat. Three times. When she finally turned around, it was with a sour twist to her lovely Cupid's bow lips. Up this close, he marveled at how ethereal she appeared, how delicate. Like she was a princess out of one of the illustrated fairy tales his mother had read to him when he was young. Her eyes were captivating, the brightest cornflower blue he'd ever seen, rimmed in a thin line of navy and framed with long red-gold lashes. She snapped him out of his silent appreciation when she spoke with a terse American accent. Can I help you? He raised a brow, and a slight blush pinked her cheeks. He enjoyed that color on her. Porcelain skin like hers would show her every emotion and every spank of his hand. He forced his voice to remain calm, even though desire tightened his gut. Another dark lager. When he gave her his most charming smile, her frown grew even more pronounced. Either his charisma was gone, or this woman did not like him for some reason. Without another word, she turned and got his drink as quickly as she could. He kept his gaze on the bathroom, which now had a line forming, while waiting for Jake to come out. The slam of his beer on the bar, accompanied by a small splash of liquid onto his hand, drew his gaze back to her instantly. Her eyes darted to his wet hand, and she sighed, then said in a softer voice, Sorry about that. Let me get something to clean you up with. When she looked up at him through her lashes, the need for her touch overwhelmed him, but he had a feeling she'd bolt if he attempted to so much as caress her cheek. Is all right. She blinked at him, some of her ire melting away as curiosity took its place. He held her gaze and found himself unable to look away, drawn to her obvious inquisitiveness, like a moth to the flame. A tingle of electricity moved through him, and he rubbed the suddenly sensitive tips of his fingers against the smooth edge of the glass holding his beer. Even though she was pretty with her high cheekbones and pouty pink lips, it was the spirit shining in her unguarded gaze that captured him. It had been a long, long time since he'd been around a woman who had so few barriers between herself and the world. He wondered who this American girl was and what she was doing here in Peter Cleary's pub. Usually Peter's girls were more experienced. Many of them happily entertained Peter's men, but this woman didn't strike him as the type to spread her legs for a bunch of thugs. When she continued to stare at him, he cleared his throat. Dowell? What? Oh, yeah, right. He had to hide his smile as she fetched a clean towel and returned to the bar with pink cheeks. Jake had yet to appear, but Alex could care less about the $250,000 hit at the moment. The only thing he could focus on was how soft and good her slender fingers felt against his hand, even if she was wiping him down as quickly as possible. 
More of that unusual but not unpleasant electricity arced between them as she quickly cleaned him. If this rare chemistry between them carried over into the bedroom, fucking her would be a once-in-a-lifetime experience. Desire clouded his mind and his accent thickened. What is your name? Her voice came out quiet but firm. None of your business. My name is Alex Gorev. It was actually Alex Novikov, but he strictly went by aliases while in Western Europe and was known in this area of the world as Gorev. She arched a delicate brow at him, then snorted. <laughs> I've been warned about you. She had such an adorable scowl when she said that, and his cock thickened. If she was his submissive, he'd be fucking her sassy little mouth right now. Warned? Yep. She glowered at him, her fingers tapping on her arm, the thick silver ring she wore on her thumb flashing in the warm light. He wondered if she'd been warned about his darker, carnal habits or his being a high-ranking member of the Novikov Bratva. It was hard to contain his anger, something unusual for him, as he spoke louder than he intended. Who warned you? What did they say? She seemed taken aback, her jaded expression slipping, leaving one of alarm as he snarled at her. Evidently, the young woman had not been around many men who raised their voices if her wide eyes were any indication. He would have to keep the fact that she was unused to dealing with a man like him in mind in the future. Gentling his tone as much as he could, his voice still came out unusually low as he said, Tell me. What has been said about me? I deserve to know. While they were talking, the wait at the bar for a drink had built up, leaving the other bartender giving the beautiful redhead some pointed looks. With a sigh, the woman he was strangely obsessed with crossed her arms beneath her small breasts, pressing the fabric against them, giving Alex a great view of her thick, stiff nipples. He watched her succulent lips part to speak and imagined kissing her while she whispered her naughty secrets to him, in the dark, of all the things she wanted him to do with her. Look, buddy, you have the reputation of going through women like toilet paper. So please spare me your attempts at being charming. I don't care to have you wipe your ass with me as I've been shit on enough by the world in general these last few years. So move along. This? She waved her hand in his direction. Ain't happening. He inwardly winced at her analogy. Evidently, the women he'd bedded here had been talking, not that he should be surprised. Not many women were happy when they discovered he had no interest in them for anything other than sex and friendly companionship. He'd never dated a woman, never saw a need to. He wasn't ready to settle down, and no woman had interested him for more than a month or two at most, unless they were fine with just fucking. A glance showed the line for the bathroom was longer than ever, but he barely paid attention. His focus was on this mysterious American who was resisting him, not something he was used to with a woman. The situation would be amusing if it wasn't happening to him. It only made him want her all the more. Adding a touch of seduction to his gaze, he watched her closely, now only dimly aware of the line for the bathroom growing. Do you believe everything that is told to you? She laughed, the melody of her joy immediately bringing a smile to his face and everyone's within hearing distance. She might not physically turn heads, but her merriment made her irresistible. It even made him smile, which he rarely did in public. He was sure he'd smiled more during this conversation at a crowded bar than he had in months. If Dimitri could see him right now, He'd be laughing his ass off at how foolish Alex was behaving as he pursued the bartender. The Novikov brothers didn't chase women. Women chased them. Or at least, they usually did. Tossing her hair over her shoulder, the warm red highlights glinting beneath the brighter lights behind the bar, she held up her finger to the other bartender, indicating she'd only be a minute, then turned back to him with an impatient expression, making a furrow between her eyebrows. I'm sure you know you're amazingly hot for an old guy. If he'd been drinking his lager, he would have choked. Old guy, I am twenty-nine. 
She'd held up her hands, silver bangles glinting on her slender arms. Hey, whatever. To a twenty-year-old, that's like ancient. Had she just called him ancient? A growl escaped him, but instead of being scared, she laughed again. <laughs> like I said, as good-looking as you are, I bet women are throwing their panties at you everywhere you go. So why don't you bother one of them? I'm not trying to slut shame you. You do what you have to do. But I don't like people who break hearts, and I'm not interested in a one-night stand. Instead of acknowledging that women did indeed throw themselves at him everywhere he went, and that he broke hearts, he shrugged, deciding silence was the best option. Although he was curious as to what slut shaming was, she smirked when he didn't say anything. I'll let you know right now that I have absolutely no time for players. In fact, they disgust me. You, buddy, are barking up the wrong tree. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have a job to do. With that, she lifted her pert nose and turned, her waist-length hair swishing behind her in a way that reminded him of how a cat would flick its tail as she stalked away with an irritated twitch of her lips. Bemused, he watched her huff around the bar for a moment. Her stiff movements making her perfect breasts bounce as she pointedly ignored him. His cock twitched again in interest. She was a sassy little thing and would need a firm hand in bed. Might be fun to spend some time with a woman who had some spirit to her instead of his usual companions who indulged his every whim. Tearing his gaze from her, he turned his attention back to the bathroom where a long line had formed and a guy was knocking on the door loudly. Abandoning his beer, he signaled for the bouncer to go get Peter. Alex's senses were tingling in a way that let him know something was about to happen. His sixth sense had saved his ass more times than he could count, and he instantly fell back on a lifetime of training. As the son of a powerful Bratva lord, Alex had spent his entire life immersed in a world where men created their own, often violent and bloody rules. His instincts had been honed to such a fine edge that he could often feel trouble before anything actually happened. It had earned him an almost mythical reputation, and he liked it that way. Still, he didn't want any unnecessary attention drawn to Peter Cleary's pub. Not that the local police would ever do anything. They were paid off by Peter and scared of incurring his ire. But Alex did try not to offend his allies. With them as friendly as they could be, considering the circumstances, he'd rather not have Peter pissing and moaning at him about a corpse on his property. The bathroom had no windows, only brick walls, and that drunk motherfucker had not come out of the small room. So, unless fat fuck Jake had somehow slithered down the drain, something was wrong. He brushed aside the man knocking on the door. Move. With that. He kicked the door in, and it bounced off something on the floor. It took some force, but he nudged the door open enough to stick his head through and stared. For the first time in a long time, he was surprised. There, lying on the floor, was Jake, dead. Apparently, either from falling down and hitting his head, there was a large pool of blood around his head and some on the edge of the toilet, or passing out and choking on his own vomit. Laughter threatened, but Alex needed to blend in, not stick out, and he would definitely stick out if he started chuckling at the sight of a corpse. His wry amusement continued to grow, and he really had to struggle to choke back his mirth. Closing his expression down, he rubbed his neatly trimmed goatee and looked at the hulking bouncer hovering nearby. I need Peter. Before the bouncer could move. Peter, along with two of his brawny enforcers, strode down the hall. The burly middle-aged man was shirtless, his thickly muscled chest covered with hair as red as the hair on his head, and as equally spattered with white. Tattoos spread from shoulder to shoulder and across his upper back in a colorful display of Celtic knotwork. When his gaze met Alex's, the head of the Cleary gang's solid jaw was set to a no bullshit angle before he barked out. Get your horses back, all of ya. The customers left in spite of their blatant and, in some cases, drunken curiosity. The threat of getting beat bloody a good motivator. When Peter Cleary said move, a person moved. His pale, freckled face was flushed, 
and he ran an agitated hand through his dark red curly hair. What the fuck, Alex? Mary was sucking my dick and I gotta stop that place to come out here and see a fucking bathroom. Do you know how often that woman is in a mood good enough to give head? Laughing, Alex rubbed his face with both hands. Open the door. Of course, the bodyguards held the door open for Peter, and a second after he looked around the corner, he started laughing as well. When he turned back, Peter shook his head with a disbelieving grin twitching his thick lips. You lucky asshole. Your fucking Mark did himself in. Unbelievable. What can I say? Lady Luck loves me. Snorting back a laugh, Peter shut the door, then sighed. Ain't that the truth? Alex merely chuckled while he sent a text to his father that the job had been done. After ordering his enforcers to clean up the mess, Peter turned to Alex and clapped him on the shoulder. Well, now that you're finished, I have something I'd like to discuss with you. A business proposition I think will benefit us all. Chapter 2 Letting out a tired sigh as the adrenaline slowly drained from his system, Alex followed Peter, texting a few of his men to update them before returning his attention to his surroundings. Together they made their way down the hall, and when they entered the main area of the pub, most of the crowd avoided looking at them. They passed the bar heading to the stairs that would take them to the second level, and Alex caught the auburn-haired bartender's eye. She was watching him and Peter with a suspicious frown he wanted to kiss off her lips. Their gazes met, and he swore the room faded until it was just the two of them, bound together by a connection stronger than anything he'd ever felt. Who is new bartender, the redhead in purple shirt? To his surprise, Peter froze in place and gave Alex a dark, menacing look. Her name is Jessica, and you'll do well to stay away from her. Peter had never given a shit before if Alex seduced every waitress and bartender in the building, so his aggressive response brought Alex's attention to razor-sharp focus on the other man. Why? Later. Alex followed a silent Peter upstairs, past the offices on the second floor and up to the third floor, which he turned into his private residence. The 8,000 square foot space somehow managed to be comfortable and cozy, thanks to Mary's feminine touch. After nodding to the armed men guarding his home, Peter led Alex into his private office. With the windows looking out over the busy streets of Dublin, Peter's office was a relaxing space cluttered with the mementos of a man who'd lived a full life. Alex scanned the various awards and certificates of merit lining the walls that Peter had accumulated during his political career. Alex's friend sat back with a sigh. The woman at the bar, that's Jessica, my niece. Keep your filthy hands off of her. Alex looked away from a framed magazine article featuring a picture of Peter smiling with Prince Charles and stared at his friend in shock. Your niece? Your sister died long ago, no? One of the things that had cemented Peter and Alex's friendship was that they had both lost their sisters to the violence that saturated their world, but in different ways. While Alex's mother and half-sister had been assassinated by a rival Bratva, Peter's older sister had fled to America with a member of an Irish gang that was the Cleary's sworn enemy. For years Peter had searched for her. Unfortunately, she covered her tracks well, and he'd been unable to find her. Much has changed since we last spoke, my friend. Peter made his way to Alex with two crystal tumblers, each glass containing a rich amber liquid. As usual, in private he lost a bit of his deep Irish brogue that he used in certain areas of his public life. Peter was a smart man and knew the people loyal to him related better to someone who talked like them. On the flip side of that, he could also sound like the highly educated man he was while talking with his fellow politicians. Is good or bad change? Both. My private investigator found a misfiled police report about a Jane Doe, later identified as Katie, being found dead of a brain hemorrhage. 
The second page of the report detailed there was a 16-month-old child found with Katie, a girl who was put into the American foster care system. Alex accepted his glass when Peter handed it to him, then took a sip. When did you find this out? Ten months ago. It took me another few months to find the girl, Jessica. From what we've been able to piece together, Katie and that piece of shit she ran off with split up not long after they arrived in the United States. He died a few months after Katie in a shootout with the local police, never known he had a daughter who was almost two years old. Alex let out a low sigh as he witnessed Peter struggling to contain his emotions. Men didn't cry in front of other men, but even among the monsters he dealt with, the grief over loss of family was understood all too well. With this in mind, Alex looked away, pretending to scan Peter's cluttered bookshelf as he sipped his drink. I am sorry for your hardship. After a few moments, Peter spoke again, his voice under control now and his emotions locked down tight. Fortune was smiling on my niece, cause she'd been adopted by a good loving family and was raised on a farm in rural America. They adored her, and Jessica never felt anything but loved. Thinking of how many children ended up on the street without parents, Alex nodded. She was very lucky. Must have strong guardian angels. Peter raised his glass in a toast, then took a drink before answering. Unfortunately, her adoptive parents died of unrelated illnesses a year or two before I found her. As soon as I had a DNA confirmation of who she was, I didn't want to disrupt her life if we had the wrong girl. I contacted her, hoping she'd at least hear me out. I didn't have anything to worry about. Jessica was ecstatic to learn she had blood relatives and I... Well, fuck, I felt like I had a piece of Katie back with me. Jessica has her mother's joy, and when she smiles, it reminds me of the way Katie would smile at me when she was Jessica's age, right before Katie took off with that sod. Never thought I'd get a chance to see anything that beautiful again. Inwardly, Alex sighed over the fact that Jessica was Peter's niece, which meant Alex wouldn't get to experience the pleasure of having her slender thighs wrapped around his hips. There was no way in hell his friend would let him near his niece, and with good reason. Peter knew about Alex, knew about his reputation with women, and Alex could respect the man's desire that he stay away from the lovely Jessica. If he had a niece, he sure as hell wouldn't want a man nine years older than she, an assassin at that, pursuing her. Now he just needed his body to realize she would never happen and move on to another pair of long legs to dream about. Unfortunately, some primitive instinct that couldn't be ignored shouted that she belonged to him and wouldn't allow him to put her in the mental hands-off box. He realized Peter had said something and forced himself to pay attention. What was that? I said she's a sweet girl with a gentle heart. Chuckling, Alex raised his glass to his lips and took a drink. Do not worry. She already told me I do not have a chance in hell with her. It seems your other waitresses warned her about me. Grinning with no small amount of relief, Peter sat back and crossed his arms over his bare chest. You can't expect to fuck your way through my staff and have them not talk. Women are bitchy territorial creatures, and your dick and wallet are big enough that they all piss and moan at each other about who you're gonna fuck on any given night. If you weren't so damn handy to have around, I'd have banned you from my pub for putting my girls in a snit. Alex sighed and tried to get his friend off the subject of Alex's rather robust sex life. You said you wanted to talk some business. I do. The laughter dropped from his face, and Peter sat forward, then placed his empty glass on the desk with a resounding thud, his work-reddened hands curving around the smooth surface. It's an election year. End. He moved out of his chair and grabbed a blue button-down shirt hanging off a brass hook on the wall. Shrugging it on, he studied Alex before once again taking his seat. Any election is full of bullshit and backstabbing, but things have stepped up a notch.
one of my informants has told me there are some new players backed by a powerful organization that won me out of power. They have no chance of getting rid of me, so they must try to weaken my hold in other ways. Does that not happen every election? Politics or nothing if not full of bullshit and backstabbing. His way of world. This is different. How? Peter leaned back in his chair, his thick fingers tapping on the desk as he looked out the window. The Sinn Féin are gaining strength, and their leader, Martin Keeler, has been a thorn in my side over the last few years, but he's an honest man and fair. Or at least he was until he was killed in a car bombing six months ago. Do you know who did it? No. I have my suspicions, but that's all they are right now. There are three men who are running for his spot as leader of the Sinn Féin, and all three of them are as dirty as the bottom of a coal mine. You think they are responsible for his death? One of them is, Peter sighed heavily, Nathan Clark, not the nicest of men, but a strong leader, would be my choice of the three to head the party. He drives me gobshite, but he knows how to keep his nose clean and avoid drawing attention. While I haven't publicly given him my support, he knows he has it, as do his opponents. Who are they? Ryan White and Liam Sweeney. Alex frowned, something tickling his memory about those names. They are familiar to me. Why? Both have toys to different bratvas. Ryan is the grandson of Nikolai Gilyov. That made Alex go on alert. And Liam is married to the daughter of Gleb Tepov. Alex let out a long string of swear words. The Tepov and Gilyov bratvas were both rivals of the Novikovs. If either Liam or Ryan became the heads of one of Ireland's largest political parties, it would not be good for the Clearies and their allies, like the Novikov bratva. It would also give the rival bratvas more power back in Russia, maybe enough to weaken the Novikov bratva and take away some territory. The Novikov bratva needed Peter and his political connections not only to secure their interests in Ireland, but because Ireland was part of one of the main European smuggling routes. If Peter's power base was eroded away, that would mean the Novikovs would either have to form new alliances with the Gilyov and Tepov bratvas, which would never happen, or they would suffer major losses in both profit and mobility. Ireland was a secure, protected country where they could store merchandise that wouldn't be safe anywhere in Russia. Plus, Peter was the absolute best in the world at forging documents, a skill worth more than gold and was more sought after than diamonds. One of the reasons Alex saw Peter so much was that he was always seeking Peter out for one set of papers or another. Peter must have seen the realization on Alex's face because he nodded. It's a toit race, but as long as Nathan has my support, he should be able to beat Liam and Ryan. Things began to fall into place for Alex. So they will target you, distract you, hope you will withdraw your support. They already have. An anonymous tape almost had a business of mine raided last week. Thankfully, one of my men inside the police department found out and alerted me in time to move the drugs out and legal stock in. Later, I received a message that if I don't withdraw my support from Nathan, there will be dire consequences for those I love. I'm not worried about Mary. She can handle herself and was raised by a man meaner than anyone I've ever met. Her security detail has been with her for twenty years, and they do their job well. No, my enemies have a much easier target to go after. Peter's last few words were filled with a rage that Alex easily understood. Jessica. Yes, Jessica. The thought of anyone harming her made his muscle tighten as an unusually strong protective feeling settled into his bones with an angry burn. Does she know? That I am one of the biggest criminal lords in Ireland? No. He stared at a framed photo on the wall that Alex knew was a picture of Peter and Katie together when they were kids. 
Her face was narrower than Peter's, like Jessica's, but she didn't have her daughter's almond-shaped eyes. I wanted to protect Jessica, to get to know her without the shadow of my life tainting our relationship. No, I'm even more hesitant to tell her. She loves me, Alex, me and Mary both. Hell, Mary looks at her like the daughter we never had, and it would break her heart to have Jessica turn her back on us out of fear or disgust. You cannot keep it from her forever, especially if she is in danger. How long will she be here? She's thinking about moving here permanently, but will be living here in Ireland for the next year, studying abroad and attending school. Smart lass, top of her class. While she's in Ireland, I can protect her. Over in America, she'd be an easy target. He met Alex's gaze. This is where you come in. What do you mean? Peter hesitated, then said in a low voice, Your father and I have made a deal. He has agreed to have you, Oleg, Max, and Luca stay in Ireland until the election is over and guard Jessica. You what? Alex grit his teeth. He had plans, meetings he had to attend, and territories to defend. His father knew this, yet he expected Alex to drop everything to attend to his whims. Typical. If he didn't love the old man so much, he might end his life with a bullet to the head some day. Jörg did not consult me on this. Peter nodded. I figured as much. But before you lose your head, you need to listen to what I'm offering in return. I think you'll see why all Jörg would be willing to lose his Sovietnik for so long. Taking a deep breath and letting it out, Alex nodded. What is it? I'm gonna teach you all I know about forgery and introduce you to my connections in exchange for you and your men keeping Jessica alive and happy. Alex stared at Peter, totally knocked out of his anger. What Peter was offering him was unheard of. No one knew all of Peter's secrets, and the other man liked to keep it that way. Being one of a kind kept him alive. For him to offer to teach Alex his tricks was priceless. Certainly more than worth the headache that would come from rearranging his schedule to stay in Ireland until the election was over. It was almost too good to be true, so Alex tried to look for a hidden trap. He trusted no one completely, except for his brother Dimitri. This is beyond generous. Why? I'm gonna assume you mean why would I teach you in exchange for you protecting Jessica? First, you are one of the best assassins in the world, Alex. I don't say that as flattery, but because you know the tricks for taking someone out. You have the instincts to spot trouble before it happens. Second, with the Novikov Bratva given their obvious support, my enemies will think twice before they touch Jessica. Third, I know you will not hesitate to eliminate a threat, and you won't be stupid about it. When you want someone to disappear they disappear. And everyone knows what happens if they go after someone under your protection. The last example you made of a would-be assassin still makes people think twice. He shrugged, unable to argue with the fact he'd done something brutal to make sure his enemies knew he would not hesitate to eliminate any threat to his client. Makes sins, but is unbalanced trade. What more do you want that you not telling me? All I want is for you to keep my niece alive, to protect her, and let the sweet lass lead a life oblivious to the danger that surrounds her. She should not have to pay for my sins. My men understand that would give their lives for her, but they are limited in where they can go. You are more of a neutral third party than they are, able to enter territories in Dublin that will cause a war if one of my men trespassed. He looked at the picture of his sister again, and pain swam in the depths of his distant gaze. Your father gets it. What? He knows this trade isn't unbalanced. He knows what Jessica's death would do to me, to my strong Mary. I know you don't understand, but some day, when you fall in love and have a family of your own, you will know that you'll do anything, anything to keep them alive because they are your heart and soul. Jessica, she's my kin, only descendant I've got. My bloodline ends with her. 
You know, Mary and I can't have children, and even though we're trying to adopt, and we will love that child like our own. I owe Jessica a good life because my sister isn't here to give it to her. I owe Katie that, and I will do everything I can to keep Jessica happy, because she's a good girl, and I love her. Alex's thoughts turned to his own mother, his stepmother, and his beautiful half-sister, and how their deaths had indeed killed his father's heart and soul, leaving a void in him that he filled with death and violence. Oh, his father loved Dimitri and Alex, but it was a cold, hard love, now without mercy, without joy. When he was younger, Alex had often thought of how different his life would have been if those women had lived, what kind of man his father could have been instead of the ruthless monster he'd become. Unfortunately, he was still Alex's father, and no matter how much he tried to harden his heart against the old man, he couldn't make himself stop loving him. At one time, Jorg had been the best father a child could ask for, doting and loving, their home filled with feminine laughter and soft voices. Jorg adored his family, and the loss of two wives and a daughter had slowly destroyed any compassion he'd possessed, leaving him with a heart encased in ice and a paranoia that could get out of control if he wasn't on his stabilizing medicines. Peter's voice interrupted Alex's dark deliberations. My men will be guarding her as well, of course, but you and your men will be doing the majority of the protection. I'm setting you up in a room across the hall from Jessica's apartment in one of the buildings I own. Your men'll have places on the floors below and above. The only way to access her apartment is through her front door. Or scale wall of building. Her apartment faces the street. It's too visible for anyone to scale without drawing unwanted attention. The windows are bulletproof, and no one is getting in without having to get through my men and yours. I realize there will be some business you'll have to attend to personally, but your father has assured me Oleg and Max will watch over her. Luca will also be stopping by from time to time to cover for you when needed. They are good men. He shifted in his chair, excitement beginning to build at the thought of his unusual assignment. At the very least, it would be nice to spend the next six months in relative comfort instead of at his father's training camp in Siberia. How do you explain to Jessica my presence? I'm going to tell her you're part of my personal security that I've assigned to guard her. I'll tell her you'll be working in the United States next year, and having you watching over her will help you and your men with your American English. She's used to political figures having what they call the secret service in the States, so she will know you're there as her bodyguards. She just won't know how serious your duty actually is. You'll be going by your Gorif alias to keep her from doing an internet search and figuring out who you are. Knowing his father had arranged this behind his back irritated him, but he forced those thoughts away. Alex had been given a job, and he would fulfill it. Thankfully, this would not be an unpleasant job, and he wouldn't be out stalking someone in order to end their life. Though the idea of babysitting some young woman wasn't exactly at the top of his list of things he enjoyed, especially when he couldn't fuck her, he had a feeling this assignment was going to be a good one. When do I start? In a week. That should give you time enough to make a trip home and get what you need. He'd have to find time to visit with Dimitri, but he should be able to set things up for his absence. Then I will see you in a week. Chapter 3 Jessica Venture slumped over the end of the bar after her busy shift, savoring a beer and sighing in delight as she got off her aching feet, which throbbed the beat of her heart. She'd wait for Speck and Iowa at a busy family diner, especially on Sunday after church, but being a bartender in a popular bar in the heart of Dublin was a totally new experience, and not just because she was still learning the local dialect. Thankfully, she was a quick study, and everyone she worked with was at least passingly nice to her. She didn't get along with a few of the younger bartenders, but not to the point where it was an issue. More like a mutual distaste than actual anger. The vast majority of people she'd met through her job and her newfound family had been really cool and welcoming. Her family had deeply rooted history in this area, so her return to the city of her mother's birth had been celebrated. 
Evidently, she was the last descendant of a long line of some pretty amazing people. Her Uncle Peter and Aunt Mary couldn't have children, so there'd been some hints that she needed to settle down and have some kids so the Cleary line could continue. She wasn't offended. No one meant any harm when they said it, and she chose to find it funny instead of getting upset. Ireland didn't feel like home yet. There was no denying she'd felt a certain resonance in her soul the first time she drove to Dublin from the airport with her aunt and uncle. The whole place had a different vibe from anywhere she'd been in America, and it had taken her a bit to get used to it. Her aunt had really helped a lot in getting her familiar with the city, and Ireland in general. They'd hit it off right away and had become good friends. This was Jessica's third week on the job and she'd finally gotten a handle on how to work as quickly as possible to keep up with high demand and keep her head above water. Unfortunately, she kept screwing up tonight because of a certain irritating man who'd thrown a wrench in her ability to focus on the task at hand. He distracted her to the point that she forgot where she was, and instead of making drinks, she thought about how she longed to touch his lips, surrounded by his goatee, and see if the rough hair made the skin feel softer by contrast. With his deep gray eyes and classic good looks, he'd robbed her of her sanity with a glance. Usually, she could ignore guys hitting on her or trying to pick her up, but this man's intense gaze affected her like a physical touch, and his accented voice, her nipples tightened at the memory of the way he said her name. It wasn't the traditional Jessica, no. He turned her name into something exotic that sounded like Jezeka. Now her pussy tingled as well, and she cursed her body, who obviously didn't know lusting after Alex was a bad idea. Yep, despite the fact that he was older and in an entirely different league, they had serious chemistry between them. Unfortunately, he was the kind of guy Jessica would never date. When she'd asked about the sexiest sin man with the thick black hair and piercing gray eyes, the women she worked with had gone right the fuck off about how big a player he was. All of them, not just the bitchy ones. Evidently, he viewed the servers at the pub as his personal harem, and he had the charm of the devil. Rumor had it that no woman had more than two dates with him before they were ready to fuck his kinky brains out and have his babies. She thought it was all exaggerated bullshit. Then she saw him, and every hair on her body stood up as if a mild electrical shock had radiated through her nervous system. He had the beginnings of a goatee which made him appear rough and sexy. Add to that his penetrating, hooded gaze as he stared at her, and she'd been unable to stop her body from responding. This was a man who oozed sex appeal, and he'd been directing all that lust straight at her, making her panties damp without even touching her. She regretted wearing the camisole instead of a bra beneath her shirt. As small as her breasts were, that wasn't usually an issue. But tonight, her nipples had been rock hard and drew leering stares from more than one drunk. Until she reminded them that Peter was her uncle, and suddenly, they became as polite as could be. Her body still buzzed hours later as she recalled the change in Alex after she accidentally spilled beer on him. She wanted to say she was angry because she was morally outraged by Alex's heartbreaker behavior. The truth was, she felt a pull to him so strong, she felt like she should be able to see glowing strands connecting them together. His hands were big and rough, and she wondered what they would feel like sliding over her body. The sight of his long, almost artistic fingers brought to mind breathy moans in the dark as he slowly sank them into her aching pussy. Night, Jessica, one of the bartenders she worked with said with a smile and a wave. Startled from her erotic daydreams, she sat up on her bar stool and hoped she wasn't blushing. Night, Beth. Since her apartment was in the building around the corner, Jessica liked to linger for a little while after closing and just absorb the silence. She'd never been in the city as old as Dublin, and sometimes it felt like she could feel the age of the city pressing down on her. From what Aunt Mary had said, this building used to be a part of a nobleman's estate, but it had been sold to her great-great-great-grandfather to pay off his gambling debts. Rumor had it that the pub had also been an upscale brothel back in the day, with a bar masquerading as a gentleman's club for cover, hiding the real reason the men of Dublin entered this building. 
a man shifted across the room, one of the stone-faced bouncers, and drew her wandering attention before she inwardly sighed. Uncle Peter had insanely good security because he was a politician, and he always had at least one of his men near Jessica. Not enough to be invasive, but everywhere she went, she knew someone was watching over her. Even if she was just grocery shopping with Aunt Mary, a man or two would discreetly follow them. She had to admit it was kind of nice to have that protection as she explored a city ten times the size of the small town where she'd grown up. Then again, their constant watchful presence also hampered her ability to freely explore places on a whim. And it certainly screwed up any plan she had to buy a new vibrator at the elegant lingerie and adult toy store she always passed on the way to her favorite bakery. Right now, her oversized babysitter for the evening lurked in the far corner, the same area where Alex had sat earlier and was talking with one of the bartenders. Both of them were flirting with each other heavily enough that Jessica was sure someone was going to get laid tonight. Too bad it wouldn't be her. She'd been going through a dating dry spell since moving here to spend some time in Ireland getting to know her roots. While there were plenty of cute guys around, and she had flirted with a few, but nothing ever happened beyond the initial encounter. She was also looking into going to a college in Dublin instead of returning to the University of Iowa. There was just something about Ireland and the people that called to her, and she wasn't ready to leave yet. Hopefully, she'd find a nice Irish guy who would treat her the way her father treated her mother, with kindness, respect, and endless love. Her biological father, on the other hand, was a dick who'd left his pregnant woman stranded in a foreign country while he ran off with a neighbor. If her biological dad was the perfect example of being a world-class asshole, her adoptive father was the polar opposite. He was like a living, breathing John Wayne, country tough and about as masculine as a man could get, with a no-drama, no-bullshit attitude. He'd taken care of Jessica and her mother, spoiling and protecting them in his own quiet way, giving his love freely with both deeds and words. She was totally her daddy's little girl, and his death had rocked her to the core making her realize how much she depended on him and her mom for everything. Then, when her mother died later, she thought for sure she'd slipped into such a deep depression that she'd never get out. It was during the darkest time that a bit of light came into her life in the form of a phone call from a man who'd identified himself as Peter Cleary, her uncle. After the revelation that she did indeed have living blood relatives, she'd cried until she passed out. Relieved that she would get a chance to know who she was and what kind of history she had flowing in her veins, who she looked like. She learned later that her birth mother, Katie, had fled Ireland to marry a boy in the United States her family did not approve of. Unfortunately for Katie, soon after her arrival in the States, the man she'd run away to be with left her for another woman, leaving Katie pregnant and alone in an unfamiliar country. Jessica's biological father had also died, and she wondered how she had the bad luck to end up with two sets of dead parents. Her biological father had been an only child, and there were no other living relatives left on her father's side. Her uncle's voice came from the stairway, and someone laughed in a deep, rumbling tone. She watched the stairs, interested to see if the man's face matched his sexy chuckle. Maybe she just needed some good, old-fashioned, down-and-dirty sex to get her out of her rut. It would be nice to have a man at her side as she wandered around and explored the city. Someone who was smart and would entertain her with tales of the different historic buildings. A man with big hands and an even bigger cock was just what the doctor ordered. Sheesh, she needed to get laid. At the sight of Alex smiling at her uncle, she inwardly groaned and wanted to bang her head on the bar. When he was out of sight, it was easy to dismiss just how mesmerizing he was. How tempting. Why hadn't she gone home when she had the chance? The more she thought about Alex, the more she wanted him. And that could not happen. She loathed womanizers. Her first serious boyfriend had cheated on her. And the fact that her birth father had abandoned her mother for another woman only deepened her disgust with men who treated women like objects to use and discard at whim. 
Casual sex was all good and fun as long as both parties knew not to involve their hearts. Heck, she'd had her fair share of casual hookups in school and on spring break. She'd heard Alex had no heart, and he loved to make women fall in love with him then leave them high and dry, breaking up with them for no reason other than he was done playing his games. What a sick asshole. A shudder of revulsion chased back the desire that had flared at the sight of Alex, and she turned back to the bar, wondering if she should just chug her beer and make a run for it before he noticed her. Jessica! Her uncle called out in a loud voice. I'd like you to meet an old friend of mine, Alexander Gorev. She tried to assume a polite, bored expression, then turned around. At the sight of Alex's smirking lips, lips she wanted to suck and nibble on, her determination not to like him flared to life. No, she would not be turned on by the mere sight of Alex. Unacceptable. Her hormones would just have to go back to sleep until she found a suitable man. She'd finally come to a place in her life where she'd found a peaceful port in the storm after her parents' deaths. She wasn't going to sacrifice it for anyone, especially a man who was sure to break her heart. Better that she let Alex know right now that she'd never spread her legs for him, and he should move on to easier prey. Inclining her head to Alex, she said in a smooth voice, Well, you got the old part right. We've already met. Oh, how she loved the annoyance that filled Alex's handsome face. She had no idea why he was so uptight about his age. He was, unfairly, one of those men who would only get better looking with time. Before she could help it, a giggle escaped at the sight of Alex's offended expression. Then Peter began to laugh. Ouch! Alex, you're slipping. Alex muttered something to Peter in a language she didn't recognize, then returned his attention to her. I will have plenty of time to change her mind in the next six months, yes? She turned to her uncle, praying she didn't just hear that. What? Giving Alex a warning look, Peter nodded. Alex and his men are your new bodyguards. Pardon me? Alex had an irritating smirk twitching his lips that made her want to smack him. We will be seeing much of each other, Jessica. The way he said her name with a slight purr made her pussy clench, and she hated herself for reacting so easily to him. Uh-uh. No way. You are both out of your damn minds if you think he's going anywhere near my body. I don't need to see a constant stream of women parading into his apartment. Gah, I hope the walls are thick. Alex arched a brow, having the gall to look offended, and she glared at him. You're a man whore, plain and simple. Peter tisked. Jessica, mind your manners. You know nothing about Alex, only rumors, and you're being impolite to my guest. She flushed and dropped her eyes to the ground before muttering, Yes, sir. There wasn't a doubt in her mind that Uncle Peter loved her, but he was a stickler for manners. He tried to explain to her that Dublin wasn't like the States, that women conducted themselves differently, that the men had pride, sometimes in excessive amounts. He'd gone on and on about a man's reputation being important, and if she was blatantly disrespectful, it could get her in a world of trouble but she hadn't really understood what he was talking about. Their conversation had been odd, and he kept hesitating, like he wanted to say something but couldn't. Finally, to ease the worried look on his face, she'd agreed to watch her normally sarcastic mouth and not make any problems for him. Alex's gray eyes sparkled with suppressed mirth as he arched a brow in Jessica's direction. Do not worry. You will hardly know we are here. Before she could respond, Peter returned and shook Alex's hand. I'll see you next week. Give my regards to your father, and tell Dimitri that it's been too long since he's come to visit us. I will. Alex gave Jessica that almost smile of his that was beginning to drive her crazy, then walked out of the bar without a backwards glance. After Alex left, her uncle sat next to her and stole a sip of her beer, ignoring her glare. Don't be angry, lass. Alex is a trustworthy man, and more importantly, he's very good at his job. 
I know he can be a bit of a prick, but I just want you to be safe. I thought long and hard about who to assign to you, and he's the best man for the job. Let me have this, Jessica. I need to know you're being taken care of when I'm not around. She was all set to argue with Peter, but his obvious need to protect her pricked the balloon of her anger. Shit, she was acting like a brat and not considering his feelings, only hers. Jessica's father had been overprotective, like Uncle Peter, and she had to admit that, in an odd way, her uncle's overbearing manner made her feel loved. It reminded her of home, and she found herself giving Peter a quick, one-armed hug before returning to her stool. It's okay. I understand. I don't like it, but I understand. Her uncle didn't say anything for a moment, then smiled at her, the familiar light of his love returning to his eyes. How was work tonight? Good. How was yours? Busy, lass, he said with a deep sigh. Always busy. She smiled at him, and he winked. She liked the fact that her uncle seemed to go out of his way to spend time with her. He was always dealing with his business and political crud, but he made sure he had downtime with her whenever he could. With a thud, the entrance door shut and snicked as the lock was turned. Then they were alone. Leaning against the bar, she studied his tired expression while he absently examined the racks, holding the various glasses behind the bar. You work too hard. Better to be busy than bored. Good point. She cracked her neck, the strain of the long night pressing down on her and making her eager for her bed. Having a not-working bathroom for a half hour sucked. Glad they were able to repair it quickly. I was afraid I was going to have guys asking me for a pitcher to piss in. Peter laughed, then yawned. Dark bags had formed beneath his eyes, and she was glad she hadn't inherited that physical trait from the cleary side of her jean pool. When she was tired, her eyes got a bit red-rimmed, but it made her look more stoned than anything else. She hoped Uncle Peter was taking care of his health, and made a mental note to talk to Aunt Mary about his diet. Thumping his fist on the bar, he stood and sighed while looking down at her with an affectionate smile that warmed her heart. I'm gonna go turn in before my beautiful Mary sends out a search team for me. Paul will walk you home whenever you're ready. She yawned as well and muttered, Tomorrow's my day off, so I'm gonna sleep in. Wish I could get a day off. Peter said with a teasing smile and gave her hair a gentle ruffle. Yeah, it's tough being the king of Dublin, she said, referring to the way people seemed to kiss his ass everywhere they went. All she had to do was mention that she was Peter Cleary's niece, and things would go smoothly. Maybe not the king, more like a duke. Shaking her head, she gathered up her purse with a smile and a mock curtsy. Good night, your lordship. Good night, sweetheart. Oh, and Jessica? Yeah? Don't get your sights set on Alex. Alex? He gave her a narrow-eyed look, his cheeks puffing as he huffed out a laugh. Lass, I saw how you stared at him. I may be old, but I'm not so blind that I can't see a pretty girl make a noise at a handsome fella. I just advise you to cast your sights on someone else. Flashing a no-doubt bright red... She started to walk to the front door while trying to keep her stride unhurried and casual. I wasn't making eyes at him. I was staring at him in disgust. Peter sighed and threw up his hands in defeat. What you said earlier. You were right. I can't tell you who you can or cannot see. My family made that mistake with your mother, and I'm not going to repeat it. I will say, however, that there are a billion men I'd rather see you with than Alex. You deserve a good, safe man. Someone you can grow old with. He's not the man for you, my darling lass. Slightly puzzled by his words, but too tired to dissect them now, she called over her shoulder, You have nothing to worry about, Uncle Peter. Seriously, I have no interest in him. He's way too old for me and acts like he's the king turd of Ship Mountain. No thanks. That made Peter burst into laughter and she left the pub with a smile on her face and a bodyguard watching her back. A few days later, she'd almost managed to forget about the mysterious Alexander 
when there was a commotion outside of her apartment. Men were yelling in a language she didn't understand, and she wondered if she should call Peter and let him know about the noise. Moving quietly, she tiptoed over to the peephole on her massive door and looked through. The door itself was made of a bulletproof material, so she was as safe behind it as she could be. When Peter had informed her of that, she'd been a little curious at the level of security in this building, but then realized that being family to a politician came with an inherent heightened level of danger. There were whack jobs out there who would want to hurt her merely to get at her uncle. A quick peek revealed two unfamiliar but attractive in an intimidating way, guys dressed in black pants and dark leather jackets. The one with deep reddish blonde hair and green eyes wore a deep blue button-down shirt that stretched out over his wide shoulders. The other man wore a crisp white dress shirt and a dark blonde hair with a deep cleft in his chin. When they moved away from the keyhole, she sucked in a quick breath as her nipples tightened at the sight of a very, very familiar man standing in front of the door across the hall from hers. Firm lips, square jaw, and a dark goatee all gave Alex Gorev a sinister, yet oh-so-tempting edge. Sin in its most tempting form. A woman could look at him and know he'd push her limits, make her taste forbidden fruit. And his hands... Holy moly, she'd never seen such big hands on a guy. To her disgust, she'd spent much of her free time lately fantasizing about what it would feel like to be kissed by a man with facial hair, who just happened to look like Alex. Would it feel silky or rough against her face? And what if he dined down south? What would that feel like? She could imagine, but she'd bet the real thing was much better than her hand and vibrator. Adding to his good looks were his intense gray eyes, ringed with the thinnest band of black, a muscular body, and his killer smile. He was a feast for all the female senses, wrapped up in a body made for brutal pleasure. Since he was attractive and had solid self-confidence bordering on arrogance, he was like her sexual catnip. Catnip she now masturbated to on a nightly basis, despite her anger at herself for dreaming about him. Humiliation, mixed with excitement, burned her cheeks, and she let out a muffled squeak when Alex looked directly at her, almost as if he could see her peering through the peephole. He blew her a kiss, then said something in whatever language they spoke that made the other men laugh. Alex opened the apartment door across the hall and flicked the lights on before saying loudly, Jessica, I know you are watching me. I can feel it. Your uncle told me that you have a set of keys that I will need. When you are done spying, bring them to me. Her body flushed with embarrassment, while her brain came up with inventive ways to wipe that smug smirk off his face. That arrogant, good-looking, insanely sexy older man made her react in a way no one ever had. Certainly not the boys she'd dated back home. And the guys she'd previously dated definitely seemed like immature boys, in the face of Alex's refined sexuality. No, she needed to keep her distance. As long as she remained professional and polite with him, he'd just be a harmless fantasy. After all, he was her bodyguard. That meant she'd have to get used to being around him in the background. Hell, she barely even knew the guys her uncle had following her around. It would be no big deal. She would just grab the keys, chuck them at him, then calmly and coolly stroll back into her place where she would throw every lock on the door she had. Then she'd go play with herself with a shower massager for a couple hours. Appalled with her out-of-control libido, she moved away from the door, heading into her big, by Irish standards, kitchen. It always did her heart good when she saw the appliances from the States that Aunt Mary had installed for her, brands she was familiar with that couldn't be found in Ireland and that would ease the homesickness of being in a strange place. Peter had also left framed pictures of their family all over the house, each with a descriptive tag saying who that person was and how they were related to her. Tears prickled her eyes as she realized how much her mother had left behind to run off to America with her loser birth father. Blinking rapidly while fanning herself, she fought back the burn in her nose until she was sure that she wasn't going to cry. 
She caught a reflection in the vast silver frame mirror in the foyer and paused, giving her image a critical eye. She wanted to look good for her encounter with Alexander, although she would never admit it out loud. Her gray yoga pants would have to suffice, along with the overlarge pink socks she wore to combat the damp chill that sometimes crept up on her. She ditched the gray hoodie jacket, then quickly checked her pink t-shirt for any stains. As she took her hair out of her bun, she glanced behind her and spied a bottle of whiskey someone had given her as a gift. She chewed on her lower lip for a moment, trying to figure out if giving him a welcome gift was a good idea, then decided to say, fuck it. There was no reason they couldn't both be mature adults about the situation. Starting off on the right foot by being polite was important. Grabbing the bottle, along with the keys Peter had left for Alex, she opened her door and took the four steps necessary to reach Alexander's door. Men's deep voices came from inside Alex's apartment, their unfamiliar language sounding almost melodic in a rough way, and she hesitated before knocking loudly. The murmurs cut off, and she strained to hear if anyone was coming to the door, then wondered if she should knock again. Before she could raise her fist, the door opened and revealed Alexander, his gray-eyed gaze capturing her and making her whole body light up. He was even more handsome up close than she remembered, and her lower abdomen began to tighten and warm. Tingles radiated from her scalp down to her toes, and she drank in the sight of him. Dressed in a pair of dark tailored pants that fit his muscular legs well, and a cream button-down men's shirt, with the sleeves rolled up to reveal powerful forearms dusted with dark hair, he took her breath away. A few buttons at the top of his shirt were also undone, showing the curve of his well-defined neck and some soft-looking chest hair. Crap, he was even hotter than she remembered. For a long, tension-filled moment, they merely stared at each other. She tried to read his expression, but he was very good at masking his feelings. The only thing he couldn't control were his pupils, which dilated as he stared at her. She'd learned in a psychology class last year that humans were hardwired to react to that pupil dilation as a mating signal on a primitive level. So even though Alexander might appear bored while he assessed her, as if he were opening the door to a pesky Jehovah's Witness, his body's reaction to her told a different story. She wanted to smirk about his sexual interest in her, to let him know that she felt nothing but disdain for him. But her sex was getting wet from just his mesmerizing gaze, like he was telepathically whispering to her all the raw, nasty things he was going to indulge in with her. She loved a man who could talk dirty, and with Alexander's rough, accented voice, it would be the cherry on the top of her lust-filled cake. The light glinted in his gaze as he took the smallest of steps forward, now close enough that she swore he could feel the heat pressing against her. The tips of her nipples grew hypersensitive, and she desperately tried to regain control of her body, which seemed intent on fucking this annoying man. He was as handsome as ever, as arrogant as ever. And while they stared at each other, she wanted to smack the arrogance out of him, then throw him down in the middle of the hallway and fuck the hell out of him just to get him out of her system. For someone determined not to fall under a sexual spell, that was a rather alarming thought, which made her voice come out tight as she said, Here, keys and a housewarming present. He barely caught the whiskey that she thrust at him, then the keys she pressed into his hand. Another man appeared behind Alexander, the husky blonde babe, and he gave her a very flirtatious smile as his gaze took a blatant and leisurely journey down her body. Alex, who is beauty? Before she could respond, Alexander said something in a low, tight voice that held the edge of a snarl. Whatever he said shocked the blonde man, if the blood draining away from his face was any indication. The blonde man quickly backed away with his hands in the air, speaking in a hushed rush, before spinning on his heel and leaving them alone. The man's fear had been so palpable she wondered what the heck he was so afraid of. Alex wasn't that scary, was he?
The only information she'd been able to get on Alexander was that he grew up in Bulgaria and ran his own personal protection company. Said company was supposed to be one of the best in the world for personal security. But there wasn't much information on it other than the fact that they handled some famous people as clients. There were no pictures of him and only a mention here and there of being in different society pages with various lovely model types and fabulous dresses and dripping in jewels. Those images sent a pang through her stomach, and she tried to tell herself it was anger, not jealousy. She wasn't surprised to see so many beautiful women hanging all over him. Evidently, from what she'd heard at work, Alexander had a very thick cock, and the women loved it, but he never, ever dated a woman for very long. All five of the bartenders that had been with him, and a couple of the waitresses as well, had all agreed on that. He was lovely. He was charming. He was good for some fantastic sex and pricey gifts, but that was about it. Alexander Gorev was booty call material, and she was no longer a booty call kind of girl. Been there, done that, and had discovered the hard way she couldn't do casual sex. With that thought in mind, she turned around and walked back into her apartment, slamming her door shut before she did anything stupid. But she had a feeling it was too late for that. With a low groan, she slid down the door after her drama queen exit, thunking her head against it while softly calling herself every name in the book. Why was she so awkward around Alex? She could normally shoot down guys with no problem. But if she was actually attracted to a man, she turned into a tongue-tied fool. It was beyond embarrassing, and she was pretty sure Alexander thought she was a nut job. He was older, incredibly handsome, and so charismatic, he could sell a ketchup popsicle to a lady wearing white gloves. Other than for sex, there was no reason he would want anything to do with her. She was just a girl who was tending bar for her uncle, with no clear direction in life and not an ounce of sophistication. Before her mind could spiral deeper into a pity party, she heard a series of sharp knocks on her door. Without even looking through the peephole, she opened the door and stared at his shoes. Hello, Alexander. Jessica, he said in a soft, coaxing tone. Look at me. When she finally raised her gaze to his, she met his worried eyes. He studied her for a moment, then gave her a small smile. Are you all right? I did not mean to anger you. No, she sighed sucking it up and just getting on with the humiliation. I was mad at myself. For some reason, I find it hard to speak around you. He laughed, and she couldn't help but smile in response. She noticed he held the bottle of whiskey in one hand. Damn, his hands were so sexy, large enough to grip her and hold her tight, big enough to run over her body and bring her the kind of pleasure she'd only dreamed about and they looked as strong as the rest of him. An odd symbol was tattooed on the webbing between his pointer finger and thumb, and she wondered what it meant. She also wondered why she wanted to lick it, then suck on his thumb. Oblivious to her internal battle with her hormones, he tilted his head and gave her a look she couldn't quite decipher. Why do you find it hard to speak around me? Not wanting to admit her insecurities to this roughly beautiful man, she gestured to the whiskey. Are you returning this? If you don't like the brand, I have lots of others to choose from. I don't know if it's the custom here or what, but when I moved in, I got a ton of booze as housewarming presents. He quirked a brow at her. No, it's very good high quality. I was hoping you would drink with me. It's tradition in my country to celebrate new beginnings with a... What is word? Cheer. No, a toast. Then he gave her a small, soft smile that took all the fight out of her and replaced it with hunger. Blah, she was so weak. Giving him an exasperated look and her overly eager body a stern mental talking to, she opened the door, then waved him in. If you want me to drink with you, I'm afraid you'll have to settle for tequila. And if you're supposed to be my bodyguard, shouldn't you be guarding me instead of getting wasted? Max and Gleb were watching your apartment. They wanted to come meet you, but I did not want to overwhelm you. 
Come, let us welcome each other as neighbors properly. Would be rude to refuse. She cocked her head to the side, brushing her hair out of her face before tucking it behind her ear. A lifetime of having polite Midwestern manners drilled into her head by her mother had a pang of guilt hitting her when she mentally replayed her words and realized how discourteous she was being. It wasn't his fault she got all flustered around him, and if he was trying to smooth things over between them, she could at the very least act in a civilized manner towards him. You're right. I am being rude. Please forgive me. Would you like to join me for a drink, neighbor? Chapter 4 Alex admired Jessica's heart-shaped ass as she walked in front of him, and the deep red of her hair burning like embers in the dim lighting of her cozy home. The sight of her long legs clad in those deliciously tight pants had him fighting an erection. He didn't want to scare her off, and regardless of his body's reaction to her, this young woman could be nothing more than a job. She was kiddish, but he needed her to feel safe enough around him to trust him and his men with her life. There might be a time where her obeying him without question could save her, and he couldn't let his attraction to her get in the way of keeping her alive and well. He tried to argue with himself that his loyalty to his bratva was the only reason he was feeling so zealous about her protection, but that was not true. There was something about Jessica that brought him a peace like he'd never experienced, but her inner fire challenged him as well. He'd bet that beneath her quick temper lay a sweet soul that was easily wounded, therefore well protected against anyone trying to gain access. Not that he didn't like her sass. It got him hard as fuck, but the knowledge that he could probably make her submit to him in the bedroom teased him without mercy, tempting him to take just a small taste of her. He imagined her riding him, her amazing silky straight hair swaying across his thighs as he brought her to a backbending orgasm. Dreaming about Jessica in such a carnal state was not helping his determination to keep from pulling her into his arms and giving her the kiss he knew she wanted. The need trembled along her skin, evident in the way she pressed her thighs together, in how she stole quick glances as if unable to help herself from checking him out. The way her gaze lingered on his crotch was not helping the situation. Need suffused her expression when she allowed herself to look at him. Before he could stop himself, he asked, Did you ever dance ballet? That brought her eyes back to his, wide with puzzlement and making her look adorable in her confusion. No. Why? Because you are very graceful. She walked over to a set of light wood cabinets, opened a door, and pulled down a cut crystal bottle filled with clear liquid. When she glanced at him, she smiled a real smile, and it warmed his blood. When she wasn't busy trying to be a bitch, she was actually rather gentle by nature. He usually liked tough women who knew how to keep their emotions safe, but something about her openness appealed to him. He watched her pink lips move as she talked, wanting to taste them. I was too much of a tomboy to do ballet. What is tomboy? It means a girl who acts more like a boy than a girl. So instead of doing ballet and beauty pageants like my mom would have liked, I did horseback riding and played sports. You know, boy stuff. You like horses? Yeah, we had four of them at my parents' farm. I grew up around horses and love going camping and horseback riding. There is something really comforting about having a horse with you when you're out there beneath the stars. She looked longingly out the small dark window in her kitchen. If it ever stops raining, I want to see if I can find stables around here. I will arrange it. She blinked at him. Hmm? You wish to ride. I will make that happen. Her lips curved into a smile he wanted to kiss. Are you my bodyguard or my genie? What is genie? You know, a spirit that grants three wishes. From Middle Eastern fairy tales. Ah, this I know. I am not genie, but if you desire something, tell me, and you will have it. It's my job to take care of you. It's privilege for the men in your life to provide for you, even if we are merely your bodyguards. Gives us purpose. Pride. 
Well, thanks, but I can take care of myself. She sighed, then glanced up at him through her pale lashes. Sorry, that was kind of rude. What I meant to say was thank you, but if I want something, I can get it for myself or do it. You don't need to do it for me. He'd run into this independent attitude in Western women before, so he tried to explain to her why it was his job to make sure she was content. He didn't normally give a shit if his clients were happy as long as they were safe, but Jessica was different. She wasn't some jaded politician or crime lord, and he was sure she didn't understand how things were in his country, or how he was raised to treat a woman of worth. And she was a woman of worth, not one of the spoiled socialites or models he usually dated. Actually, she was the only woman of worth he'd ever been attracted to like this, so this need to make her understand him was a new experience for him as well. Leaning against the edge of the counter, he looked into her eyes and said in a low voice, Making you happy brings me pleasure. What? His English was good, thanks to years of tutoring and immersion, yet he still struggled to put his thoughts into words. I am bodyguard, but I am also man. If something would make you happy, it is my duty to provide for you. That makes me satisfied. Satisfied? Yes. Huh. I never considered it that way, but you're right. My dad, well, my adoptive father, he pretty much took care of me and my mom, and you're right. It did make him happy and satisfied. We weren't super rich, but we were well off enough that my mom could stay home and raise me, and we still managed to take family vacations. I even got a decent used truck for my 16th birthday. She flushed and set the bottle down. Though I'm sure to you, we would be considered poor. That offended him, even if it was probably true. I think you were raised in love. That is without price. Her eyes grew watery, and he sucked in a breath, wondering what he said to offend her. When she began to blink rapidly, she looked away, obviously struggling for composure. She fanned her face. Yes, I was raised with love, and yes... I know how lucky I am to have had them in my life. Can we not talk about this right now, please? The need to comfort her consumed him, but he managed not to reach for her. Sometimes he forgot how young she was compared to him, how fragile. Not just in years, but also in experience. Taking pity on her, he changed the subject before she burst out into tears. Yes, we can talk about how Max refuses to go shopping more than two hours a week. Pardon me? Max is another of your bodyguards. He will be watching over you when I cannot, along with your third primary bodyguard, Oleg. There will be other men coming and going to replace Max and Oleg for two weeks at a time, so they can go home and visit with their families. Oh, right. Three full-time bodyguards? Wow. That's, um... Well, tell them I'm not a huge shopper, more of a wanderer, so they should be okay. Oleg, he will shop with you without complaint, but it's only because he has been trained by his wife and daughters to endure it. That made Jessica burst out laughing. Oh dear. Yes, but when you see Oleg, you will know why no one teases him about his devotion to his women. He's a large man. I bet they don't. She smiled her earlier happiness returning easily. Alex was beginning to think she was one of those rare people who were easily pleased, and her default mode was cheerfulness. Not that he minded it. Her mood was contagious, and he found himself smiling more than he usually did. A soul as sweet as hers needed to be safeguarded against a world that would try to crush it like a butterfly. It would take a delicate touch to keep her safe without smothering her. Thankfully, he was here to do just that. A deep sense of expectation filled him, like he was about to embark on something important. He leaned against the counter, watching as he searched around for the shot glasses, giving him a nice profile view of her perfect breast, pressing against the soft cotton. A natural beauty who didn't need makeup and jewels to shine. Alex had almost kicked Gleb's ass when he'd attempted to flirt with Jessica. Thankfully, 
Alex had kept his temper because he had a feeling Jessica would not understand or condone them fighting until one of them was bloody. Faint warning bells rang in his head that he was becoming infatuated with her in a way that was far from professional, but he ignored them. She crossed the white tiles of the kitchen floor to him with two ruby shot glasses. Her lean hips swayed, and those fucking pants tormented him with hints of what she would look like naked. He wanted to rip the crotch open with his teeth and lick her pussy. He sucked in a slow breath through his nose and willed his erection to stand down. Just looking at her was as arousing as having his dick sucked by one of his random mistresses. The low lighting of her kitchen made her hair darken to almost a garnet tone, and her cornflower blue eyes mesmerized him. He had a feeling there were many layers to Jessica, and he looked forward to getting to know her. After all, he would be here for the next six months, studying with Peter and strengthening the Novikov Bratva's presence in the British Isles. There was no reason he could not be friends with the girl. She handed him a shot glass, then raised hers in a toast. May the wind be always at your back. To new neighbors, he replied, amused at the way she almost choked on her tequila. Yeah, neighbors. She fiddled with her glass, tension radiating from her. The need to put her at ease had him softening his gaze for her in a way he'd never done with a woman before. What part of America are you from? She looked up at him, and some of the shadows in her gaze dissipated as she studied his face, then graced him with a wry smile that made the edges of his lips turn up in response. The boring part? In the States, they call where I live flyover country. What is flyover country? She looked at him, then back at the glass in her hands. It's a place that's so dull, all people do is fly over it, never landing. Like I said, boring. Laughing, he took another sip from his tequila. What is boring to you is exotic to me. Where are you from? He almost told her the truth, that his home was in Moscow, Russia, but instead he said, Minsk, in Belarus. Belarus, huh? Leaning against the edge of her kitchen counter, she smiled at him. I'm embarrassed to say I don't know much about your country. By much, I mean anything. Is boring, he replied with a teasing smile. You tell me about your boring place, and I will tell you about mine. She smiled at him, and his chest tightened. Deal. Motioning to him, she led them into her spacious living room done in shades of purple and gray. A thick, furry white rug lay beneath a small coffee table, and a few plants hung from hooks in front of the windows. She took a seat on the sofa, and seemed a little surprised when he sat in the chair near her, instead of next to her, in an effort to make her comfortable. He obviously made her nervous, and he wanted to reassure her he meant her no harm. They chatted about their homes and families, although Alex gave her an edited version of his. Telling her that his father was a ruthless monster who ruled one of the most powerful bratvas in Russia with an iron fist, and that he was one of the world's best assassins probably wouldn't be smart or the best way to get her to relax around him. Instead, he went with one of several background stories he had for his various aliases. But he didn't lie that much. He told her how his mother had passed away years ago, leaving out the part about them being assassinated, and how he had a younger half-brother he was very close with. He'd also once had a stepmother, a kind, sweet woman who had doted on Alex like her own, also assassinated. He said that she'd passed of an illness along with his much-loved younger half-sister. The cruel reminder of the reality of his life crashed down on him, and he felt like an asshole for even thinking of involving her in his world. Yet, he couldn't force himself to move. Her presence was like a balm to him, a soothing caress that seemed to wash clean some of the darkness clinging to him. The feeling left behind was so unusual that he couldn't really give it a name. He knew only that there was a warmth in his body, a relaxation that had the tension draining from his body. Every time she smiled at him, that warmth grew more intense. It was a feeling that he could easily become addicted to, but he didn't like the loss of control over his normally carefully guarded emotions. 
He didn't know if it was her youth or her innocence or both, but he found he genuinely liked her. She had a quick sense of humor and was bright, a pleasure to talk with. Damn, being here was making him think things about her he knew better than to even consider. Time to leave before he gave in to the forbidden temptation. She was the kind of woman a man would be happy waking up next to for the rest of his life. Alarmed by the direction of his thoughts, he set the glass down with a sigh. I must go. She stared at him, frowning slightly, her lower lip sticking out in a pout that he wanted to kiss so badly his cock ached. Okay. Without another word, he went to her door, but her hand caught his shoulder. Right away, he stopped. Her delicate touch was stronger than titanium. Then he slowly turned to face her. At the sight of the worry in her eyes, his gut clenched. Did I say something to offend you? No. She gave him a disbelieving look, and there was no mistaking he'd hurt her feelings in some way, so he tried to smooth it over. It just occurred to me my men are in my apartment drinking as well, and no doubt causing trouble. I need to go before they destroy. Her giggle raced along his spine. Yeah, you better get back. The need to touch her swamped him, and he was helpless against his instincts around her. Looking into her eyes, he let the darkness he kept hidden from her rise to the surface. Her mouth parted, and she let out a soft breath, totally captured by his gaze and the desire he was having a hard time suppressing. He couldn't believe that at first he'd thought her merely pretty. Up close, her beauty captivated him. Women in his country would spend fortunes on plastic surgery trying to attain the perfection of her delicate facial features, and her hair was the most gorgeous color he'd ever seen. Add to that her beautiful, tilted blue eyes, and she could slay a man with a glance. All these emotions mixed with the sexual charge warming him, making it stronger until his cock ached. He'd meant to make a point and show Jessica how easily he could seduce her. Instead, he was the one who had a racing heart. Curving his hand behind her neck, he tucked her closer until less than a half inch separated their bodies. The heat built between them as their gazes locked, drawn closer like iron fillings to a magnet. Soon, she was pressed against him from breast to hip, and he wanted to fuck her more than he'd ever wanted a woman. She smelled so good, felt so good and his heart cried out in protest at the thought of releasing her. It took everything he had, but somehow he found the strength to let her go and take a step back, hoping she didn't see the tremors going through him. I would have you, and it would be the most amazing experience of my life. Perfection. But it is not right time. A little bit of panic cleared the lust from her gaze, and she almost reached for him before lacing her hands behind her back and lifting her small, pointed chin. Alex, I know that you're used to women offering to have your babies, but although you are attractive, you're also correct. We are not meant to be. He wanted to scream at her that she was wrong, and the potential for what they could have together was everything he wanted but couldn't have. Yes. A smile curved her lips, and she visibly relaxed. But we can still be friends. Friends? Yeah, you know, friends. If you're going to be around a lot, I'd rather things be comfortable between us. The misery in his heart lightened as he clung to that idea, desperate to have some reason to spend time with her. Yes, I would like to be friends. Strictly platonic friends. Of course. Walking him to her door, she held her hand out. Thanks for stopping by, friend. He took it, but instead of shaking, he gave her knuckles a soft kiss, brushing his goatee against her creamy skin and taking her fresh scent in deep. Thank you for good hospitality, friend. When he left, she still hadn't responded, but she was cradling the hand he'd kissed to her chest with a stunned look. They would be friends, just friends, and he would treat her as nothing more than a client. 
Surely he was strong enough to resist the innocent charms of a girl who was still learning how to be a woman. Two weeks later, Alex had realized the futility of trying to see Jessica as nothing more than a client. His resolve to leave her alone had been quickly replaced by his need to see her as often as he could. Which wasn't as often as he'd like. In between learning forgery from Peter and dealing with Bratva issues, he'd been busy. In an effort to get his desires under control, he'd been to a local BDSM dungeon a couple times and had relieved himself with some willing and beautiful submissives, but none of them quenched the fire for Jessica that steadily grew inside of him. Though it shamed him to admit it, when he was in his apartment in Dublin, He'd listen for her door opening into the communal hallway and dash for his, pretending to be leaving at the same time. He'd forgotten his jacket a couple of times, and she'd given him odd looks, but made small talk with him. Every time he did see her, his obsession with her grew. Her enchanting blue eyes held more depth and wisdom than most grown women, yet she wasn't bitter. The world was a bright, exciting place for Jessica, an adventure and he loved watching her experience it while he guarded her. To say she brought out his protective instincts was like saying water was wet. He was obsessed with keeping her safe, something that had proven difficult. Not because of any outright attacks on her, but because Jessica liked to wander and didn't pay any attention to her surroundings, ignorant of the headaches she was creating for her bodyguards. A couple times she'd been in real danger, but she never knew it. Luca, Oleg, and Max were quick to neutralize any threat, but they told him Jessica seemed to attract trouble through no fault of her own, because she believed the best in people. It never seemed to occur to her that someone would want to hurt her, and that made her very vulnerable to men who like to prey on the innocent. Alex had been with her more than once when she walked blindly into situations and places she had no business being, like stopping in a bar owned by a rival Irish mafia family, the O'Doyles, before he could stop her. The blood feud between Peter's people and the O'Doyles went back centuries, but when Jessica walked up to the bar, fearless in her ignorance, and asked for directions, Alex had been a heartbeat away from reaching for his gun and shooting his way out. Oblivious of the tension her presence was causing in the pub, she'd complimented the bartender on the huge stained glass window behind him and had asked him about it. The young O'Doyle man working at the bar stared at her, then answered her questions about the stained glass that used to be in a church. The bartender had given Alex a baffled look, plainly thrown off by Jessica's friendliness, but Alex merely shrugged. By the time she left, the bartender was telling her about other spots in Dublin and where she could find more historical buildings that might interest her with a genuine smile. Things like that happened all the time around his girl. She needed someone to protect her, someone to fight off the wolves that would be drawn to her. More than one predator had tried to apprehend Jessica when Alex and his men trailed behind her, attempting to give her some semblance of privacy as she took in the world around her. It was not safe for a woman to walk alone in certain parts of Dublin, and poor Luca had come home repeatedly with scraped-up knuckles, shaking his head and regaling Alex about another night spent guarding the fairy princess who seemed to float her way through the world in a fragile bubble of ignorant bliss. If she wasn't so damn sweet and adorable, he'd have strangled her by now. When Alex mentioned his men didn't speak English as well as she did, she immediately volunteered to tutor them any way she could. She'd embraced the role eagerly, spending a great deal of her free time with the men, talking and hanging out with them until she became a part of their lives. To Alex's amusement, Oleg, his mentor and the man he thought of as a surrogate uncle, and Max, Alex's right-hand man and fellow assassins, had grown rather fond of Jessica during those talks. She was very open and told them much about her life, all of which they repeated to Alex. He was sure all of his men knew his interest in Jessica went far beyond a professional one, but so far, none of them had said anything. Alex wandered into the pub, knowing Jessica was there. Max had said Jessica was withdrawn and quiet, not her usual self at all. 
He was worried about her, but she pretended nothing was wrong. It bothered Alex more than he cared to admit that someone or something might have hurt her, but he'd been tied up with one of Peter's men all day, learning how to forge passports. Now it was late, and the bar was closing, but no one paid him any mind. It wasn't unusual to see him here when Jessica was working, and when he spotted her sitting in a booth at the back of the large room, he was glad he had come instead of Max. Dressed in a tight navy shirt and worn jeans, she looked tired, almost ill, and the luster was gone from her gaze. She had an open bottle of vodka in front of her and a shot glass. Without asking, he grabbed the bottle from her hands and slid into the booth next to her. A slow jazz melody was playing low, and the atmosphere was relaxed. Unfortunately, his girl was not. Tension radiated from her and when he touched her, she was as stiff as stone. When her lower lip trembled, he clenched his hands into fists. Something, or someone, had hurt her, badly, and he had to tamp down on the urge to order her to tell him who had done this to her, so he could go end their life. Her voice came out thick as she continued to stare at the shot glass she was toying with. Hello, friend. When she didn't say anything else, he took a long drink before handing the bottle back to her. If there was one thing he understood, it was the need to drown emotion in alcohol. Sometimes it was the only way life seemed bearable. The thought of Jessica feeling that way hurt him inside, in a place in his soul he'd never felt before. Hello, friend. He brushed her hair back, revealing a few tear tracks. Why are you sad? Has someone upset you? She took in a deep, watery breath and let it out slowly. No, I'm sorry. You might not want to hang out with me right now. I'm afraid I won't be very good company. Jessica, he said in a soothing tone that made her turn her wounded gaze in his direction. What is wrong? Her lower lip trembled, and she blinked back tears. It's the anniversary of my mom's death. Well, my adoptive mom. My birth mother died not long after I was born. But I've heard so many good things about her from Peter that I feel like I know her. Makes me wish more than ever she'd stuck around long enough for me to remember how it felt to hug her. It took a great deal of effort for Alex to hide his emotional reaction to her words. Having lost not just his mother, but the stepmother he'd loved as well to mafia violence, gave him an insight into her pain that made his chest hurt. He hated the thought of her suffering, but didn't know how to make it any better. I am sorry for your loss. How long ago? Two years. She gave a watery sigh and glanced over at him. The blue of her irises glowed like neon because of her red, swollen eyes. I was hoping this year would be better, but it's not. Without thought, he pulled her into his embrace, tucking her head beneath his chin. She fit against him perfectly, her body molding to his as if they'd found solace in each other's arms for years. She felt divine, and his entire body lit up at her touch. Her breath came out in a shuddering sigh. You smell good. He smiled against the top of her head. I glad you approve. Jessica nodded, her arms wrapping around his waist as she wiggled closer. Taking the silent hint, he gently pulled her into his arms until she was cradled on his lap. Holding her like this made him realize how tiny she was. He'd look like a dark beast rotting on a fairy princess if they ever had sex. No, no thinking about that right now. Unable to reply, he merely nodded. Realizing the pub was almost empty except for the cleaning people who were watching them curiously, he brushed her hair back again. Come, it's time to go home. Yeah, home. Their trip back to their apartment was silent, her gait a little unsteady from the alcohol, and he missed her normal happy chatter. When they reached the hallway separating their apartments, she looked up at him. Can I ask you a favor? What is it? Will you come up to the roof with me? Why? I have something I have to do, and I'd rather not be alone while I did it, if that's okay with you. 
He needed to take the wounded look out of her eyes. Anything you need, Jessica, I will do. Her voice thickened as she whispered, Thanks. Wait here, I'll be right back. When she came out into the hallway, he frowned at the sight of a big, white, helium-filled balloon with what appeared to be a bunch of writing on it in black marker. What is that? She flushed, closed her door, and started toward the stairway at the end of the hall that led to the roof. It's, well, it's a way of grieving. I do not understand. As they made their way up the stairs, she explained. My friend told me about this, and the idea kind of stuck with me. Her younger brother died of cancer, and every year on the anniversary of his death, she writes him a letter on a balloon, then sets it free. She said it was her way of communicating with him. At first I thought it was kind of a silly idea, but, like I said, the more I thought about it, the more sense it made. So I um, went and got a balloon today and wrote a letter on it to my mom. When something hurts this bad, you'll do anything to relieve the agony. Even send up a balloon with the hopes of it reaching heaven. The ambient light from the city dimly illuminated her face as she opened the door to the rooftop, the chilly breeze making her hair flare about her. When she looked over at him with the balloon in her hand, he was struck dumb by her beauty, his breath literally taken away. He didn't know if it was the lighting or the grief blanketing her, but he had a glimpse of the woman she would one day become. He reached out without thought and brushed a tear from her cheek, relishing the feel of her soft, damp skin. I do not think he's silly. Her weak smile made him want to gather her into his arms, but instead he led her a little farther out onto the roof. The night was cloudy, and the wind was brisk enough that it cut through his thick coat and gloves. Jessica didn't seem to be bothered by it, but he didn't know if that was because of the alcohol or her emotions. Reaching out, she grasped his hand and held it tight enough that it hurt, but he didn't pull it away. She could jerk his arm off if it would make her feel better, and he would gladly let her do it. For a long moment, she stared up at the balloon whipping back and forth in the wind. Then slowly, with great reluctance, she raised her hand and let it go. Together, they watched the balloon rise into the sky, flying over the rooftops as it continued to climb until they lost sight of it. She shivered, and he drew her into his arms, then gently pressed her head against his chest. He held her while she cried, her muffled sobs staring through him. His chest hurt, and he struggled to rein in his emotions, but she totally overwhelmed him. When she pulled back, her gaze fastened on his lips. I'm so tired of hurting, Alex, she whispered. I don't want to feel this terrible loss anymore. Kiss me and make it go away. A hard tremor went through him that had nothing to do with the cold. He was dying to kiss her, to take her hard, to bury himself in her and give her nothing but pleasure, which was exactly the reason he could not indulge in any type of physical intimacy with her. One kiss, and there would be no going back. Plus, she was drunk and grieving right now. She had no idea what she was asking for. He gently pulled out of her arms and set her away from him. I can think of another way to distract you. She gave him a puzzled look, her eyes glassy from the alcohol and her tears. And what would that be? Do you play chess? Chapter 5 Jessica blinked up at him like an adorable owl, and he couldn't help but laugh at her stunned expression. I offer sex, and you want to play chess? You did not offer sex, because you are drunk. Niet, Princess Samoya. Now, if you make the same offer tomorrow, when you are sober... What did you just say? Niet means no. And the other part? Not ready to explain why he called her his princess, he tried to distract her. Are you trying to... What is the phrase? Back out. Do not play because you are scared. Is okay. I understand. You do not want embarrassment of losing. 
She glared at him. If she'd been a cat, her fur would have been standing up. Then her expression cleared, and the first hint of the vibrant young woman he'd come to know peeking through her veil of mourning. Tell you what, if I win at chess, I get an orgasm. If you win, I'll owe you some future favor. Dirty images galore exploded in his thoughts as he imagined all the things he could request as a favor. The need to take her was so strong for a moment that he took a step closer to her, then stopped. God damn it, his body wasn't even remotely under his control anymore. The savage part of him kept rising to the surface, demanding he take her, make her his. He'd never felt this way about a woman before. This duality of caring for Jessica in the gentlest of ways, combined with an almost psychotic need to destroy anything that threatened her in the most violent manner possible. He was so fucked. Agreed. He almost bit his tongue, intending to say he was going to bed, but somehow that word slipped out instead. Do you have bored? Fluttering her lashes at him, she motioned for him to follow her as she headed back to the stairs. I may have one or two. When they were in her warm, inviting apartment, she led him into the cozy living room and flipped on the lights, revealing a new piece of pottery on the coffee table he hadn't seen before. Little by little, Jessica was putting her stamp on the apartment, and he was glad she was making it her home instead of just a place to sleep. It was decorated with furniture similar to his place across the hall, and he realized Jessica probably didn't have much of anything of her own here in Ireland. His gut tightened when he considered the fact that all of Jessica's things were in the U.S., because that's where she lived. He didn't like the idea of her returning to the United States at all. His gaze cut over to another wall, his memory triggering that something new had been added over there as well. There were three new framed photographs sitting on the shelves that flanked the big screen TV, and he wanted to go look at them, but Jessica motioned him to follow her in the opposite direction. As soon as she turned on the dim brass lamp over the chessboard, he couldn't help but smile. Then he wondered if the elaborate, detailed fantasy chessboard had come with the apartment, or if it was one of Jessica's personal possessions. The board featured an elfin maiden as the queen, and she reminded him of Jessica with her delicate beauty. For a moment, he was disgusted with himself for getting this soft over a woman, but she'd shared something deep with him tonight by allowing him to witness her ritual to deal with her family member's death. It was a much healthier tradition than drinking into oblivion, which is how Alex and Dimitri coped with their losses. Then again, Jessica had been drinking heavily earlier in the night and was probably still pretty drunk right now. She was a bit unsteady as she took her seat. Then she had to use the bathroom. Then she was thirsty and needed some water. Then she wanted a sandwich and made him one as well before they finally sat down to play. Her delay had allowed her time to sober up, and he wondered if that was a calculated move or if she was just drunk and hungry. She'd consumed a fair amount of strong alcohol, and he felt slightly guilty that he was playing with an inebriated woman for a favor. But all was fair in love and war. His guilt lasted about three rounds until he realized he'd been suckered by a girl barely old enough to drink. Alex prided himself on being a methodical, ruthless chess player, impossible to ruffle, always cool and composed. After all, he'd learned to play chess from his father, and the head of the Novikov Bratva was famous for his brilliant strategies in chess and life. Yet, Alex found himself losing badly to a girl who was playing chess with one hand and eating chips out of a huge ceramic bowl with the other. Even worse, she seemed more interested in her food than the game, which meant beating him had been easy for her. Alex's distress might have been a bit obvious as he ran a hand through his hair repeatedly, staring at the board. Jessica was either crazy or a genius. She'd managed to get him in checkmate without him even being aware of her plan. She was a ruthless player, sacrificing with abandon. 
She'd shut him down in a perfectly executed series of moves he'd been unable to predict. Normally he'd be irritated. He wasn't a good loser. But her glee at managing to trap him brought a smile to her face and light back to her eyes. Her lips pressed together as she tried to hold back her laughter. What? Did you think that just because I have tits and a pussy I can't play chess? That was right along the lines of what he'd been thinking, much to his chagrin, and he gave her his warmest smile, adoring the way she blushed. In an impulsive moment, he decided to be honest with her. You are brilliant. I have played many, many crafty players. But you, you take my breath away. So sweet, so pure, but such a dirty, cutthroat strategist. Brilliant. If he thought he'd seen her happy before, it was nothing compared to her smile right now. It positively stunned him, and he had to resist the urge to reach across the table and pull her to him for a kiss. Thanks. My dad taught me how to play as well. He may have been a farmer, but that didn't mean he wasn't smart. My mom used to say that he could have been anything he wanted. A doctor, a lawyer, president of the United States. But instead, he'd chosen to be happy. Her voice broke on the last word, and tears filled her eyes. The pain that radiated from her felt like his own, but he had no idea how to ease her. It sounded callous, cruel even, but he never really cared about a woman's emotions enough to offer her comfort. Oh, he'd soothed female friends when they were hurt or troubled, but this was different. More personal, somehow. Every summer, when blueberry season rolled around... He'd take us out to this huge old patch that lined our road for miles. Sweetest blueberries ever, if you could get them before the birds did. He told me one day when I was younger and my mom and some friends were with us picking berries that he was the happiest man in the world, and it was all because of his girls. She stopped eating and sighed. It made me proud to know that, to know that my mom and I were so special to him that we made him the happiest man in the world. I can still remember that moment perfectly. Shit, I... Shit. Give me a sec, okay? Of course. As he watched Jessica fight back her tears, his need to make her his grew. He wanted to protect her and fill her life with nothing but happiness, to keep the bright light of her spirit burning, undimmed by sorrow. She deserved to know nothing but happiness, to have a man who would worship her and treat her like the princess she was. If she was his woman, he would do just that, and he knew his life with her would be bliss. The mental image of waking up every morning to see her glorious hair spread over his pillow, to see those beautiful blue eyes warmed with love, felt so right that the temptation of keeping her sank deep into his soul and settled there. But his world wasn't ready for her yet, so he would have to keep his distance until he could rectify certain delicate situations. She must have sensed his shift in mood because she dashed a tear off her cheek and forced a smile. You're awfully quiet. Are you butthurt about losing to a girl? What she said was so absurd, so not what he was thinking, that he couldn't help but laugh. I assure you, my pride and ass. Are intact. Something shifted in her gaze as they grinned at each other, a spark of heat that made her pupils dilate. Her gaze was on his mouth and she bit her lower lip. He couldn't help but wonder if she was thinking about kissing him or him kissing her in more intimate places. The thought of tasting her pizza made his mouth water and his cock pressed against his pants in an uncomfortable manner. She'd caused him to become achingly hard at just the thought of what she would look like when she was coming on his tongue. She slowly stood from her chair, her hair falling around her like silk. He watched her gather her courage, her shoulders squaring, and a determined, possibly dangerous look heating her gaze. He should leave, but he remained where he was, spellbound by the gentle creature approaching him. Without a doubt... For all of her sexual aggression, she was skittish. Her gaze darted about before finally settling somewhere in the region of his lips. A gentle rain had begun to fall outside, and he found it to be the perfect backdrop for his Jessica. 
She was a daughter of Ireland, and he admired her pale, perfect beauty that housed such a strong spirit. After swallowing hard and unclenching her fists, she tentatively reached out and placed her faintly trembling fingertip against his lips. I want these. She ran the tips of her fingers over her mouth. Here, please. Raw, carnal need blasted through him, but he tried to keep it in check. He wanted to devour her. Instead, he kissed the tip of her finger, tasting the salt on her skin, to give her one last chance to run. Still sitting, he looked up at her, now inundated by the faint smell of her musky, aroused sex. He'd never endured such torture as he maintained his calm with a perfect bounty waiting for his touch. Too bad he had to be strong for both their sakes. Jessica, this is not good idea. I do not want to harm friendship. Please, Alex, I need to feel alive. Be my friend. Kiss me. His control deserted him, and without thought, he gripped her hips and nuzzled his face against her flat belly. She smelled so good, and when he lifted her top with his nose so he could kiss her hip, she shivered against him. Soft. So very, very soft. The way she responded to his touch was intoxicating. Vast amounts of hormones flooded his system while the need to have her roared through him. He wanted her more than he'd ever wanted anyone, and if she touched him, he wouldn't be able to stop until he was inside her with her nails digging into his back hard enough to draw blood. Her breath came out in shallow pants, and when he looked up at her, the absolute trust in her eyes was like a harsh slap of reality. We cannot do this. Is mistake. A hot blush filled her face, and he didn't like how easily her feelings got hurt. Shit, he hadn't meant to sound so harsh, but she couldn't know his plans for her yet. No, he'd made a dangerous decision that would change the course of both their lives. Better to let her remain ignorant and free of worry. He would complicate her world soon enough. Her face paled even as her cheeks remained red. I see. Jessica swayed so hard her hip bumped the table and the chess pieces rolled to the floor. She flinched and rubbed her hip, immediately triggering his need to care for her. The tears were back in her eyes and he cursed himself for being such a fool, for engaging in play like this with her when she was at her most vulnerable. The way she winced when she touched her hip made him flinch, and he knew that it was at least one thing he could take care of for her. He pulled her grey pants down to reveal her reddened skin. Ignoring her attempt to push him away, she obviously had no idea how to fight. He gently robbed the mark, relishing how soft her skin was. She relaxed beneath his touch, her body swaying into his as he caressed her. Her swearing at him finally penetrated his concern, and he couldn't help but smile. His princess had a dirty mouth. I said get your motherfucking hands off of me, you big perverted bastard. You don't want me. I get that loud and clear, so let me go. I'll be damned if I'll be any man's pity fuck. He wasn't sure what a pity fuck was, but he knew he didn't like the pain in her voice. Instead of fighting with her... He merely stood, then held her close and gently stroked her back with long, soothing sweeps of his hand. She fought his hold for a few more moments, token wiggles that did nothing to dislodge him, before she melted against him. Good. She needed to know his touch to become comfortable with him. It was going to be a long, slow seduction to win Jessica's heart, but he was known for his patience. If he could wait three days in a tree to get the perfect shot on a mark, he could wait for Jessica to become more comfortable with him. Shh, Dorogaya, let me hold you. Her entire body seemed to conform to his, and her lighter weight easily settled against his much taller, solid frame. When her arms went around his waist, he sighed against the top of her head before placing a gentle kiss there. She smelled sweet, edible, almost like an apple pie. It was such an unusual scent to him. 
The women he was intimate with usually wore expensive perfumes and lotions, but he found the crisp, spicy scent highly erotic on her. After standing there for several long minutes, cuddling with each other, Jessica stiffened in his arms, then leaned back and softened slightly. I'm not usually like this. I know. He understood her pride, the need to appear strong. She met his gaze, and some of the shame left her expression. Thanks for tonight, for everything. Is honor, he murmured, then brushed a strand of her brilliant hair back from her cheek. She searched his face before she spoke. Would you sleep with me tonight? Oh, how she tempted him. Jessica, I told you I would not take advantage. I'm not talking about sex. Calm down, Casanova. Your virtue is safe. I know I'll have a hard time falling asleep tonight, and, and I'm lonely. Really, really lonely. When you hold me like this, I don't feel lonely anymore. So just for tonight, can you help me not be lonely? His heart ached as he stared down at her, wanting to tell her he finally felt at peace with her in his arms, but he couldn't, so instead, he took her hand and nodded. Her bedroom was surprisingly feminine compared to the rest of the apartment, pale peach walls and a brass canopy bed with a jade floral silk comforter. A small fireplace with a large grey-coloured marble hearth took up the far wall, and framed photographs of people he recognized as different members of her family took up every inch of mantel space. There were some clothes scattered on the floor, but for the most part, Jessica kept her room clean. She turned off the light next to her bed before he could get a good look at the rest of the space. Take your shoes off, she whispered, then with a bit of her usual spirit returning, she added in a leering voice that ended up sounding like a giggle. Or anything else you want. He laughed and shook his head. Behave. Normally he slept nude, but he kept everything on except his shoes. He turned his back while Jessica put on a thick green flannel nightgown that fell to her knees. The fact she chose that dowdy thing instead of some silky piece of lingerie let him know he'd made the right choice. That regardless of her words, she was not ready for him yet. The sheets rustled as she scooted beneath them, then wiggled around until she was comfortable. Instead of joining her, he lay down atop the sheets, needing that barrier between them. He had no intention of spending the night. The temptation of waking next to her and touching her would be too much for his sleep-softened brain to absorb, but he could be with her until she went to sleep. So when she laid her head on his chest and cuddled against him, he gladly gathered her into his arms and lightly rubbed her slender back. He soaked into his dark soul her light and marveled at how right and perfect she felt against him, how she seemed to energize and renew him somehow. There was no more fighting the fact that she was meant for him. It would take time for his still-forming plans to work, but when he was ready... He was going to take Jessica Venture and make her his wife. And there wasn't a man in the world who would be able to stop him. Chapter 6 Five weeks later, Jessica found herself cleaning the bar in the slow time between lunch and dinner, while looking forward to her chess game that evening with Alex and his men. Mox, Oleg, and Luca seemed to have adopted her as their little sister and she didn't mind one bit. They were always around, and she had to admit, as odd as it was, a group of older, scary Bulgarian bodyguards were her best friends in Ireland. Even when they weren't on duty, they would stop by to check on her and hang out. She'd also discovered that big, burly Oleg had a rather odd and secret fondness for the American dance shows featuring celebrities past their prime and they'd spent many a night watching the shows while Oleg yelled at the judges. Since the night of the anniversary of her mother's death, she'd rarely been alone with Alex, almost like he was avoiding it. Not that she could blame him after the way she'd drunkenly thrown herself at him. Those memories still made her burn with embarrassment when she thought about him repeatedly turning down her request for a kiss. But luckily, Alex pretended it never happened. For that... She was eternally grateful. 
disappointed, but grateful. After that night, she knew she was firmly in the friend zone box with Alex, a fact that was emphasized when she overheard one of the other bartenders talking about how good Alex had been in bed the night before. The woman, a big-breasted brunette named Millie, had gone on and on about it, bragging to her friend about how many times she'd come. The only consolation Jessica had was that, when Alex was at the pub, he ignored Millie, so she must not have been that great in the sack. Oh, but the knowledge that Millie had sex with Alex burned like acid, knowing he'd fucked another woman when he could have easily had Jessica. But she managed to swallow back her pain. It wasn't his fault she developed a stupid crush on him. Since that night, he'd been nothing but kind to her. Once he let his guard down, she found that he had a great sense of humor, if a bit dry, and they shared many things in common, like their love of chess. Their matches had become a regular thing, and she looked forward to pitting herself against him. Sometimes he won, most of the time she won, but it was always a challenge. Whoever hosted the match that night would also prepare some food, and she thoroughly enjoyed having people over. Alex never came alone, always bringing a friend or two with him. She'd enjoyed getting to know them, and loved the fact that these scary, stoic men relaxed enough around her in private to laugh and joke with her. Mox was a very handsome man with thick reddish blonde hair, and on the rare occasions when he did allow himself to smile, it was full of warmth. She'd learned that he was Alex's right-hand man, and had grown up with Alex in Minsk. Then there was Oleg, a big, bald giant with a crooked nose who rarely smiled and spoke only the most rudimentary English, but had a wry sense of humor that always made her laugh. He was very patient with her, and once she found out that he had two young daughters, she knew why he put up with her. Even when Alex wasn't around, Oleg would stop by to see if she wanted to go walk around the town or go to a pub. Oleg would seek her out at work, and during slow times she'd discuss philosophy and politics with him, fascinated by how different his Eastern European mindset was from her American one. Sometimes his practical view of life was almost brutal, but she could see his point in many ways, even if she found it odd. Then again, he found her unflinching optimism weird, and they would often descend into glass-half-full, half-empty discussions. Then there was Luca, with his golden-brown hair and seductive gaze, the flirt of the bunch. He was a few years younger than Alex, closer to her age, and his eyes always seemed to twinkle with mischief. Luca wasn't around as much as the other two, but when it was his turn to guard her, he made sure she had fun. A couple times she thought she'd caught him checking her out, but he never hit on her, so she just dismissed it as her imagination. To the men, she was nothing more than a friend, a client, and she sometimes wondered if they even noticed she was female. Not that she wanted them trying to make a move on her. None of them appealed to her like Alex. But she had to admit, now that she was comfortable in Ireland, it would be nice to have someone special to share her life with. Someone who would hold her hand, take her dancing, and kiss her until she couldn't breathe. Someone to love. Hey, beautiful. A man said from behind her in a rich Irish brogue. A happy smile already tugged at her mouth as she turned around to find John, one of her uncle's men, leaning against the bar in his battered leather jacket, drops of rain gleaming in his light brown hair beneath the warm lights of the pub. He was a couple years older than her, good-looking in a boy-next-door way with warm, dark eyes. John worked for Peter as pretty much an errand boy, so he was always at the pub or with her uncle, and she saw him in passing a lot. His parents were both into politics, like Peter, and they'd been at a dinner party her uncle had thrown one night. Nice people, friendly if a little intimidating at first, with their obviously top-of-the-line designer clothes and upper-crust manners. Wiping her hands on the clean bar towel before setting it aside, she did a quick glance up and down the bar to make sure no one needed anything, before leaning against it and smiling at John. She was glad she'd taken a little extra time with her appearance tonight, curling her hair and going heavier on the makeup than usual in an effort to feel pretty. 
when his gaze warmed as it roamed her face. She fought a flush. Hello, handsome. They always greeted each other like this, and she enjoyed flirting with him. It was nice to have the attention of a man who was clearly into her, even if he didn't set her body aflame like Alex. As much fun as it was to hang out with Alex and his crew, she missed having someone to go on dates with. And if she was being honest, she was sexually starved as well. She'd never been without for this long, since she started having sex when she was 17, and John looked like he'd know how to show a girl a good time. Still, a small part of her had held back from John, in the stupid hope that maybe Alex would see her as something more than a friend. But after the last six weeks, she didn't think it was going to happen. That realization hurt, but not as much as having a crush on a man she knew was sleeping with other women. That shit burned, hurt so bad that even thinking about it made the smile fall from her lips. It was time to let her fantasies of Alex go and focus on reality. John, ever attentive to her mood, reached across the counter and brushed a strand of hair back from her cheek that had escaped her silver barrette. Why the sad eyes are mourning? She felt a soft, warm tingle where his fingertips brushed over the shell of her ear and down her jaw. Then the tingle settled into the neglected space between her legs. It wasn't the bone-clenching desire she felt whenever Alex touched her, but still, it was a nice sensation. Not wanting to discuss Alex with John, she looked away from John's steady gaze and out the mullion windows facing the street. I wish it would snow. It doesn't feel like Christmas without the snow. We may not have snow, but give it a few days and everyone will have their decorations up. That should lift your spirits. Dublin really is beautiful during the holidays, but probably different from the States. His gaze went gentle. Must be hard being in a new place at Christmas. It is. Well, we're glad to have you here, and I know your aunt and uncle are overjoyed to have you with them. I hope you'll give us a chance to show you how good it can be here for you, Jessica. The sincerity in his gaze touched her, and she patted his hand while she tried not to think about the fact that, if her parents were still alive, they'd be getting ready for their annual trip to the Milsons tree farm. Her extended relatives had invited her back to the States, but Uncle Peter and Aunt Mary were going all out for her this year, and she knew it would hurt their feelings if she left. They were having a big Christmas party next week and made sure to include her in the planning, doing their best to show her how pleased they were that she was spending the holidays with them instead of going home. She wondered what Alex was going to do for Christmas and which lucky woman he was going to celebrate the holidays with. Angry at herself for caring, she forced a smile at John. Can I get you anything to drink? Nah. He studied her with enough intensity that she had to fight the urge to squirm. I wanted to ask you something, though. There was something in his intent expression that made her nervous. What's that? Would you like to come to the tree lighting with me? When she didn't respond right away, his cheeks grew pink, and he said in a hurried torrent, It's a big affair with music and food and all kinds of things to do and see. I figured since it was your first year here, you should see it right, like a local and not a tourist. That is, if you want. Me and some of my friends are going to go pub hopping afterward, and I'd like you to come with us. A bit of warmth traveled through her as he blathered on and she couldn't help but smile at how tense he was beneath his usual cockiness. I'd love to. The way his tight shoulders dropped and the happy light in his eyes made her smile as he said in obvious surprise. Really? Sure. When is it? Tomorrow. I already asked your Uncle Peter and he said you could go. Um, what? I didn't realize that I needed my uncle's permission to go anywhere. He must have caught her peeved expression, because he grabbed one of her hands in his and ran his thumb over the knuckles in a soothing manner. Easy there, Jessica. He's just trying to look out for you. Being who he is and all that, he has to be careful. Who he is? His gaze darted away. You know, a politician and a wealthy businessman. 
She stiffened and lifted her chin. Well, for future reference, I'm an adult who is capable of making her own decisions on who I do and don't go out with. Ah, lass, don't be mad. Lovely as you are, you know Peter's just looking out for you. God save me if I have daughters as beautiful as you. Turn my hair gray with worry before they're out of the cradle. He winked with a rakish grin, and she swore one of the nearby servers sighed. That mollified her somewhat, but she still shot a glare in the direction of the stairs leading to her uncle's home, only to find Oleg sitting at a table nearby and watching them with a decidedly unhappy expression. She blinked, wondering what had her friend upset. But before she could give it any further thought, John drew her attention back to him by gently tugging at her hand. Jessica. His expression was unexpectedly grave, and she frowned at him. Yes? Are you involved with Alex Goriv? What? No, no, he's my bodyguard. He raised an eyebrow and tilted his head in Oleg's direction. Then why does one of his men look like he's thinking about cutting my throat? Oleg had indeed been looking at John like he was thinking about violent things. She shrugged, used to the men's overprotective nature with her. That's just Oleg. He's a friend of mine and my bodyguard. But he's also kind of overprotective. Says I remind him of his daughters. But don't worry, he's not mad at you. He always looks like that. He's your bodyguard and your friend? Well, yeah. Why wouldn't we be friends? Alex lives across the hall from me, and they come over and hang out a lot. They're really nice guys once you get to know them and get past the language barrier. John's expression became serious. Jessica, you don't need to be around the likes of them. Let them guard you, but do not get personally involved with any of them. I know your uncle has his reason for them being here, but I don't want you getting hurt by Alexander. Gorev. He's been nothing but nice to me. His lips twitched like he wanted to say something, but he finally shook his head. Just roast me when I say Alex isn't the kind of man that's nice to a woman without wanting something. She tried to pull her hand away, but he held tight. What are you trying to say? I just worry about you is all. I like you. You're sweet, the sweetest girl I've ever met, and I don't want anyone to take advantage of your good nature. No offense, but you aren't used to men like Alex. Irritated now, she jerked her hand. Look, I'm not stupid, okay? I know how to take care of myself, and Alex and his men have been nothing but polite with me. Is it so hard to believe that someone would want to be my friend? No, that's not hard to believe at all. Any man would consider himself lucky to have you smile at him, but he'd want you as more than a friend. Well, I can assure you that Alex and his buddies don't think of me that way. Yes, they do. She snorted, and his expression softened. That little thrill of warmth stirred in her belly again. Ah, I see it now. You have no idea how lovely you are, do you? A man can't help but look at you and wonder what it would feel like to have your soft lips pressed to his, your cheeks pink from his kiss. Heat suffused her face with her blush. She knew she was pretty, though she wouldn't go so far as beautiful, and totally did not see herself as the kind of woman guys would fantasize about. They sure as shit hadn't in high school. For one thing, her body type wasn't the curvy kind men seemed to go gaga for. And for another, she certainly didn't draw attention like Gwen, the stunning bartender that had slept with Alex. Whatever that woman had, Jessica obviously didn't. If she did, Alex would be in her bed instead of Gwen's. Thanks for the kind words, but you don't have to blow smoke up my ass. He laughed, then reached across the bar and cupped her chin in his hand. With desire darkening his gaze, he leaned in close enough that she could feel the warmth of his breath on her face as he whispered, In case you haven't noticed, lass, I think you're gorgeous. The pleasant flutter in her stomach was stronger this time. But before she could respond, Uncle Peter's voice rang out over the pub in a teasing shout, John, get your filthy hands off my knees. Startled, she jerked away and blushed furiously while the other patrons laughed. John merely smiled at her, then turned to face her uncle with an arrogant tilt to his chin. 
When John did, he tensed, and all the humor disappeared from his face, replaced with a challenging look. Startled by his reaction, she turned to look at her uncle and gripped the edge of the bar when she saw a very pissed-off Alex standing next to Peter and glaring at John. Oleg was now at Alex's side, and his glower was equally fierce. Puzzled by their reaction, she kept quiet as John replied, Hey, Peter, I'm taking Jessica to the tree lighting tomorrow. Gonna meet Mam and Dad there. Uncle Peter gave John a small smile, then turned his gaze on her. You sure you want to go out with this bogger? She wasn't sure what bogger meant, but by the way John grinned, it was obvious he didn't find the term offensive. Aware of the blistering cold fury Alex now directed at her, she ignored him and spoke to Peter. Yes. A pleased look suffused her uncle's reddened face, but he shook his finger in warning at John. Have her back by midnight and keep your hands to yourself or I'll have them cut off and shoved up your arse. The men in the pub laughed again, and she knew her face must be bright red with embarrassment. Nice, Uncle Peter, very subtle. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have a job to do. Before she could move, John caught her wrist lightly. I'll see you tomorrow night at seven, yeah? Yeah, she whispered back, trying to summon a smile and ignore the fact that Alex now appeared to be pissed off at her. The weight of his gaze stung, and she walked away without looking at him. She was all too aware of Alex's anger burning into her while she moved to the other end of the bar and began filling a couple orders that had come in while she was talking with John. Fuck Alex. He had no right to be pissy with her. The afternoon seemed to drag on into the evening as the day blended into night. The pub was busy enough that she didn't have a chance to take much of a break at all. By the time she was done for the night, her feet and back hurt, and she really regretted taking a double shift. But one of the other bartender's kids was having a birthday, so Jessica picked it up for her. When she was done for the night, as usual, Oleg followed her out the door. The roar of the pub was quickly muffled by the thick oak door and replaced by the hum of the busy street. The air was cold enough that she shoved her hands into the pockets of her thick wool coat and tucked her chin down into the cream cashmere scarf her uncle had given her. They naturally fell in step with each other as they walked the familiar route back to her place. Oleg was a tall, big man, so she found herself taking two strides for his every one just to keep up with him as he constantly scanned the crowd. Unable to stop her mouth, she tried to get some information out of him about Alex's earlier angry mood. So, uh, what crawled up his majesty's ass and died? Oleg grunted, his version of a chuckle. <laughs> you would do well to be careful with Alex tonight, Princessa. Why? What happened? Is he okay? All too aware that she'd once again betrayed her excessive interest in Alex, she stared ahead as they navigated the busy street, the damp pavement scenting the air and mixing with the delicious aromas of various foods. Laughter rang out here and there, adding to the energy filling the sidewalk. She tried to ignore Oleg's all-too-knowing gaze on her face and concentrate on people watching as they walked. When he finally spoke, it was in a soft, chiding voice that Oleg seemed to use only with her or when he was talking to his daughters on the phone. Gentle, but firm. Jessica, you think he would react well to you going on date with other men? She chewed her lower lip, then frowned. Did he really think I was going to react well when he continues to have sex with the other bartenders? He's made it abundantly clear that he sees me as nothing more than a friend. And trust me, the fact that he's regularly screwing one of my co-workers grinds that point home. Oleg stopped abruptly, and a couple people stumbled around them, but no one bumped into him or her. The big man was not the kind of guy someone wanted to accidentally touch. People were always aware and wary of her friend. Who told you these things? Little prickles ran over her skin as Oleg's gaze turned murky. Cold. It was totally creepy and even though she knew he would never hurt her, he was really angry. Torn between the need to confess everything he wanted to know, just so he'd stop looking at her like that, 
and shutting the fuck up, she froze, the indecision leaving her paralyzed. Her heart raced, and she wondered for the first time what she had gotten herself into by becoming friends with these dark men. She was definitely out of her depth, but up until this point, they'd been nothing but kind, understanding, and funny. Oleg, in particular. The memory of her time spent with him talking about his oldest daughter and a dog he'd gotten her for Christmas had made Jessica laugh so hard she was reduced to tears, eased her apprehension. Concentrating on that mental image, her fear drained away, replaced by irritation. Before she could stop herself, she blurted out in a torrent of angry words. He flirts with women right in front of me, Oleg, in my face. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure it out. That's fine, he does his thing, whatever. But that does not mean he has some kind of claim on me. I am my own damn woman, living my life alone, and I don't need anyone. Especially not a pompous asshole who likes to play mind games with women and seems determined to fuck his way through Dublin. There was a moment of silence, and a couple people walking past chuckled. A guy up the street yelled something about how he wanted to fuck his way through her, or some dumb, drunk stuff. That broke her staring contest with Oleg, as he turned his glare on the loud man, who was stumbling away with a group of his friends urging him on. Humiliation filled her when she realized she'd just screeched like a harpy in the middle of a crowded street. Awesome. Eager to end this embarrassing freak show, she quickly pushed her way through the crowd and reached the double front doors of her apartment building in record time, despite wearing brown leather boots with two-inch heels. Those inches didn't seem like a lot, until she'd worked a double in them and her calves ached. Oleg trailed her the whole way, and she wanted to yell at him to give her some damn space, but she was done entertaining the drunks for the night. After going through the outer safety doors, past a guard, and through another set of doors to a guarded lobby, Jessica let out a low sigh as the muffled silence of the building soothed her. She knew the security of this building was crazy high because Uncle Peter wanted to keep her as safe as he could. She understood his paranoia, even if it made her uncomfortable. He'd lost his sister, and Jessica knew she looked like a delicate version of her mother. It didn't take a psychiatrist to figure out why he worried so much about her. Most nights, she took the stairs, but the thought of climbing three flights made her feet throb in protest. So instead, she stood there with Oleg, waiting in uncomfortable silence for the elevator. She hated it when people were mad at her, so, as usual, she found herself apologizing. I'm sorry I yelled at you. Is all right. At least you did not throw things. My wife would have heaved a knife at me by now. Unsure if he was kidding or not, it would take a hell of a woman to be married to Oleg. She gave him a weak smile. I'll keep that in mind. The elevator finally arrived, and they both stepped inside. She leaned against the wall and yawned, tired yet oddly keyed up. Tense. It must have been apparent because Oleg rested a hand on her shoulder and gave it a gentle squeeze. Jessica, be calm. I am calm, she snapped. Is he home? Oleg frowned. Alex? Yes, Alex. They reached her floor, and Oleg followed her out. Why? Because we need to sort some shit out. He is, but he has company. A horrible thought occurred to her. Female company? Does he have some skank in there right now? Wrong thing to say. Oleg stepped closer until he was almost within touching distance, his displeasure obvious. If he was entertaining a woman, as his friend it would be none of your business, Jessica, and you would have no right to question him. That stung, and she stumbled back a step. Right. However, that is not what he is doing. His anniversary of his stepmother and half-sister's death. His brother, Dimitri, is here with him. Is not good time for them. The blow of his words struck her so deep, the air in her lungs escaped with a hard rush. She was a terrible, self-absorbed person and felt like such a bitch. An ache filled her throat as she said, Oh no, oh God, I feel horrible. 
Is there anything I can do for them? He studied her for a long moment, his dark gaze unreadable. Can you cook? Well, yes. My mother taught me. It's nothing fancy, but they're farm recipes that have been handed down over the generations through my family. She swallowed hard, her selfish mind turning to the loss of her mother, before she forced herself to focus. I think I have the stuff I need in my kitchen for biscuits and gravy. It's good, belly-filling comfort food. Oleg's gaze had warmed by this point, and he tilted his head to her door. Go. Change into something nice. It is important in my country that a woman looks good for the first meeting with people. Uh, what? He sighed. Give the men something beautiful to look at, yes? You'd be surprised how much lovely girl can lift man's spirits. My wife will put extra effort into her appearance when I come home from work. It makes time away from her worth it. She is smart woman. You do same for Alex, and it will make him proud for Dimitri to meet you. See, just when she thought she had Oleg figured out, he'd do something that would totally change your view on him. Okay, and thanks for letting me know. Are you sure they won't mind company? I mean, I can just give them the food at the door. That might be better. I don't want to interrupt their private time. Gripping her shoulders lightly, he turned her in the direction of her door and gave her a little push. Go. At the authoritative tone in his voice, she began moving before her mind caught up with her body. Thanks again, my friend. You are welcome, Princessa. Chapter 7 Rage exploded from Alex as he listened to Oleg tell him someone had been filling Jessica's head with shit about him. What fucking bitch's tongue do I have to cut out for this? I haven't been with a woman in months, not since the night Jessica and I first played chess. Trust me, I am aware of your unusual restraint. It's made you irritable. Oleg frowned. Jessica would not say who was spreading rumors about you, but I have my theories and we'll find out. Dimitri gave a dry laugh, drawing Alex's gaze to his little brother, who was not so little anymore. They may have had different mothers, but they shared the black-ringed, grey Novikov eyes, and both had Yorg's dark hair, though Dimitri's had more red in it from his mother. His hair was longer than Alex remembered seeing it, the tips now reaching almost to his collar. Dressed in black pants and a deep burgundy dress shirt opened at the throat to expose a thick gold chain, he looked tired. The past few months had been busy for both of them. Their father had been on a tear lately, making some irrational decisions that were having a widespread impact on the Novikov Bratva. Alex had done what he could from Ireland and had gone home as much as possible to smooth things over with various allies, but Dimitri had to bear the brunt of damage control. His brothers seemed to have hardened in their time apart, and Alex wondered if that was a good or bad thing. Giving him a considering look, Dimitri leaned back and extended his arms over the back of the sleek leather couch. Is this the Jessica you've been talking about? I was hoping to meet her while I was here. Torn between the need to protect Jessica from his world and the desire for his brother to meet her, he shrugged. It sounds like she is angry with me. Perhaps another time. Oleg cleared his throat. She will be coming over in a little bit with what she calls comfort food that she is making for you both. At the mention of food, Dimitri sat all the way up. Home-cooked? Yes, it is something called biscuits and gravy. She said her mother taught her how to make it. An old American family recipe. Dimitri grinned at Alex. This girl sounds wonderful, Alex. Marry her. Shaking his head, he smiled at his brother. Dimitri had just turned twenty-two a few months ago, but still had the appetite of a teenager. Then again, Dimitri never seemed to stop growing, so his endless hunger was justifiable. Oleg cracked his neck. I need to check with some contacts about the Sokolov and Gilyov situations. I will leave you for the evening. Dimitri, it is good to see you again.
Dmitri stood and came over to Oleg, giving the older man a brief, back-smacking hug. Keep safe, my friend. The door clicked shut behind Oleg, and Alex watched Dmitri wander over to the dark window with his drink, then look down at the busy street below. Your women are asking about you back home. They miss your cock. This celibacy thing you are doing is foolish. I've never known you to go this long without a woman. Are you ill? Your dick no longer works. Nico has pills for that. Shaking his head, not ready to tell his brother how serious he was about his future with Jessica, Alex gladly took the distraction of talking about their mutual friend. How are Nico and his exquisite sub? In love, disgustingly so. Catherine asked me to remind you she expects to see you in Rome at Laz Stefano's manor. He gave a soft laugh filled with sexual undertones. Are you going to take one of your girls, or will you be inviting this Jessica to one of the Stefano's hedonistic parties? His gut clenched, but he forced his voice to remain steady. I do not know if Jessica is into the BDSM scene. Dimitri merely nodded, still looking down the street below. Nico has been talking lately about proposing to Katrin. That surprised a smile out of him. Good. She will make a wonderful wife. They are very happy together. He turned and made his way back to the couch where Alex sat. Do you think she will say yes? Why wouldn't she? You know, Katrin, she is not one for commitment. Nico lets her play with anyone she wants. Yes, he lets his girlfriend play with whoever she wants, but his wife, he may not be so willing to share. Outside, a car horn beeped long enough to penetrate the thick glass of the bulletproof windows. This Jessica, are you willing to share her? Keep your hands off of her. Raising his eyebrows, Dimitri gave him a mock-surprised look. So defensive. Don't tell me this girl means something to you. It didn't take Alex long to realize Dimitri was baiting him and fishing for information. Obviously, he'd been more transparent about his feelings than he thought. Eventually, he would tell his brother, but the time wasn't right yet. She is just a girl. Hmm, a girl that you talk about every time we speak. A girl that has you suddenly celibate. Dimitri grunted, then carefully set his glass on the coaster on the small, dark wood coffee table. Max tells me this Jessica of yours is very sweet, very innocent. That when she looks at you, it is like the sun and moon rise and set on your command. He says he would have been in her bed long ago, but you forbid it. She is Peter's niece. I am merely strengthening the ties between our families by watching out for her. It took all of his self-control to keep from going and hunting down Max. It would not help for Max to bed her and break her heart. Do not bullshit me, Alex. You never get possessive over a woman, yet the mere mention of Max fucking her has you enraged. While you may be able to hide it from others, I know you, so do not lie to me. Knowing Dimitri was right, he said nothing. And when I say your women miss you, I mean your women are complaining that you are ignoring them. Last time you were in Moscow, you didn't visit a single one or the club. You know people will notice these things, and before long, someone will become curious about what or who has drawn your attention. He forced himself to remain calm, knowing his brother was only speaking the truth, but hating that he was right. I was busy last time I was in Moscow trying to soothe tempers after our father decided to intercept a shipment of heroin meant for the Kumarin Bratva. Stopping a war between the families was more important than pussy. Dimitri gave a dry laugh. I've seen you get a blowjob while performing a hit. Again, do not lie to me, Alex. Lie to everyone else, but not to me. His brother's words stung, but he was right, no matter what. They were always honest with each other. Dimitri was the one person in this fucked-up world he trusted completely. Even so, he struggled to open up. 
She is different. What do you mean? I mean, I can feel her when she walks into a room without even seeing her. It is like my body is attuned to her in a way I've never experienced. And she is so full of life. Her spirit shines in her eyes, and it is a beautiful thing. Life is an adventure to Jessica. He sighed and ran his fingers through his hair. And she's smart, funny, and so very kind. If she sees someone who needs help, anyone, she will stop and assist them with no thought to her own self or safety. Max told me she has helped ease tensions with the O'Doyle gang's blood feud with Peter. He couldn't help the small smile of remembrance curving his lips. They own her favorite bakery. What? One day, while Max was with her, Jessica saw an old woman stuck on the side of the road in a delivery van with a flat tire. Max saw the name on the van and knew who it was, but before he could stop her, Jessica was changing the woman's tire, regardless of Margot O'Doyle's protests. Dimitri gave a low whistle. The matriarch of the O'Doyle clan. The very same. Max said Margot seemed taken aback, and Max tried to get Jessica to leave, but she refused to budge until they changed the tire for the helpless old woman. Helpless. That helpless old woman single-handedly took out six armed men back in the fifties during the Green Street Massacre. The story is still legend. Dimitri frowned. Did Margot know who Jessica was? Everyone knows who Jessica is. Peter made sure to spread the word far and wide that if anyone harmed her, there would be hell to pay. And even if they didn't know, all you have to do is take one look at Jessica to know who she is. Her mother was well known by the O'Doyle gang. She went to a private school with some of their girls, and only a blind man could miss their resemblance. Hmm, would have been the perfect opportunity to kidnap her. Yes, it would have. But evidently, Jessica made such an impression on Margot that she declared Jessica off-limits. Now Jessica goes to the bakery often and stays for tea with Margot. This forced Peter to thank Margot personally for protecting his niece and opened a line of communication between the gangs. They are by no means allies, but at least they've stopped killing and sabotaging each other. Maybe she can work the same magic with the bold in Bratva, eh? Before Alex could respond, there was a knock on the door. Dimitri gave him a shit-eating grin, leaped from the couch, and ran to the small foyer of the apartment. Alex cursed inwardly, knowing his brother could be a little... overwhelming when he was in the mood, and that Dimitri loved to fuck with him. Then again, it was nice to give Dimitri something to think about other than the morbid anniversary they had gathered together for. Jessica's nervous voice came from beyond Dimitri's broad shoulders. Um, hi. Is Alex home? The purr in Dimitri's voice alerted Alex to the fact that his brother was in full-on charming mode. You must be Jessica. I am Dimitri, Alex's brother. I can tell. You both have the same amazing eyes. She let out a nervous giggle, and Alex glared in the direction of the foyer. Here, beautiful lady, let me carry for you. Thanks. A moment later, Jessica stepped into the living room. His heart gave the solid thud it always did when he saw her, and his nervous system lit up. Tonight, her gorgeous red hair was pulled back into a thick braid, and small gold hoops glittered in her ears. She wore a dark green tank top with a cream cardigan, along with a pair of khaki pants that fit her long legs perfectly. Her gaze darted to him, and she gave him an unsure smile. A blush put some pink in her cheeks, only adding to her appeal. Without a second thought, he stood and moved to her side, taking in a deep breath of her apples and spice scent. He'd missed her. Oleg told me your brother was visiting, so I, um, made this for you guys. If you've already had dinner, I can put it in the fridge and you can warm it up for breakfast or whatever. Dimitri was already on his way into the kitchen with the large blue pot. We eat now. She nervously shifted and began to edge back toward the foyer. Well, have a good night. Alex tilted his head. You are leaving. I don't want to interrupt your time with your brother. 
She lowered her voice, and her gaze darted to Dimitri in the kitchen. Oleg told me what today is. I totally understand if you want to be alone. Stay. The soft word came out more like a command than a request. She still looked ready to bolt, so he gently took her small hand in his, a shock moving through his system at that simple touch. Her lips parted, and she stared up at him, allowing him to draw her closer until they were separated by less than a foot. Are... are you sure? Yes, Princess Samoya, I am sure. We could use your light tonight. My light? Your soul shines so bright it... what is the right word? Pushes away shadows. A pink flush flooded her cheeks, and her grip tightened on his hand. Then she gave him a shy look from beneath her strawberry blonde lashes that always made him smile. He wasn't lying. The warmth she gave off while she was happy affected everyone around her, lifting their spirits as well. It wasn't magic or any mystical bullshit. It was simply the natural reaction of being around a genuinely good, sweet person. A rare commodity in this evil world. She looked away, but not before he saw a pleased smile curve her pink lips. Thank you. Are you sure Dimitri won't mind? Stay, came Dimitri's muffled shout, and Alex looked over to see Dimitri eating right from the pot. Food is good. He sighed and led Jessica into the living room, not releasing her hand even as Dimitri gave him a pointed look, then grinned when Alex sat on the couch with Jessica at his side. She fidgeted for a moment, gently trying to extract her hand, but he wasn't letting her go. With his thumb stroking her palm, he shook his head at his brother. Speaking quickly in Russian, Alex said, Jessica knows nothing about the Bratva or Peters gang. She thinks he is a politician and that I'm a professional bodyguard from Belarus. Dimitri's words came out garbled as he continued to shove the food into his mouth. Understood. Are you sure she hasn't figured out Peter? She works at his headquarters, right? Jessica was raised in a small town in America, an idyllic place where people do not lock their doors at night and everyone knows everyone. It would never occur to her to even suspect something like that, and Peter has made it well known what will happen if someone were to tell her. How long do you plan on hiding this? His gut churned. He knew about the hard decisions he would eventually have to make. He was sure Jessica would feel betrayed by his keeping it from her, but the less she knew, the safer she would be. Someday, he would tell her the whole truth, but he hoped to have her so in love and happy with him by then that she wouldn't leave him. I do not want our world to touch hers yet. Dimitri's gaze went to Jessica's hand entwined with Alex's. You know she will find out eventually. Would be best if you are honest with her if you truly want a future with this girl. Be honest, and tell her what? That they've killed dozens of men. That I run drugs, guns, and just about everything else illegal for a criminal organization. That her uncle, who she loves, is equally corrupt. How exactly would I do that without destroying any chance with her? Instead of being upset, Dimitri shrugged. Don't ask me. I only fuck whores. I don't have to explain myself to them. Look, you haven't even slept with her yet. Maybe she is terrible in bed or will only do vanilla sex. I say fuck her. Find out if she can handle our lifestyle and, if she can, marry her. And have a dozen babies. It is more complicated than that. Dimitri set his empty plate down with a sigh. Then don't fuck her. Either way, stop whining like a little bitch about it and do something. Fuck you. Grinning, Dimitri switched to English. Sweet Jessica, you like vodka? Five hours later, Alex had a very drunk Jessica sitting next to him, fucking gossiping with his little brother about sex. She was talking to Dimitri like they'd been friends for years, laughing over the same crude humor turning a normally dour and depressing evening into something else entirely. 
She giggled into her cupped hands, her sparkling blue eyes meeting his as Dimitri told her about the time he'd been caught by a girl's father sneaking out of her bedroom when he was sixteen. Normally he would have been laughing as well, but his mind was still stuck on Jessica describing the time she got caught skinny-dipping with her high school boyfriend in his pool by his parents. Jessica slumped against him as she fell back, laughing so hard tears were trailing down her face while Dimitri told an elaborate story about trying to run and put his pants on at the same time while an angry father chased him with a butcher knife, threatening to unman him. He loved seeing her like this, happy and full of life. Being around her made him happy, and not only him, but his men as well. They all enjoyed spending time with the bright and kind young woman. Her silken hair brushed over the edge of his chin, sending a tingle along his body. Tell me, Jessica, Dimitri said with a leer, what is the wildest thing you have ever done? All Alex's efforts to remain unaffected were blown to smithereens when Jessica confessed to having made out heavily with a girl. She'd whispered a short story about the girls being drunk together after a concert, how she danced with her friend and then made out with her while they were dancing with everyone at the party watching them and cheering them on. Dimitri's eyes were so wide it was comical, and Jessica's gleeful snort of laughter made Alex grin even as his dick ached. You should see your face. Jessica heaved in a breath, but remained relaxed against him. I thought there was no way I could shock you. Chuckling, Alex couldn't stop himself from smoothing his fingers over her cheek on the pretense of tucking her hair behind her ear. It is because you are so innocent looking. Dimitri cleared his throat and gave Alex a pointed look. You like people watching you. Her slight weight pressed into Alex as she rested against him. I do. Not like all the time or anything super crazy, but knowing that someone is getting off on what I'm doing, it's hot. Is hot, Dimitri agreed with a shit-eating grin thrown at Alex. His younger brother was a voyeur and loved to watch people fuck, and he knew Alex was both a voyeur and an exhibitionist. Very hot. I did not know American women were so... Kinky? Is the right word? Yeah, kinky is the right word. She snorted a laugh again while Alex grappled with his intense fantasies of fucking her at his home BDSM club in Moscow. I don't know how things are where you're from, but most of my friends aren't as hung up on sex as our parents. And we don't slut-shame each other. Slut-shame? Yeah, how if a guy is a one-night stand, it's okay, but if a girl does, she's a slut. I don't believe in that shit. If you're both consenting adults, get your freak on. That said, I can't abide cheating, ever. If a guy bullshits the girl and tells her that if she has sex with him, it'll be with the intent of forming a relationship? She rubbed her eyes and yawned. Then he's a man whore, and I can't stand men like that. I would never, ever cheat on a man, and I expect the same from him. Dimitri looked up at Alex, winked, and said in Russian, You lucky, lucky son of a bitch. If you don't want her, I'll marry her tomorrow. Sweet, kinky, loyal, and she can cook. A sour tang of unusual jealousy made Alex's gut clench, and he slipped a possessive arm around Jessica before responding back in Russian. Stay away from her. Instead of cowering from Alex's anger as most men would, Dimitri wiggled his eyebrows. Ah, oh, come on, you heard her. One of her fantasies is two men at once, and another couple. Imagine watching Jessica eat another woman's pussy while you fuck her. Like I said, you lucky son of a bitch. Shaking his head, Alex couldn't help but laugh even as he wanted to yell at his brother to stop thinking about Jessica like that. Dimitri was too charming for his own good, but Alex liked to see his brother happy like this, especially tonight. What was normally an evening spent drinking until they passed out had instead become one of the best nights Alex could remember having in a long time. Jessica turned in his arms, then glanced up at him and smiled, her beauty devouring his heart. She reached up and traced his lips with her fingertip, 
the velvety rasp of her skin against his lips making his cock throb. When her eyes crinkled as she giggled over something, he sighed, knowing she was going to feel like shit in the morning. Funny that it was usually him and Dimitri who passed out drunk on this grim anniversary. Instead, for the first time in many years, they were a little buzzed, but not smashed into an alcohol-fueled oblivion. Alex? Jessica murmured while petting his goatee. Did you know when you talk in Russian, it makes me wet? Dimitri choked on his scotch. Alex blinked down at her, wondering what the hell he was getting himself into. My voice makes your pussy wet. She nodded slowly, her eyelids growing heavy. With a sleepy grumble, she moved until she was curled up in his lap, her body resting heavily enough against his that he realized she would pass out soon. Then she nuzzled her face against his throat, her nose and lips brushing his skin and leaving a burning path of sparks everywhere they touched. You smell so good. I want to rub myself all over you so I can smell you on me. His skin beneath her lips grew sensitive, and the heat of her breath tested the limits of his self-control. Her husky voice was the distilled essence of debauchery as she whispered, Want to know a secret? Duh. I mean, yes. I think you're the most amazing man I've ever met, and I want you so damn bad. Dream about you constantly. But you don't want me, and that sucks. His heart gave an odd thump, and his chest actually hurt. Knowing she probably wouldn't remember their conversation tomorrow, he brushed her hair back from her face. Her smile was beautiful, but sleepy as she beamed at him. I tell you, secret. I do want you. All too aware of Dimitri watching them closely, his expression unexpectedly grave, Alex had to keep his gaze on Jessica as she blinked slowly up at him. Then why don't you take me? Princess Samoya, you deserve better than me. But I don't want better. I want you. I cannot have you. But don't you understand? You could if you wanted me as badly as I want you. I'd be so happy to be your girlfriend, Alex. Even though I know you don't do girlfriends, only fuck buddies. Her voice slurred as she weakly thumped him on the shoulder. Hell, I'd be happy just to be your fuck buddy. You'd be my own personal sex toy. Ignoring Dimitri's laughter, he shook his head. You are drunk. Would not be right. She leaned up and gave him a somewhat sloppy kiss on the cheek. See? Always an excuse. If you really wanted me, you wouldn't let anything stop you. Alex placed a long kiss on Jessica's forehead, relishing the feel of her in his arms. He pulled back, and she smiled, her lips eventually softening into a lush pink bow. Her eyes closed, and she rubbed her cheek against his chest like an affectionate cat. Staring at her plump lips, he imagined how they would feel against his. He wondered how she would kiss, what she would like, and how she tasted. Dimitri gave a sarcastic sigh. You are screwed. What? Alex whispered, not wanting to wake Jessica. She was so cuddled into him there wasn't a part of her body that wasn't pressed against his. The urge to sleep with her gripped him, and he gritted his teeth. That could potentially be very bad, but he was finding it hard to give a shit about what he shouldn't do anymore especially when she was begging for him and he wanted to give in to her so badly. The need to take her had almost overwhelmed him, but he was not sure he could keep her safe yet. The Novikov curse had ravaged his family for two generations, and it would take more than a few weeks to make sure the curse would never touch Jessica. Then again, he and Dimitri had made great strides with the Bolden family, agreeing to leave each other's women alone despite their shared bloody past. Hell, the head of the Bolden Bratva had two daughters and a wife. Why shouldn't he and Dimitri have the same chance at happiness? Having her in his arms, sleeping against him, had to be one of the best feelings he'd ever experienced. He could only imagine how wonderful it would feel to have it every night for the rest of his life.
He was turned from his deep thoughts by Jessica snoring lightly. The sound was so dainty that it made him laugh. She even snores cute. Dimitri raised a brow as Alex stood with Jessica cradled against him. I am taking her to bed. To her apartment? He didn't hesitate when he said, No, to my room. Giving him a shit-eating grin, Dimitri sat back and tilted his chin up. Lucky bastard. Alex resisted the urge to roll his eyes before he started back to his room with Jessica held against him. He honestly didn't want to touch her when she was this drunk. First, because he didn't want her to use alcohol as an excuse to push him away. Second, because he wanted her in the right frame of mind when he told her how things were going to be from now on. Third, because he would never want to have sex for the first time with a wasted woman. Not that he had any problem screwing a woman when she was really drunk. If that's what she liked, he was more than happy to oblige. Drunk sex was fun, but not when they hadn't spoken of it sober and made plans. He nudged the door open, then turned on the light switch with his elbow. The dim room was illuminated by golden sconces, giving the cozy space a warm glow, and the hunter green accents complemented the dark wood of his dresser and massive bed. As he lowered her to the bed, he couldn't help but notice the freckles on the bridge of her nose and dusting the tops of her high cheekbones. He could have stood there and watched her forever, but he forced himself to move away and close the thick white velvet curtains. After using the bathroom, he came back out with a wet washcloth and placed it on the back of Jessica's neck, waking her up. He dodged her attempts to smack him away. Can you use bathroom on own, or do you need me to help you? She muttered something, then pushed off the bed and staggered into the bathroom. Evidently, she was awake enough to take care of business and wash up, because when she zigzagged back to bed, she flopped onto his pillow and mumbled. Used your toothbrush. Don't have cooties. Need water. Laughing to himself, he did as she asked and added a couple ibuprofen to the mix. He helped her sit up enough to drink. She pushed him back when he was done. Close your eyes. What? She didn't wait for him to comply, instead falling on her back while clumsily kicking off her shoes, sending them sailing across the room, one almost hitting him in the head. Before he knew it, she'd slipped out of her khakis, leaving him staring at her tiny, pale yellow panties. They looked like cotton and had pink bows at the hips. He'd seen far sexier underwear in his life, but damned if his dick wasn't twitching at the erotic temptation of the high-cut panties against her creamy skin. A moment later, she started fidgeting, then managed to take her bra off without removing her shirt. Once this was done, she let out a long sigh and curled up on his bed, her long legs spread out, revealing the slit of her pussy covered by yellow cotton fabric. She grabbed a pillow and cuddled it close, frowning in irritation as she tried unsuccessfully to reach the comforter to pull it up. With a sigh, he lifted the thick down comforter over her, then smoothed her hair back from her face. She captivated him, and he looked forward to spending many hours just watching her. The complex feelings he had for her were sometimes so intense he was afraid to give them a name. One thing was certain. She would soon be his, and only his. Every delicate inch of her. He fought his arousal at the thought of owning her in every way, of her wearing his collar and his ring, even as he scolded himself for moving too fast. Shit. It was those sweet cotton panties. They killed him, made him want to defile her in the worst way. His dick, not used to being denied a woman's touch for so long, twitched at the thought of sucking her arousal from the crotch of her panties. Shit. After turning off the lights and making sure his gun was easily accessible but not easily seen, he changed into a pair of sleep pants and got into his bed with a smile. She rolled closer to him, gravity pulling her body against his. Once she pressed against him, he almost held his breath, unsure for once of what he should do. 
If she was any other woman, he'd be fucking her by now, but Jessica's trust was something he would cherish, not violate. He rolled onto his back and moved her so that her head was resting on his chest, her long, smooth legs tangling with his. Her fresh scent teased him, and his cock was so hard it ached, but he did nothing to relieve himself. Life had given him enough experience to appreciate Jessica, to savor her as he taught her about all the pleasures the world had to offer. He liked taking care of her like this, a lot. It satisfied some urge he'd never had before, some basic need to protect and provide for this young woman. He kept far enough away that they had space between them, but he couldn't resist repeatedly running his fingers through her hair. Satisfaction filled him, along with a faint sense of foreboding as he thought about the dangerous world into which he was going to bring her. He must have fallen asleep, because he was slowly awakened by the feeling of a woman's lips brushing against his own, and a warm, soft body wrapped around his tall frame. His mind drifted as his lips parted, and he returned her kiss, the taste of her sizzling along his nerves, lighting him up from within. Plush and full, her lips pillowed his, and he groaned softly, the sensation of her legs rubbing over his, making his dick harden. She was practically panting with desire, so aroused that he wondered how long she'd been seducing him awake. Whoever this woman was, she really knew how to kiss. He cupped her tight ass and pulled her groin against his, gasping into her mouth when she threw her leg over his hip, opening her core to him. The moment her pussy rubbed against his cloth-covered cock, he growled again, the desire to be inside of this woman driving him mad. She moaned deeply when he flexed his hips against her, rubbing his long shaft over her mound. Alex. She whispered against his mouth. You feel so good. Her voice triggered the memory of an exquisitely beautiful face, and he broke their kiss, his body trembling with the need to take her, to fuck her, to pound her so hard she would never be the same. Jessica, tochtoiti delayesh sumnoi. Oh, shit. She shuddered and ground harder over his dick, the scent of her need filling his nostrils. I swear you could make me come just by talking. We should not be doing. He's not right. All of his good intentions went right out the window when she grabbed his hand, then shoved it down the front of her panties. Feel how wet I am for you? As if he had no control over his own body, his fingers stroked down over the soft curls covering her mound to her shaved pussy lips, which were glazed with her need. And puffy. Shit, she had one of his favorite kinds of pussy. Thick outer lips that begged to hug his cock as he fucked her. He could just imagine sliding his dick into her like he was sliding his finger in. Tight. Blissfully tight. It didn't help that he could now smell her arousal, the musk calling to him and inviting him to take a taste of her need. To lick her where she was sweet and wet. Her sheath squeezed his finger while she moaned, and he swore he ejaculated a little bit. She had a very strong cunt, the kind that would wring his cum out in bone-wrenching sucks. A deep shudder racked his spine, making his balls tingle before his cock throbbed even harder. Just the friction of her body against his made him crazy with the need to fuck her. Sliding his finger in and out, he let her pull him down to kiss him again, her tongue stroking against his as the bedsheets rustled with their movements. He couldn't believe he was actually touching Jessica, had his finger inside of the slickest, tightest pussy he'd ever had the pleasure of playing with. With his thumb, he quickly found her clit, erect and poking out, easy to caress and manipulate. She must have been sensitive because he had to use a light touch to keep her from flinching away. It took skill to get a woman like Jessica off, and he loved how she responded to his delicate strokes. She kissed her way over his jaw to his ear, lightly sucking on the lobe as she whispered, Why won't you touch me like this when I'm awake? I need you. Please fuck me. He froze, 
a little mule of need coming from her as she rocked her hips against his hand, obviously close to orgasm. I will not have sex with you tonight. She sighed in obvious disappointment, but didn't stop riding his fingers. You never do, not even in my dreams. He couldn't leave her like this, couldn't let her return to her dreams filled with frustration. I will take care of you, Princess Moya. Take off your panties and spread your legs for your master. She responded instantly and stripped, then leaned back, her legs going wide and her hips going up, moving against his hand when he resumed touching her. There was something about her that was shameless, unapologetic as she rode his fingers, grasping at him with her tight cunt. She was confident about her desires, and he wondered how far he could push her boundaries, how far she'd want him to push. Who knew that beneath her sweet exterior lay a dirty little sex vixen? The things he could show her, sins so sweet they were worth going to hell over. Her voice was rough when she spoke. I'm getting close. Can you feel it? He could feel it, could even see it by the tremble in her thighs. Knowing he was going to make her orgasm hard sent a surge of strong male pride through him. It made him feel powerful and in control, two things he craved. He leaned down and gently licked her clit, groaning deep in his throat. Titakaya Krasivaya The bed creaked as he sucked her swollen bud gently, softly, and her back arched when she screamed his name. Alex! He nearly ripped down his sleep pants as he began to stroke his cock. His spine tingled as a hard and fast orgasm rushed through him. Holy mother of God, she turned him on so much that feeling her come apart beneath him was enough to get him off. Coming into his fist, he groaned and plunged his tongue into her along with the fingers of his other hand. The taste of her filled him as he eased her down from her orgasm, eventually removing his fingers while she moaned low and deep. After rolling away from her, he staggered out of bed on weak legs and got a towel, then washed up, his whole body humming with pleasure. He returned to the bed with a clean washcloth and a towel, then cleaned her gently while she sighed. He studied her face in the faint light coming through the windows, loving the mysterious smile that curved her lips while she relaxed into his touch. He laid a towel over the damp spot on the sheets, then retrieved her panties, and helped her slip them back on. Her sleepy smile was adorable, and he stole another kiss from her delicious lips. When she reached up to gently caress his cheek, an unfamiliar pain raced through him. He laid back and pulled her onto his chest again, their combined musk filling the room. His whole body rioted with sensations he'd never experienced before, an intense emotion growing in him that threatened to overwhelm him. It took him a moment to realize that, among other things, he was happy, truly content in a way he'd never experienced before. She shifted until her head was beside his, then settled and became an enjoyable weight on him. He pressed his face into her hair, inhaling the mingled scents of apples, and Jessica mixed with him. A warm buzz filled his body, and a bliss he'd never experienced before lightened his heart, until he was grinning to himself in the darkness. This night had changed everything, but he couldn't bring himself to care. Whatever he had to go through to keep Jessica at his side was worth it a thousand times over if he could have the pleasure of falling asleep with her in his arms, curled trustingly into his body, while her taste lingered on his tongue. Chapter 8 Jessica was so warm and comfortable, even if her mouth was as dry as a desert. Floating, her mind drifted in serenity, a deep relaxation tempting her to go back to sleep. But there was something odd teasing at the edges of her mind. She lay there for a few moments, her brain slowly waking up as she realized someone was spooning her, someone with a strong body that smelled wonderful, a heady mixture of citrus and sandalwood that made her feel safe. His breath warmed the top of her head as he slept deeply behind her, his body completely relaxed against hers. Whoever he was, he must be massive because he dwarfed her, 
and she was tall for a girl. Crisp chest hair brushed her back. Then facial hair tickled the side of her neck as he nuzzled closer in his sleep. The pieces of the puzzle all clicked together, and when she realized who the man holding her so tenderly was, she tensed, and panic made her heart thump hard as she opened her eyes. Sure enough, she was in Alex's bedroom. Shit. What was she doing in Alex's room? And where were her pants? A quick scan of her body reassured her that she still wore her panties and shirt, but her pants and bra were definitely missing. When she shifted her legs slightly, trying desperately not to wake Alex, she was relieved to feel that he wore what felt like soft sleep pants, but the hairy arm around her was bare as was the warm furry chest behind her. One of her favorite daydreams lately was to imagine Alex nude, or at least shirtless, but now that he actually was, she was afraid to move, let alone breathe. That didn't stop a tingle of excitement tightening her belly at the thought of a half-naked Alex holding her, but she forced her hormones to calm the hell down as she tried to think. How did she get here? Concentrating, she tried to remember everything she could about the previous night. In spite of the evening's somber nature, Dimitri broke out the vodka after dinner and proceeded to teach her how to drink it properly. That was when her recollections became blurry, before fading completely. She knew they'd laughed, a lot. She remembered at one point Dimitri and Alex had thrown their arms around each other while they bellowed out some songs in Russian, and she could remember sitting between them, almost cuddling them, as they told her amusing stories about each other. Then another memory came as clear as day, and she fervently wished she could die of embarrassment to save herself the future humiliation of having to look Alex and Dimitri in the eye. At some point, they'd started talking about sex, and Jessica, being completely wasted, was pretty sure she'd let it all hang out. And there was a lot to hang out. Keisha, Jessica's best friend back home, had a cool mom who had hundreds of romance novels lining the bookshelves of her house. When she and Keisha were teenagers, they would borrow from her mom's library. They read all about the steamy adventures of amazing men and women doing some rather kinky things and giggled over the sex parts. She'd only had one serious boyfriend in high school, but she'd given him her virginity, and afterwards they'd gone at it like rabbits. Then there were her sexual escapades in college and on spring break. Oh, God, had she told them about having sex in the ocean off of Cancun with that hot Brazilian guy? An image of Dimitri staring at her in shock flitted through her aching brain, and she stifled a groan. Double crap. If she'd shocked Dimitri, then whatever she said must have been bad. They probably thought she was some kind of mega skank now the kind of woman that would sleep with men while not wearing pants or a bra. The soft flesh between her legs felt sensitive, and she bit her lip, trying to remember if she'd done anything with Alex. Her fragmented dream came to mind, but she had dirty dreams about Alex almost every night. In this dream, as in the others, he wouldn't fuck her, but he did make her orgasm. Hard. Her nipples tightened almost uncomfortably fast and she shifted against Alex. God, he was so strong, so warm. He moved and pressed his groin into her bottom, cuddling her so close that she felt enveloped by him. If only he would hold her like this when they were awake. The sheets were warm by their bodies, and the wonderful heat had seeped into her bones on this chilly December morning. The sun was already up, and she closed her eyes, taking in a deep breath and trying to commit the memory of being in Alex's bed to mind, since it was probably never going to happen again. The urgent need to use the bathroom battled with her desire to stay still and not wake Alex, but her bladder won out eventually. Moving as carefully as possible, she tried to ease out of Alex's arms, but he tugged her back against him. Ostavatsia, he murmured against the top of her head. She pushed against his steely arm, trying to ignore how silky his skin felt stretched tight over his impressive muscles. I have to use the bathroom. He grumbled but released her. 
The moment she was out of his arms, she gathered up her pants from the floor next to the bed, but she couldn't find her bra. Not daring to stay any longer, and certainly not daring to look at Alex, she darted out into the hallway, then shoved her legs into her pants. Her shoes were around here somewhere, but thankfully the key to her apartment was still in the pocket of her khakis. Moving as quietly as possible, she crept across the bare wood floors of the apartment, squinting at the glare of the bright sunlight streaming through the windows and burning her eyes. When a man's deep voice came from somewhere to her left, she let out a little squeak of surprise and flinched. You have no goodbye for me, sweet Jessica. She turned to find a shirtless Dimitri lounging on the couch, with his laptop and a cup of tea steaming on the coffee table. Both Gorev brothers had lucked out in the genetic lottery because his wide chest was almost as impressive as Alex's, and probably would be once Dimitri had fully grown into the man he would someday be. His knowing grin heated her face, and she hated how easily she blushed. He was dressed in a pair of deep brown trousers and scratched leisurely at his chest. That movement drew her gaze to the eight-pointed star tattoos on either of his shoulders. Dimitri still held traces of the teenage boy he'd been not too long ago, his body not as bulky as his brother, but Dimitri was quicker to smile. She met his smirking gaze, then quickly looked away. Keeping her voice low, she moved closer to the couch, with her eyes focused on the table. That's right. You're leaving today for Paris. I will be back next week, and we spend time together, yes? Uh, sure. She started to inch towards the door, wanting to make her get away. It was nice meeting you, Dimitri. Stop. His tone was so authoritative she froze in place. Come here. Chewing her lip, wishing she just made a run for it, instead of stopping to be polite, she moved closer to the couch, extremely uncomfortable. Yes? Why do you sneak? What? You move quiet. Like mouse. I, uh, didn't want to wake up Alex. The lie was so bold that it practically screamed in her every word, and Dimitri must have picked up on it because he frowned. Why will you not meet eyes? He appeared genuinely upset, and she winced. I'm sorry, I don't usually get that drunk. Ah, you are embarrassed. No need. Right, so I'll just be going now. Wait. Once again, she froze in place. Dimitri, I have to work, so I need to do some stuff. My memory of last night is not so good. Yes? Too much vodka. She was sure Dimitri was going to tease her. He'd done it a lot last night, so his understanding eased her embarrassment a bit. Yeah, way too much vodka. I need to thank you. For what? He studied her for a long moment, the amusement draining from his gaze and leaving behind a young man with eyes too old for his face. My brother is hard man, filled with much responsibility. Has been a long time since I see him laugh like he laugh with you. Is nice to see him happy. You are good friend. He likes you very much. And so do I. That damn blush came back, and she tried to hide her smile. Thanks. The sound of movement came from Alex's room, and she darted for the foyer, throwing a quick travel safe to Dimitri before she ran out the door and into her apartment. After she shut the door and locked it, she sprinted to her bathroom and took care of her full to bursting bladder. Then she dragged herself into the kitchen and took some aspirin before grabbing a muffin and eating half of it in an effort to ease her hangover. The light on her phone was blinking, so she listened to a message from one of her aunts back in the States, then another from one of her friends back home. The last message was from John, reminding her that they had a date tonight and to dress warm. Guilt raced through her as she thought about the fact that she woke up in one man's arms and would be going out with another guy tonight. Not that she'd done anything sexual with Alex. At least she didn't think she had. She knew Alex well enough to know that he wasn't the kind of guy to take advantage of a drunk girl, and she was also well too aware that she wasn't his type. 
The thought that maybe her dream wasn't a dream was too much to bear, and she shook her head, trying to block it out even as the motion made her brain hurt. With a groan, she stumbled into her bedroom, then headed for the shower, wondering if she'd thrown herself at him. The lack of bra and pants indicated that she might have tried, or she'd just taken them off, because she usually slept in panties and an old oversized t-shirt. God, what if she'd been so drunk she'd stripped in front of Alex? The hot water was doing wonders for her headache, but it did nothing to wash away the mortification filling her. A vague mental image of her kissing Alex, sucking on his tongue, in the soft darkness of his bedroom began to form, but she quickly banished the thought. Last night, for the first time in a long time, she'd allowed herself to completely relax and let loose. Hell, the last time she'd gotten drunk that hadn't involved a pity party of her being homesick was back in college in Iowa. Oh, she'd gotten tipsy a time or two at one of her Uncle Pat's parties and while sharing a bottle of wine with her Aunt Mary, but not shit-faced, blacked out, smashed. It was all Dimitri's fault. That man was a bad influence in the best of ways, and with every shot she'd done with him, she relaxed more and more until it felt like she was hanging out with old friends. Despite the dark nature of the previous night, both men had gone out of their way to include her in conversations, to put her at ease and make her feel welcome. Actually, they made her feel more than welcome. They made her feel safe. Dimitri had proven to be very funny with a dry wit, and his obvious, over-the-top flirting pissed Alex off, which Jessica found amusing and kind of sweet. Truth be told, she enjoyed Alex's jealous reaction, or what her drunken mind had told her was him being jealous. Telling off, she brushed her teeth and studied her pink-cheeked face. She could always ask Alex if she'd gotten horny and tried to hump his leg, but she'd rather jump off Haypenny Bridge than talk about what a loser she was. He'd made it more than clear that he viewed her as a friend, and she was sure his hand-holding last night had been more for comfort than romance. Hell, she'd done everything but strip naked and spread her legs for him when he'd been there for her on the anniversary of her adopted mother's passing, and he flat out wasn't interested. He obviously had a type, and unsophisticated, skinny redheads wasn't it. When she met her bloodshot gaze in the mirror, she didn't like the sadness and defeat she saw there. She wasn't the kind of woman who enjoyed mind games, and she certainly didn't want to waste her time with a man who would never return her affection as anything other than friendship. Yes, Alex was an amazing man, probably an amazing lover and he made her feel more alive than she'd felt in a long time. But she was lonely. She wanted someone who would see her as a woman, someone she could fall in love with, and maybe start to build something long-term. She wanted the kind of marriage her parents had, rather than the constant heartache of wondering who Alex was fucking when he wasn't with her. Really, she needed to pull her tattered self-respect together and forget Alexander Gorev. Giving herself a stern glare before she turned from the mirror to grab her hair dryer, she vowed that she wouldn't think about Alex tonight. She'd go out with John, enjoy Dublin, enjoy being alive and young, and maybe start to fall in love. Those thoughts fragmented when she picked up her clothes and caught a whiff of her handsome bodyguard's unique citrus and sandalwood scent. She held up her shirt and buried her nose in the cloth, her heart aching as she tried to convince herself that she didn't want Alex anymore. Seven hours later, Jessica stepped back from the mirror and took a critical look at herself. The makeup managed to hide most of the dark circles under her eyes, and the blush added some color to her pale cheeks. All day, she'd swung between the need to go over to Alex's place and pretend nothing was wrong like any mature, urbane woman would and wanting to do everything she could to avoid ever seeing him again. Mox had stopped by earlier to see if she would like to go get some coffee, and was concerned by her appearance. She begged off, saying she was really hungover. He obviously didn't believe her, 
and she had to practically shut the door in his face when he tried to come in so he could make her soup. When he asked her if Alex knew she was sick, she pretended that she was going to throw up in order to avoid talking about it. She was such a coward. Tugging at the edge of her black silk tunic shirt with its boat neck collar, she turned this way and that in the mirror, making sure her dark green leggings fit perfectly where they disappeared into her black, calf-high boots. She'd curled her hair so it fell in ringlets down her back, and she wore the small diamond studs her parents had given her for her high school graduation. The outfit flattered her lean frame, but once again, she wished God had been a little more generous in the tits and ass department. Maybe she should look into some padded underwear that would at least give her the illusion of having hips instead of looking like a 12-year-old boy. Or some of those bras that had built-in supports. Then again, nothing would be more humiliating than getting naked with a man for the first time, only to have him wonder where the hell all her curves went or copping a feel and getting a handful of foam padding. With a sigh, she went out into her living room, trying to psych herself up about the night. John was a nice, good-looking guy, and he was really into her. If she was back home, her girlfriends would be over right now, helping her get ready for her date and giggling with her. Instead, she was alone, and a wave of homesickness swamped her. She had just picked her purse up from the couch to call her best friend Keisha when there was a knock on the front door. Taking a peek through the peephole, she was glad to see it was John, looking as handsome as ever in his leather jacket, now paired with a dark wool flat cap that brought out the golden tones in his brown hair. He held a bouquet of pink roses in his arms, and that terrible hollowness of being homesick eased a little bit as she opened the door. His dark eyes lit up at the sight of her, and his smile was genuine. Jessica, you look amazing. Here, those are for you. I wasn't sure what kind of flowers you liked, but my mom said you can't go wrong with roses. She took the flowers, inhaling their slightly spicy scent with a smile. These are lovely, thank you. Come on in and let me put them in some water. After she cut the stems... She arranged the roses in a crystal vase. John wandered around her small living room, studying the pictures above her mantel. Inside of her cozy apartment, he seemed bigger than she remembered, and she watched him as he stopped before a large silver-framed picture. This your mom and da? She placed the roses on the small coffee table and moved to his side where he looked at a picture of her parents, standing in front of their barn, with Jessica sitting proudly on her first horse. It had been a beautiful summer day, and the land stretching out into the horizon behind them were full of vibrant green corn stalks. For a moment, she could almost smell the fresh scent of the fields on a late summer evening, and her throat tightened. Her dad, a strong, tall man with dark hair and an easy smile, held her Palomino's horse's reins while her petite, blonde mother was snuggled into his side. It was her seventh birthday that day. She was wearing her best party dress and a purple plastic princess crown. A grin from ear to ear revealed that she was missing her two front teeth. For a moment, the memory of her father's rich cologne filled her, and she ached to feel his strong arms around her, always ready to give her a hug. Her parents adored her, and the feeling was entirely mutual. God, she missed them. Yes, these are my parents. She traced her fingers lightly over the glass, blinking back tears. He glanced down at her, then put the picture back after making a small, distressed sound. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to make you sad. She touched her fingers to her lips, then to the glass. It's okay. I just miss them. Kind of sneaks up on me every once in a while that they're gone. John gently stroked her cheek and gave her a kind smile. Whenever my sister is sad, she demands large quantities of chocolate. Let's get going, and we can grab some hot chocolate from a place I know along the way. Then we'll head over for the tree lighting. His obvious efforts to make her feel better did help, so she tried to shove her personal shit aside and enjoy her first date in almost a year. Deal. 
Jessica stood outside of her apartment door in the communal hallway at some time after midnight, laughing quietly as John teased her. She'd had a great time walking the streets of Dublin with him and some of his friends, feeling normal for the first time in a long time. Dublin certainly had a different vibe than back home, but she was beginning to get used to the urban atmosphere. Plus, being around people her own age was something she'd been missing. Oleg, Mox, and Alex were all fascinating in their own way, and they made her laugh. But there was a seriousness to them that never really left. John and his friends were the opposite. Carefree, fun-loving, immature in the way only college boys could be. And it was really nice to hang out with their girlfriends and talk about normal girl stuff. She'd even agreed to meet up with a few of them next week to go shopping, another activity she missed. Oh, she went with her Aunt Mary and had a great time, but it was different than having girlfriends to laugh with. Her cheeks hurt from smiling so much and from drinking a few too many beers as she smacked John on the arm. I did not make that face. Yes, you did. I thought your eyes were going to pop out of your head. I can't believe they were having sex right there in the alley. A frisson of heat went through her, and she resisted the urge to press her thighs together. The sight of the couple, the woman facing the brick wall, her hands braced and legs spread, with her skirt lifted over her pale hips while her man thrust into her, made Jessica incredibly aroused. With harsh thrusts of his hips, the man had fucked that mystery woman hard enough that she gave a helpless whimper every time he buried himself deep. Even though Jessica had only gotten a glimpse in the dim lighting, watching them made her pussy wet and her nipples as hard as diamonds. She didn't know what it was about public sex and the idea of being seen and caught, but something about it had always been one of her favorite fantasies. She'd only done something like that once, well, twice, if she counted having sex in the ocean. But it had been one of the best sexual experiences of her life. Last year, she'd been at a Halloween party off campus with her roommates and had gotten way too drunk and hooked up with a really cute guy dressed up like a pirate. They'd gone at it hot and heavy. Her costume disguised her, giving her the drunken courage to have sex with him in a place that was isolated, but where other people could see. They'd been alone on the balcony, and she knew that there were a couple guys below watching them and cheering them on. Knowing those strangers were getting turned on by looking at her led to some really good orgasms. Of course, the next day, she was totally embarrassed, but the memory was still one of her favorite masturbation fantasies. John stepped closer, and she was all too aware of how his brown eyes had darkened further. His laughter faded and the tension grew between them. The scent of the beer he'd had and his woodsy cologne reached her, and she knew he was going to kiss her. She darted a glance at Alex's door, and a pang of stupid guilt went through her, like she was somehow cheating on him, even though they didn't have a sexual or romantic relationship in any way. Then again, she woke up in his bed this morning with his body wrapped around hers. And that dream... So intense it almost felt real. Jessica. John spoke softly, drawing her gaze from Alex's door and back to him. I had a really good time with you tonight. Me too, she replied with a small smile. She was determined to live in the moment and told her misplaced guilt to take a hike. He stroked his hand along her jaw, then cupped her neck, gently tilting her head up with his thumb. She didn't resist his touch and when he brushed his lips over hers, a warm tingle rushed through her. Pulling back a bit, he studied her face. Whatever he saw there seemed to reassure him, because he went back for a second kiss, this one much deeper. His tongue brushed over her lips, and she opened for him, sliding her arms up over his broad shoulders, tasting the lingering bitterness of the dark stout he drank earlier in the night, losing herself in his touch. He was a good kisser, gentle and seductive, slowly building her arousal until she was kissing him back while he pressed her against her door. 
he began to inch his other hand up the front of her skirt, his obvious destination, her breast, even as she raised her hand to halt his progress. She heard the sound of a door opening and pulled away. Her heart sank when Alex stood framed in the doorway of his apartment, his face a mask of cold fury. He was carrying a large, oddly long suitcase and wore a dark wool coat over a black suit that fit him perfectly. As always, he looked good enough to eat. But oh man, she'd never seen him so angry before. And she found herself pressing up against her door in an effort to put more distance between them. Mox followed Alex out, and they both glared at John, who still had his arm wrapped around her waist. All the arousal she felt for John vanished, replaced by shame, when Alex's gaze moved to her. She felt like she should apologize to him, but she'd never seen him so pissed off, and it scared her. His ire filled the small space of the hallway like an electrical storm, and John moved into a protective stance in front of her. Keeping a firm grip on her, John lifted his chin. Alex? Max? Mox lifted his chin back, but Alex's jaw clenched as though he was grinding his teeth. I thought you were better, Jessica. What? His burning gaze came to her, and she shrank back. Letting this dull boy grope you like a common whore. I thought you had more class. Not to go from one man's bed straight to another's. She gasped, his words a slap in her face. John started to say something, his tone aggressive, but she cut him off. I can't believe you just said that. Is truth. John growled something in Gaelic that didn't sound complimentary, but Jessica yelled at the glowering Russian man first. Who the fuck do you think you are, Alex Gorev? You, you of all people are going to try and pull a morality card on me? Are you for fucking real? Mox stepped in between them. Enough. Oh, no, Mox. It isn't enough. I don't know what fucking planet you live on, Alex, but you don't get any say in who I kiss and where. Her voice broke. I can't believe you just called me a whore. I thought you were my friend. You sleep with me last night. Now you kissing other men is actions of whore. Alex! Mox snapped in a disapproving voice, but her temper flared to life. John gave her a hard look, and she felt the need to defend herself. I passed out drunk with his brother there. We didn't do anything. Alex blinked at her, his gaze clearing for a moment, before John tried to step in front of her again. You do not remember. Remember what? Her cheeks burned as she recalled her dream that may not have been a dream. I was passed out, wasted. I don't remember anything. John looked down at her. You got drunk with him last night? Him and his brother, but nothing happened. I didn't know you were such a good liar, Jessica. Alex growled out. You know exactly what happened. How you woke me with your kisses, begged me to pleasure you. Shut up! She whirled to face Alex full on, meeting his furious gaze with one of her own. Her temper was blazing, white hot, and without even thinking, she closed the distance between them and pushed her hands into his chest and shoved, surprising him enough that he went back a step. God, why are you being such an asshole? What is wrong with you? Why can't you just leave me alone? Why did you have to ruin a good night? You don't want me. You've made that abundantly clear. So stop being such a dick. You've probably fucked dozens of women in the past few months, but you don't see me trying to mess up your dates with them. A hint of regret broke through Alex's cold expression, but she turned away before he could see the tears filling her eyes. His voice was gentle as he said, Jessica. Mox, get him the fuck out of here. She turned to John, who looked ready to beat the hell out of Alex, and not at all happy with her. I'm sorry for this asshole. I really did have a very good time with you and your friends. John looked down at her, displeasure darkening his features. You kissed him? We didn't do anything. 
She ignored Mox speaking to Alex in a low voice in Russian and held John's gaze. You're the first man I've kissed in months, John. I haven't even been on a date since before I came to Ireland. John gave Alex a smug, pointed look, then turned to Jessica and grabbed her, giving her a kiss that was a lot harder than his earlier one. She wasn't stupid. She knew John was trying to prove some kind of point by kissing her like this. And she didn't appreciate that, so she ended it quickly by slipping out of his grip, then fumbled for her keys with shaking hands. Mox shouted something at Alex, who was growling, fucking growling, as if he was somehow the offended party here. Good night, she told John, then turned her gaze on Alex. And I don't want to talk to you ever again. Friends don't treat each other like this, Alex. Just leave me the fuck alone. I'll tell Peter if you want someone to watch over me, it won't be you. You, you asshole. She slammed the door shut behind her. Male voices rose on the other side, and she gave a frustrated scream before throwing her purse on the couch and stomping to her bedroom. She knew Mox wouldn't let Alex do anything stupid, but she still worried about John as she threw herself onto her bed and let out another angry scream. Damn him. Damn that man for fucking with her head like this. Damn him for playing games with her. And damn him for not wanting her and getting all pissy when someone else did. She knew better than to get involved with him. Knew that something like this would happen. She trusted him. Tears began to trail down her cheeks, and she curled up on her bed with her arms wrapped around herself. Someone pounded on her front door but she ignored it, pulling her pillow over her head to drown out the sounds of Alex's demands that she let him in, that he needed to talk to her. Nothing he could say would take those words back or erase the memory of the disgust on his face as he called her a whore. With every second that passed, she built up walls around her wounded heart to harden it against his pleas. He sounded sorry and upset, but she didn't give a shit. The banging and yelling went on for some time before silence finally returned to her apartment, and she lay there in the dark for a long time, wishing she'd never met Alexander Gorev and vowing that she would never speak to that prick again. Chapter 9 Oleg shuffled around in Alex's kitchen the next morning, tossing away two empty fifths of vodka you must be one of the stupidest assholes in the world. Fuck you, he snapped in a sullen mutter. Alex would have roared if the very idea of his loud voice ringing in his ears didn't hurt his head so much. She was letting him maul her, touch her right in front of my fucking door after she spent the night in my bed. So what? Why shouldn't she go on a date with a young man her age? Did you think that with as beautiful as she is, no man would ever ask her out? That she'd be content with your friendship? You know she wants more, and she tried to get it from you, but you turned her away. Not because I don't want her. But she does not know that. Oleg shook his head, his rough face grim. And she obviously did not remember whatever you did in bed with her. Fuck you, Alex mumbled again, his head aching almost as much as his heart. She remembered. I could see it in her eyes. Oleg snorted. And you, of course, were patient and understanding with her, knowing that she thinks her love for you is completely unreturned, knowing that she is very, very drunk. You, of course, handled it gently and with great tact, making her understand that she is more than a friend to you. She knows we are more than friends, he muttered, feeling like shit both inside and outside. With a sigh, Oleg looked to the ceiling, then back at Alex. You are going to screw this up if you don't make things right between you soon. Not to mention Mary slitting your throat for hurting Jessica. You know John is going to go tattle to her. Fuck, 
Alex muttered, then sighed at the memory of Jessica's silken hair flowing through his fingers. He wanted to touch her again, to lick the salt off the skin over her sensitive collarbone. But more than that, he wanted her gaze to light up at the sight of him and watch her soft lips curve into a smile that was only for him. Then the mental image of John kissing those lips made him see red. She was kissing him, Oleg. I almost killed that little shit. Instead, you lashed out at her, insulted her, and reminded her of the fact she doesn't have the pleasure of remembering your touch. This girl has been watching you with hungry eyes for months. Do you not think she may be just the littlest bit upset that she finally gets to kiss you and she cannot remember it? Such a smart man, yet such an idiot. Oleg shook his head as he looked at Alex sprawled out over his couch in the same clothes as last night. She isn't answering my calls or Max's. Luca is in Germany right now, so he emailed her asking if she wanted him to pick anything up for her while he's over there. She hasn't responded to him either. You must have really pissed her off because she always asks Luca to bring her something. She's not answering mine either, he said in a low voice, wishing he wasn't so hungover so he could get up and grab another bottle of alcohol to drown his sorrows in. Are you surprised? She loves you, Alex, and you crushed her. He didn't like the shame filling him that had him looking away. He was Alexander Novikov. He didn't feel guilt over a woman, ever. Yet his gut was burning with it, and he was practically jumping out of his skin with the need to see Jessica to make things right between them. If she did before, she does not now. You're not an idiot. Stop acting like one. You know very well that she had strong feelings for you. The little girl wears her emotions plain to see, and only a fool could miss the way she pines over you. When you enter the room, she would automatically seek you out, and you do the same. The first thing you both look for is each other. I do not know what you said to her that was so harsh. Max would only tell me you acted like a complete bastard, but you probably crushed her. She is not like us, Alex. She has lived a sheltered life. If you roared at her like you usually do when you're pissed off, you know you hurt her deeply. Like I said, do not pretend to be an idiot. Own your mistakes. It is what men do. Oleg, as usual, was correct. Men did not whine and make excuses. They fixed their mistakes. He'd taken the precious gift of Jessica's trust and damaged it in a jealous rage. The memory of looking out his door and seeing Jessica and that idiot John kissing hit him in the chest like a well-aimed punch. There was a series of coded knocks on the front door before it opened. Max came in, looking a little worse for the wear. His blue eyes were bloodshot, and his reddish-blonde hair mussed up. After Alex had been a royal asshole to Jessica, they'd gone and completed a hit that went off without a hitch, but Max wouldn't talk to him. Alex knew his friend was pissed. He just didn't know how pissed until Max spotted him sitting on the couch. You know, I've seen you be a vindictive dick before, but last night I was ashamed to have you as a friend. You lashed out at Jessica like she was one of your whores. Before Alex could respond, Max added, If you do not want her, I will take her. It will not be easy to erase you from her heart, but I will be patient with her. She is a treasure, the kind of woman who would warm a man's cock and home for the rest of his life, and she is wasted on you. Without thinking, Alex was across the room, choking Max and yelling, You will not touch her! Oleg pried him off, leaving Alex slumped on the couch, holding his pounding head in his hands. Rounding on him, Oleg glowered at Alex while Max rubbed his throat. Why? Why shouldn't he touch her? You obviously don't care about her. I do care. I care too much. He shot Max an apologetic look while his friend glared at him. You're falling in love with her, Oleg said in a low voice. 
Unable to deny it, Alex shook his head. It does not matter what I feel. You know our world isn't safe enough for me to be with her openly yet. I need more time. Your father is getting old, Max ground out in a raspy voice as he massaged his throat with a grimace. And Gideon Baldin has agreed to a truce between the Novikov and Baldin Bratvas, a truce made behind your father's back, but one that has held strong for the last five years. Gideon loves his family. He is like you. He wants peace between the Bratvas. The man lives in constant fear his wife and twin daughters will be taken from him, along with his son. Everyone is tired of suffering for the sins of your fathers. Alex stared down at his clenched fists. He'd been going over and over this in his own head, so it was good to be able to discuss it with his men. And what if my father found out about this truce? He lost both his wives and his only daughter. He is not a man who forgives and forgets. Your father, Oleg said in a low voice, is an old, old man who wishes for you and Dimitri to have a better life than the one he led. In the not-too-distant future, you will be the head of the Novikov Bratva. Perhaps it is time to start forming alliances for the future. Perhaps it is time for a new era to start. You have already begun with Gideon. Use this time your father has given you to speak with your friends in Western Europe, and let them discreetly know that you personally hold no grudges against the bold in Bratva and want peace. What Oleg was saying amounted to treason, and Alex gave him a sharp look. What are you suggesting, that I betray my father? No, I suggest you continue what you have been doing, forming alliances, making friends. Do not think I have not seen what you have been up to, carefully building a wall of protection for Jessica. I've watched you slowly stalking her, and have said nothing, but it is time for you to pull your head out of your ass with this girl. If you want her, take her. She will not remain without a man in her life forever. I can't risk it. Risk her, yet. My father thought he built such a shield, twice, and look what happened. A hard shudder worked through him at the thought of some sniper's bullets ending Jessica's life. I could not bear it if I caused Jessica's death. You are not your father, Max said as he stared at Alex. And you would not just be building a shield for your and Dimitri's future wives, but also for women like Oleg's wife and my sister. It wasn't just your mother, stepmother and half-sister who were lost, but also the wives and daughters of some of your fathers and grandfathers' top men. This slaughter has to stop. We all know it, and it is only those insane old bastards your father has surrounded himself with that feel any different. This feud is weakening us, all of us, Baldin and Novikov alike. Our enemies glory in that fact. But despite your father's cruelty, you and your brother have proven yourselves, over and over again, to be fair and honest men. You have friends, powerful friends, who will support you in whatever you choose to do. They owe you, and they are not the kind of people who like to have markers out on them. Alex glared at his friends. What if it was your wife's life, Oleg? Your girls? Would you be so quick to risk them? Oleg crossed his arms. I've known you since you were a boy, Alex. Held you at your mother's funeral. And I want what is best for you and the Novikov Bratva. A good woman is essential to a man's health, to his heart. She keeps him humble, questions him and gives him the strength to deal with difficult shit. Besides, they are already at risk, just as your Jessica is in danger thanks to her association with Peter. Max stood and studied Alex. All of this may be a moot point as far as Jessica is concerned. He spoke in a quiet voice. You did not see how deeply he injured her last night. She is not like your usual women, Alex. She cannot take such harsh words without being wounded, especially from you. She was kissing him right in front of my door.
Alex said through great teeth as shame and anger tightened his muscles. Yes, she was. Why shouldn't she? You give her no indication that you want anything but friendship from her. She slept with me the night before. I tasted her pussy, buried my fingers in her tight, hot cunt, made her scream my name. She knows she belongs to me. Both men stared at him before Oleg said, You had sex with her? No, she was too drunk, but I couldn't deny her some relief when she begged for it. What she needs I want to give to her, whatever it may be. The memory of waking up in the night to find Jessica cuddled up to him sent the sweetest ache through his soul. His contentment had been so complete that every muscle in his body relaxed, and his dreams were good for once. He usually had nightmares about death and torture, things he'd witnessed and heard of, or done himself. That night, he dreamed of walking with his mother along the lake next to the summer palace on his family's estate. They used to do that when he was young, whenever the weather was warm enough, talking about anything and everything. It had been nice to relive those moments in his sleep. Then he woke alone, and hoping she was still in his apartment, but he knew she was gone. When he found out from Dimitri that Jessica had left at the crack of dawn, he was looking forward to seeing her, but he had a delicate situation to handle for Peter as soon as possible. He was going to tell her he wanted her in his bed again that night, to have the unequaled pleasure of smelling her spiced apple-scented hair, of her delicate body curved trustingly into his. He was also going to inform her that she belonged to him now, and he wasn't going to let her go over a kiss with a stupid boy. Instead, he'd lashed out at her like a jealous fool. He was done being a fool, and the wise man listened to his advisors, so he asked Oleg, You have more experience with keeping a woman happy. What should I do? Give her some time to lick her wounds. If you approach her right now, she is still too hurt to listen to you. Let her know she is important to you, that you want more than friendship with her. She will try to protect herself from further pain by guarding her heart against you. It is human nature. Oleg started to head to the door. You could call your Uncle Petrov for advice. He is very good with how a woman's mind works and would be more than happy to help. Alex couldn't help but chuckle. Uncle Petrov, his late mother's older brother, had a strong-willed wife and three stubborn daughters he somehow managed to keep happy. Although it would be helpful to talk to him, Alex wasn't ready to tip off anyone that he was interested in a woman for something more than companionship and fucking. He trusted his uncle to keep the information to himself, but he also knew Petrov would be curious about Jessica, and he wasn't ready to bring her to the attention of anyone outside of his immediate circle yet. Especially when he wasn't sure he could salvage the situation with Jessica. He stood, then stretched, his head aching with his sudden movement. We have to take care of the warehouse situation. So the time for gossiping like women is over. It is time to work. Chapter 10 The pub was super busy with people gearing up for the holiday season and in the mood to celebrate. Laughter rang through the air, and everywhere she looked, people were smiling. Jessica welcomed the distraction of being in constant motion, filling all the drink orders, even her bad mood had lifted somewhat in the boisterous atmosphere. Her smile would be real for a few moments, but every time she thought about Alex yelling at her, a sour ball would form in her stomach, and her smile would vanish. Oleg stopped by earlier and tried to apologize for Alex, but she refused to listen. She let Oleg know that she would continue to be friends with him, but she didn't want to talk about Alex at all. She'd managed to avoid the asshole so far, but he kept leaving messages on her phone she didn't listen to and texts she didn't read. Heck, even Luca had emailed her, asking her to put Alex out of his misery and talk to him. But she ignored Luca as well. Yeah, eventually she'd have to deal with him. Alex wouldn't just go away. 
but she needed some time away from him to let her temper cool and her hurt feelings heal, and time to figure out how to deal with this mess. John had also stopped by the pub, but he treated her differently now, and she knew Alex had ruined whatever she might have had with the handsome Irish man. She knew John wasn't happy to learn that she'd spent so much time with Alex, and she could tell that he didn't believe her when she said there was nothing going on with them. Well, she didn't even believe herself. The more she thought about it, the more details of her time spent in Alex's bed came to her. She was now sure they'd fooled around, and that it had been spectacular. That only made her even more pissed. Of course Alex would be fantastic in bed. He had lots of experience. Hell, three of the six women working tonight had screwed him. Her smile was completely gone by this point, and she couldn't force herself to pretend, so she quickly cleaned up the bar and made sure everything was topped off. Peter had tried to get her to open up about her foul mood, as had Mary, but she claimed she was just going through a bout of insomnia. Peter wasn't stupid. He knew something had happened with Alex, but he seemed almost relieved that things had soured between them. She filled an order for a group of rough-looking men over on the far side of the room who were leering at her. She'd never seen them here before, but she kept an eye on their small group. Something about them had set her on alert. There usually wasn't trouble in the pub. The bouncers nipped that shit in the bud. But the place was filled to capacity. This was also Friday night of a payday weekend, and people were getting shit-faced. That meant good tips for her, but it also meant the bouncers were busier than usual, removing people when they got too wasted, or calling cabs for those who needed them. She was nodding at something one of the patrons sitting at the bar had said, when she thought she caught sight of Alex across the room, but when she took a closer look, she didn't see him. That didn't stop her stupid heart from beating faster, as she simultaneously hoped he was and wasn't here. They needed to talk, but she was afraid of what he would say. To be honest, she was surprised it had taken him this long to approach her. His incessant phone calls and texts made it clear he wasn't giving up easily. The crowd parted again, and this time she saw Alex, and he was looking directly at her. He wore his usual black suit with a subdued blue button-down shirt, the color bringing out his gorgeous eyes that were now narrowed in either anger or determination. Her mouth dried, and her heart raced as she remembered the skin-tingling sensation of his goatee brushing her face when they kissed. And if her memory was true, that man could kiss. Fuck, he was coming her way. Before he could get through the crowd, she practically ran to the end of the bar where Tilly, the manager for the night, stood emptying the dishwasher and stacking mugs. I have to use the bathroom. Can you cover me for a minute? Sure. Mind taking out a couple bags of garbage while you're back there? It's piling up quick tonight because of how busy we are. Not that I'm sad about that. Good tips, yeah? Yep. She ducked through the back doors, not daring to look and see if Alex noticed that she'd fled. Wiping her sweaty palms against her bar apron, she tried to figure out what to do. The adult, practical part of her mind, told her that Alex wouldn't cause a scene here and she shouldn't be running and leaving the other bartenders short-staffed. The irrational part of her mind was relieved that she'd managed to put off the eventual confrontation with Alex for at least a few more minutes. She grabbed a couple bags full of trash and went out one of the back doors of the pub to the alley behind. As soon as the cold air hit her, it cleared her head, even if it did hold the funk of ancient beer and sour milk. Sodium security lights illuminated the garbage bins and cast deep shadows in the alley as she tossed the bags inside. Movement out of the corner of her eye caught her attention, and she sucked in a harsh breath when she saw two big, intimidating men in dark clothing stalking towards her. They didn't say a word, but menace radiated from them, and her lungs burned as she sucked in a harsh breath. Fear-driven adrenaline slammed through her veins, and she stumbled a step back, dropping the garbage bags on the ground. 
The two men didn't stop, the lights revealing them to be nondescript but huge, both wearing black leather gloves and knit caps pulled down low on their brows. The man on the left had short dark hair, and the man on the right had a deep scar on his chin. All these details skipped through her panicked mind as she tried to figure out what to do. She turned to the door, only to find she hadn't left it propped open behind her, that it had shut and automatically locked. Now she felt like a complete dumbass, soon to be raped and dead, as she stood here and debated if she should scream or run. Neither option looked very good, and the men closed in on her rapidly. The thought of one of them touching her made her skin crawl. One of them lunged for her, and she tried to dart away, but instead lost her footing. The solid, cold mass of the dumpster hit her butt as she drew in a deep breath to scream. She'd barely gotten a sound out before they were on her. The one on the left clamped his big hand over her mouth, and she shuddered with revulsion at the bitter taste of his flesh against her mouth. The dark-haired man in the brown corduroy jacket captured one of her wrists and twisted it until it hurt, making her scream all the louder as her bones nearly snapped in a tidal wave of white-hot pain. The lesson she'd learned in a self-defense class fled, leaving her mind oddly spinning, terror filling her along with a strange sense of disbelief. This couldn't really be happening to her. This couldn't be real. The agony shooting from her wrist disagreed with this thought, and she shook as adrenaline flooded her system. Keep your mouth shut, or I'll fucking break every bone in your hand. Her knees went weak, but she nodded, and he eased up the pressure on her wrist. The guy with the scar glanced up and down the alley, then pulled out a knife. Hold her still. We need to leave a present for Peter. I think Anir will do it. Those harsh words broke her paralysis, and she started to fight them. The man in the corduroy jacket grabbed her by the hair, then slapped her three times, hard enough that her ears rang and her lip was cut against her teeth. Her panic-dazed thoughts grew disjointed by the force of the blows, and she tried to push away, to get their hands off of her, but they totally ignored her attempts to shove their hands away. They were talking to each other in some lyrical language she didn't understand, and the man who'd slapped her produced a pair of zip ties. The world took on a surreal quality as nausea bubbled in her stomach, and she tried to get her legs to work, to kick out at them, but the man with his hand over her mouth suddenly pinched her nose shut, cutting off her air. Oh, God, they were going to slice her ear off, and there was nothing she could do to stop them. With her lungs burning, she tried to claw at them, only to have the bald man grab her wrists and easily pin her, while the man in the corduroy jacket called someone to pick them up. Her vision was fading, when suddenly the pressure holding her up was removed, and she slumped to the ground, sucking air into her burning lungs. A terrible, chilling roar echoed down the brick alleyway, and even in her stupor it made her whimper, and she tried to push away with her numb legs. Now that the men's weight was off of her, she could breathe. With each ragged inhalation, her vision began to clear, the numbness fading to be quickly replaced by pain. Blinking, she tried to clear away the tears blurring her vision in the odd lighting of the alley. She squinted at the sight of her attackers fighting someone in the deep shadows as her mind tried to make sense of what she was seeing. Something warm trickled down her face, and she touched her aching cheek where she'd been struck, then looked at her fingertips stained red with blood. Fuck, that asshole hit hard. The noise stopped abruptly, and a moment later, she was being carefully lifted from the filthy ground. Bright light and voices came from behind them, and her head throbbed as shutters racked her body. She had a brief glimpse of Alex's rage-filled eyes before he turned and began to speak rapidly in a language she couldn't understand. The fear began to leave her while he cradled her to his chest, and she buried her aching face against his shirt. She took in deep breaths laced with his masculine scent, the fabric of his shirt soft against her face. A sob tore from her, and she clung to him, dimly aware that she was also bleeding on him and probably stunk like garbage. 
Someone tried to take her from Alex, and she shook her head in protest, then wound her arms around his neck. Alex let out a low, rumbling growl. I will take her upstairs. Find out who they are. A voice she recognized as her Uncle Peter spoke from right next to her. Give her to me. You are too angry right now. You will frighten her. And you won't. You're fucking covered in blood. It does not matter to her, because she knows I would never harm her. What the fuck are... Please, she whispered in a rough voice. I need to wash their stink off me. Get the taste of them out of my mouth. Take me to a bathroom. Without another word, Alex turned and walked her back into the pub, using the private entrance to Peter's home above the bar. It was an odd place for her aunt and uncle to live, but it was also huge and good for entertaining. There were always people going in and out of his house, so she was surprised when she found they were alone, except for guards stationed at every door, who watched her with open anger mixed with concern. Alex made a soft, almost crooning sound as he carried her into the gleaming black marble master bathroom. Jessica, I put you down. I can turn on the water and clean you. His English wasn't coming to him as easily as it usually did, and she dimly noted that fact. The only word that really got to her fuzzy mind was clean. She wanted clean and pure right now, needed it. She was drowning in the stink of that alley, and she had to get it off. When she lifted her dirty hand to remove the stained remnants of her cream blouse, Alex made a soft hissing sound and very gently held her arm still while he examined her wrist. With her free hand, she reached up and touched both her ears to reassure herself they were still there. Alex shushed her quietly when she cried out as he manipulated her hand. This might be sprained. Let me tell you, once endorphins wear off, we'll be pain. I swear to you, I do nothing inappropriate. Instead of answering, she merely held still while he deftly removed her clothes, leaving her in her green bra and panties, before he turned the shower on. Steam soon filled the air, her ragged breathing drowned out beneath the rush of falling water. A quick glance down showed scratches marring her torso and red spots on her arms that she knew would eventually turn into bruises. Right then, she should have been totally embarrassed by her semi-naked state, but her mind seemed to be swaddled in cotton. She was beginning to process the incident, and she started to shake, her teeth chattering with each full-body tremble. A weird keening noise filled the room and it took her a moment to realize she was the one making that sound. Alex spoke in the soft, soothing, crooning murmur she loved as he led her into the shower. His fingers were gentle when he began to take her hair out of her mangled bun, and she turned her face gratefully to the water, opening her mouth and spitting the bitter taste of that man's leather-gloved hand away. She gently probed her lip where it had been split, wincing at the sharp sting from her light touch. As her shudder subsided, the pain set in, and she whimpered when Alex gently turned her face to examine her cheek. Is not too bad. We'll not need stitches. How is vision, Jessica? With those words, he drew her out of her stupor enough for her to wonder if he was naked as well. Turning around, she found that he was standing in the shower with her still wearing everything except his jacket, belt, socks, and shoes. Amusement crept in on the edges of her fading adrenaline rush, and a rather mad-sounding giggle escaped her. Hands down, Alex would win any wet shirt contest he entered. Instead of fearing for his life at the creepy titter that had just come from her, he grabbed the soap and a washcloth from the shelf. I will clean you quickly, and will not touch intimate areas. Even in the warmth of the shower, she began to shiver again, and by the time she was clean to Alex's satisfaction, the tears had restarted. He set the soap aside, then wrapped her in his arms, whispering things to her in Russian she didn't understand, while she clung to him. Alex had saved her life. If he hadn't come... She didn't realize she'd said those words aloud until Alex murmured, 
I will always be there to save you, Jessica. Always. I swear it. If she'd been a little more with it, she would have argued that he couldn't always be with her. But instead, she just absorbed his words and let them soothe her. He helped her out of the shower, then wrapped her up in a towel and began to dry her hair with another. It was only when he unlocked and opened the door to the bathroom that she realized someone had been knocking on it. Aunt Mary stood in the doorway, along with Uncle Peter and several people behind them. Still dressed in a dark mink fur jacket, Aunt Mary pushed past a soaking wet Alex and swept Jessica into her arms. Oh, my sweet girl, she murmured. My sweet, sweet girl. Jessica was vaguely aware that men were talking in loud voices, but she clung to her Aunt Mary, now sobbing again as her overwhelmed mind tried to find some release for her lingering terror. The adrenaline was wearing off, and her whole body ached and stung, her wrist throbbing almost as bad as her cheek. A moment later, Uncle Peter and Alex stood next to her, while Alex began to go over her injuries that he'd seen while she was in the shower. Aunt Mary made shushing noises, rubbing her back until the shutters slowed. My head hurts, she whispered. The doctor's on his way, Jessica. Uncle Peter growled out in a tight voice, his face flushed red and his eyes glittering with emotion. Too overwhelmed to be embarrassed at her total breakdown, she nodded. The soft fur of Aunt Mary's jacket was now damp with her tears, and it rubbed against her face. The soft, tactile sensation that cut through the muzzy haze of fear and helped ground her in the present. She reached out to her uncle and was soon completely enveloped by her family, each of them holding her tight enough that it hurt. But she didn't protest. She needed their warmth, their love. Jessica, Peter whispered against her head. I'm okay, she whispered back, while her Aunt Mary silently cried, placing the occasional kiss on Jessica's head and cheek. I'm okay. She had no idea how long they stood huddled together, but eventually, their hold on her loosened enough that she could step back and scrub a trembling hand over her no-doubt blotchy face. They helped her to the room she'd stayed in when she first arrived in Ireland, and the familiar surroundings soothed her. The large room was decorated in soft tones of rose and white, with a massive canopy bed fit for a princess. The lights were turned down low, lending to the comforting atmosphere. A brass-framed photo of a young teenage Peter and her birth mother sat on the table next to the bed, and her already fragile emotions took another hit. Aunt Mary took Jessica into the adjacent bathroom and helped her dress in some sweatpants and a loose t-shirt, before bundling her up in a thick, royal blue terry cloth robe that smelled of her aunt's subtle perfume. When they returned to the bedroom, where the men were huddled together, she clutched the robe to herself as she sat on the bed with her arms wrapped around her knees. Her mind slowly came back online, and she looked for Alex. Where is he? Who, darling? Aunt Mary asked as she gently finished drying Jessica's long hair with a towel. Her voice came out rough when she said in a much louder, slightly hysterical voice, Alex, where is Alex? Shh. He's talking with Peter. Please, I want Alex, she whispered, and hugged her knees harder, trying to control the trembling that had begun to start up again. Peter came into the room with another older man with salt and pepper hair and kind blue eyes. When she didn't see Alex, she repeated in a stronger voice, I want Alex. With a sigh, Peter stood next to the bed. Reaching down, he gently cupped her cheek. He'll be here in a few minutes, lass. He's getting some dry clothes on. Let's get you checked over real quick. Promise? Yes, love, we promise, Aunt Mary murmured and ran a soothing hand over Jessica's back. Anything you need, darling, just let us know and we'll get it for you. Okay. She zoned out while the doctor looked her over, answering his questions as best she could. When she described what had happened, how she'd been struck 
and how they were going to cut her ear off and leave it in the alley as a morbid gift for Peter. She could practically feel the rage coming off her uncle. Aunt Mary held her good hand as the doctor manipulated her hurt one. An occasional tear rolled down Mary's pale cheek, but she tried to brush them away without Jessica noticing. They asked her a few more questions, but her mind was drifting again, and she refused to think about what had happened in an effort to shield herself from it. The doctor was handing out some painkillers when Alex came back into the room, his presence filling it with harsh, masculine energy. Like her uncle had said, he'd changed into a dry pair of black trousers and a white button-down shirt, but his hair was still damp. When his worry-filled, dark gray eyes met hers, she could feel her lower lip wobbling, and she tried to stop it by firming her mouth. For a moment, what looked like helpless rage and pain twisted his features, but his expression smoothed out into his usual emotionless mask. Jessica, he said in a soothing voice. You are all right. We keep you safe. Never let harm near you again. Her breath hitched, and she held her arms out to him, silently pleading with him to hold her. He was there in an instant, sitting on her bed and pulling her onto his lap, the scent of his laundry soap on his clean clothes surrounding her while she clung to him. He was so big, so strong, and he'd saved her. He held her and placed his lips against her temple while he whispered to her in Russian. She didn't understand the meaning of what he said, but there was no mistaking the profound relief in his voice. When her latest crying jag was over, her head hurt more than ever. She looked up to find that the doctor was no longer there, and she was alone with her family and Alex. Mary was watching them carefully with a worried expression that would normally have caught Jessica's attention. But she was so mentally exhausted, it was impossible to do anything more than exist in the moment. Uncle Peter was talking quietly on his phone as he watched her closely, his gaze darting between her and Alex, with a decidedly unhappy frown deepening the lines around his mouth. He caught her looking at him, and he gave her a grim smile that held no mirth. Are you hurting? She nodded her face rubbing against Alex's tear-dampened shirt beneath her cheek. My head hurts. Here, love, take these. Aunt Mary handed her two pills and a glass of water. She moved away from Alex just enough to take the medicine, before clinging to him once more. He didn't seem to mind and continued to hold her close. His strong heart beat beneath her cheek, and the sound lulled her. The thought of what those men would have done to her if Alex hadn't followed her began to take root in her mind, but she refused to think about it right now. Alex spoke in a low murmur, his chest rumbling beneath her ear. Jessica, tell me what happened. She went over what she could remember, her voice breaking now and again, the tremors returning as she relived it. When she got to the part about the ear, Alex went stiff. His grip on her grew almost punishing, so she shoved at his chest. Ow! His grip loosened right away, and he smoothed her hair back from each ear. His expression was closed down, but she could see his pain. The thought of her being hurt seemed to truly upset him, and she gave a watery sigh before she reached up and held his cheek. She needed to give him something to let him know how much he meant to her. The memory of what it felt like to think she was going to die still haunted her. He placed a kiss on her forehead, then leaned back again. There was a tenderness in his gaze she'd never seen before, mixing with remorse. Though he hid it well, he was obviously very upset. With this in mind, she tugged gently on his hair, pulling him down so she could whisper as softly as she could in his ear. I'm sorry. I remember now what happened that night in your bed. Not all of it, but enough. You had the right to be angry at me. Just please don't call me names. It hurts. Alex buried his face against her neck, a faint shudder working through him. She curled her fingers into his silken hair, 
stroking the back of his head, comforting him. The bed creaked as he shifted, then looked up at her, that tenderness she'd briefly glimpsed even stronger. He studied her face, then pressed another soft kiss to her forehead. Aunt Mary returned from the bathroom, then ran a soothing hand over Jessica's shoulder. Let's get you in bed, darling. When Alex tried to put her down, she dug her hands into his shirt and held tight, too afraid to worry about looking like a crazy woman. Please don't go. His expression was uncompromising as he gently put her beneath the heavy covers. I will not be gone long. Please, please stay. Don't go. Don't leave me alone. I need you. He closed his eyes, then blew out a harsh breath. Mary, tell Peter I will be there in a few minutes. With an obviously troubled look, Aunt Mary chewed her lower lip before saying, Alex, are you sure? Alex replied in a voice that brooked no argument. Go. I will attend to Jessica. I assure you that I will die before I let anything or anyone harm her. You have my word. The pain pills must have been pretty potent, because she was already beginning to feel a dulling sensation stealing over her body, over her thoughts. When Alex lay next to her, she gratefully curved into a solid warmth, burrowing into him until she was as close as physically possible. Alex didn't seem to mind as he held her tight, whispering against her hair in Russian and placing tender kisses on her face where it wasn't bruised. Drinking up his affection, she tried to fight the pills so she could cherish the feeling of him finally holding her like she'd wanted for so long. She tried, but in spite of her best efforts, she was almost asleep when Oleg and Mox came into the room. They took one look at her and let out almost identical growls that would have been funny if they didn't look so furious. It was too much of a struggle to lift her hand, so she merely whispered, Hi, guys. Don't freak out. I'm okay. Really, I'm just a little tired. Oleg clenched his fists, the veins on his burly forearm standing out in sharp relief. He didn't say anything to her, but began to speak to Alex in rapid Russian, while Mox took out a cell phone and moved over to the corner of the room to make his call. Her gaze met Mox's deep green eyes, and she flinched at how scary he looked right now. He must have realized he was freaking her out, because he turned away. When he looked back a moment later, his familiar warmth had dissipated the scary vibes, but the tension remained. She gave him a weak smile that pulled at her sore lips in an attempt to reassure him, but he didn't return it. Alex distracted her by growling something as he tensed behind her, but his big hands never stopped their slow caress of her back and shoulders. With the red in his hair glinting in the dull light, Mox crossed the room and handed her his phone. Jessica, Dimitri wishes to speak. Alex grew silent behind her as she held the cell phone up and said in a thick voice, Hello? Devushka Milaya. Dimitri growled. We make this right. What? Dimitri, I'm okay. Please don't worry about me. I, I survived. Her brain was starting to shut down thanks to the drugs, and she struggled to focus. Alex took the phone from her and began to speak in rapid-fire Russian again. Oleg and Mox talked together, their faces tight and their body language aggressive. She wanted to tell them again that they didn't need to be so worried, that Alex saved her. But talking took way too much effort. It was a struggle to keep her eyes open anymore, so she gave up the fight and nuzzled her face into Alex's neck. Letting out a long sigh, she fell easily into a drugged, blessedly dreamless sleep. Chapter 11 Alex waited until he was sure Jessica was out before he eased her off of him and removed the robe before tucking her in. The sight of the creamy perfection of her cheek and temple already darkening with a deep bruise sent rage spinning through him. Her lips were swollen as well, the lower one split. 
with a soft touch, he smoothed the hair back from her forehead and placed a kiss there before standing and facing Oleg and Max. All tenderness fled as he locked his gaze on his men. Bring me to those bastards. Oleg grimaced. I am afraid it is too late. They had cyanide capsules in their mouths. We think they took the poison as soon as you interrupted them. Fuck! That was a clear indication these men were not only professionals, but loyal to the bone to someone. They had guns with the serial numbers scratched off, but nothing else to identify them, and no tattoos. However, they knew enough about Peter's security setup to avoid being seen on the exterior cameras. With as busy as the sidewalks are right now, the men were able to blend in and get to the alley without anyone being the wiser. Peter's contacting his associates to see if any of the police cameras in the area caught anything. How did they know she would be out there? Max looked down at his phone. Someone must have been watching her from inside and tipped them off. Do you think anyone that works for Peter was in on it? Max shook his head. We questioned all of them. They were genuinely shocked and saddened by what happened to Jessica. None of their reactions were staged, but we are having them followed home to make sure. Alex spared one more glance at a sleeping Jessica before looking back at Max. Stay here with her. He nodded and stopped talking into his phone. Lucas says there has been no chatter that they've intercepted back home about Jessica. Everyone is too busy trying to deal with your father's sudden need to push for more territory. Alex gritted his teeth, unable to deal with thinking about the mess his father, Jorg, was creating back home, which Dimitri was trying to clean up. Jorg was on a tear to expand their western flank, territory that was held by the Baldin and Lerche Bratvas, while the rest of his advisors were attempting to talk him out of it. Most of them were good men, but they'd become his father's advisors because of their extreme loyalty. They would do anything for Jorg, and eventually, if Jorg wanted more territory, they would support him. Alex knew he'd have to go home at some point to try and make his father see reason, but right now, his only concern was Jessica. The memory of following her out into the alley next to the pub with the intention of making her talk to him, only to see her delicate body being abused by two big men as she struggled, sent another burst of adrenaline through him. He wished those bastards were still alive so he could show them what true suffering was. Come on, Oleg said in a low voice. Peter is waiting for us. With one last look at a sleeping Jessica, Alex followed Oleg past the two men guarding the door and down the hall. They waited for one of Peter's men to key in the code for a solid steel door with no handle. They were ushered into a large, windowless room with a massive circular dark wood table in the middle and enormous flat-screen TVs on three of the walls. Peter's War Room Alex approached the table where Peter was thumping his fist against the aged and scarred wood, his face red as he shouted about finding out who the fuck these men were. Mary stood behind his chair, her hands clutching the back as she watched Alex and Oleg, her blank face giving nothing away. Dressed in an elegant pale ivory blouse and tailored grey slacks, she looked like she should be running some business empire, not one of the most feared gangs in Europe. Mary was a sweet armful of a woman with an easy smile, but she was just as ruthless as her husband, and Alex never forgot that in his dealings with her. Peter took a deep breath and turned to Alex, his face grim. Three of his men bustled about the room, talking quietly in the background. He glanced behind him. Oloye, out. They waited for Peter's men to clear the room, but before the other man could speak, Alex asked, Who did this to her? Take your fucking pick. I've got enough enemies to choose from. Peter growled and thumped his fist again. Someone came into my territory, my fucking home, and almost took my niece. After giving Peter's shoulder a squeeze, Mary studied Alex. What we need to think about is what they hope to accomplish by taking her, and why. If we can figure that out, we can narrow down a list of possible suspects. While the kidnapping could be the work of one man, I don't think it is. This is too organized, too precise. 
Alex's thoughts spun as he turned the situation over in his mind. Normally, with his years of training in espionage and tactics, he was able to view things from an objective angle. Right now, however, his main concern was Jessica, and that was interfering with his ability to stick to pure logic. If there was an open power play being made for Peter's territory, it would mean this place could soon be a war zone. Attacking family is personal. Insulting, Oleg said from behind him. Peter nodded, closed his eyes and let out a long breath, then opened them again. I want to send Jessica back home to the States, to keep her out of this, but I'm afraid it is already too late. It will be even easier for them to hit her there, and she can't very well live with one of my men guarding her 24-7 without attracting attention. Plus the American police might get involved, and that is the bloody last thing we need. I will take care of her, Alex declared before he was even aware the thought was in his head. Mary stiffened. No. Peter glanced up at his wife. Mary. No. She repeated in a heated voice. I'm not stupid, Alex. I see the way my niece looks at you, how you are around each other. That little girl adores you, or at least the man she thinks you are, and you're going to break her heart. She needs a nice, normal husband who can give her a family and a safe home. Ignoring the fact that Mary was right and Jessica did deserve the kind of life he could never provide, Alex snorted. You took her away from normal and safe when you brought her here. Is late now to be worried. How dare you! Peter held up his hand. Enough, Mary. We knew the risk when we invited Jessica to stay with us. We knew it might make her a target for our enemies, but we took the chance because we both needed to see her, to spend time with her. I know you care for her deeply, but she is not a child, and I won't drive her away by trying to control her life. You'd have to be blind not to see that Alex cares for her, and even though I can think of a million men I would rather see my niece fall in love with, Alex will be able to keep her safe until we deal with this and neutralize the threat. He may keep her bloody safe. Mary glared at Alex. But her heart is another matter. I know your reputation with women, Alexander, both here and in Russia. I mean, no disrespect, but you have no business messing around with an innocent child like her, playing games with her emotions that she's ill-equipped to handle. She deserves better than to be the toy of a man who will leave her without a second thought once he decides their time is up. Alex leaned forward, anger tightening his muscles. Niet, I play no games with Jessica. She rolled her eyes, and her tone was biting. Please, she hissed. I heard from John what you did, what you said. You won't let Jessica date someone else, but it's okay for you to go around fucking everything that moves. And let's not forget the Novikov curse. This time, Peter stopped his wife. Enough, Mary. But, Peter, you know... I said enough. Mary let out a little gasp, her eyes wide, obviously unused to Peter yelling at her. Every word she said was true, yet Alex already knew what his course of action was. His time to get his world as ready for her as possible was up. Jessica was his, and he would do whatever was necessary to keep her safe. The sooner Peter and Mary realized that, the better. His thoughts cleared, and his indecision fled, the plans forming and falling into place, not just for keeping her safe now, but forever. I will be taking Jessica to Rome with me in a few days while I take care of some things. She will have around-the-clock protection, and I will introduce her to some of my business partners, men who owe me and will help me keep her safe. Excuse me? Mary shrieked, but Alex cut her off. Know this, I plan on marrying Jessica one day, and making her my wife. But, but... Mary stuttered and looked to Peter, who was watching Alex with a grim expression. You hardly know her. I know her better than you think. All this time I have spent with her has shown me a woman who is a treasure for right man. I am that man. He gave Mary a level look. It was not you she begged to stay with her. It was me. You arrogant.
Mary looked ready to totally lose her temper, but before she could continue, Peter interrupted. Enough, Mary. It's done. We've known from the first time they saw each other that Jessica was taken with Alex and hoped it would fade. But we both know she's in love with him. I won't make the mistake of history repeating itself, trying to keep them apart. He sighed and rubbed his face. Take care of her, Alex. She's one of the last family members I have left, and even though I haven't known her long, we love her very much and want only the best for her. Nothing is more important to me than Jessica. I will guard her with my life. They discussed some strategy and began to go over contingency plans. After this was done, Alex didn't bother returning to his home to change. Instead, he went straight back to Jessica's room. Max was on the door, and to Alex's surprise, Luca was there as well. His friend looked tired, and his thick, normally well-styled light brown hair was must, but his hazel eyes were deadly serious when they met Alex's. Your woman is safe, sleeping inside. He was itching to get to Jessica, but it was important to let Luca know Alex appreciated his support. How did you get here so fast, my old friend? Luca shifted and leaned against the door, his black suit wrinkled and a red silk tie loose around his neck. I was in Berlin. Dimitri contacted me, and they got here as soon as I could. Your brother would have come as well, but things are not good back home. Alex sucked in a harsh breath, hating how conflicted he felt. On the one hand, he wanted to return to Moscow to help Dimitri and the men loyal to them in staving off whatever disaster their father was cooking up, but he needed to go to Rome with Jessica to start weaving a web of protection around her that couldn't be broken. For the first time in his life, his loyalty was divided between his family and his woman, and he didn't know what to do about it. What did Dimitri say? With a grimace, Luca nodded. That your father is... acting odd. Irrational. Yesterday he talked to Dimitri briefly about taking a hit out on Vili Baldin, who has been dead for seven years. Are you sure your father is taking his medication? Yes, we have a private nurse with him at all times, and everyone in our inner circle is aware of how dangerous it would be if he isn't medicated. She will put the drugs in his food so he is forced to take them just in case he decides he no longer wants them. He is acting irrationally now, but nowhere near as bad if he was off his medication. He exchanged a glance with Max. I cannot leave Jessica alone, but Moscow is not secure enough for her yet and she is definitely not ready to meet my father. I understand, Luca murmured. One of the reasons I do not have a girlfriend is because eventually I would have to introduce her to my mother. That drew a tired chuckle from Alex. Luca's mother was as mean as a bear with a sore paw and loved to spread her misery around. Growing up, Luca had spent a great deal of time at Alex's home, and he thought of the man as more a brother than a friend. Max interrupted. We have reinforcements on the way. Who? I have three more men coming to join us in Rome, all black deer. Jessica will not know they are here, but they will be watching you. Alex nodded, relieved his best men would be there to help guard her. Since he was in charge of the muscle side of the Bratva, he devised a level system for his men. At the bottom of the pyramid, there were the foot soldiers, and at the very top were the black tier, the most elite killers and fighters Alex and Luca had personally trained. These were men he trusted with his life, proven friends and staunch allies. I will see you in the morning. Have breakfast delivered at eight. Jessica likes French toast with strawberries and clotted cream from the restaurant down the street. Bring that with a pot of coffee. Got it. Max said with a small smile. Want me to get some milk with that? She usually drinks a glass with her morning meal. He wasn't sure if Max was being a smartass or not, but he didn't care. Finally, he got to be exactly where he wanted. With Jessica, even if the situation was less than ideal. Mentally, he berated himself that he should have taken this step with her sooner, should have admitted his feelings for her. 
but he promised himself he wouldn't hold back anymore. Eventually, he would tell her the truth about his world, but first he needed to woo her, to make her fall so deeply in love with him that even when she found out he was a demon among men, she would gladly stay in hell with him rather than try to run. Turning the door handle, he eased through, then nodded at the men before closing and locking the door behind him. Jessica was a lump among the white pillows with one clasped tightly in her arms. She would never need a pillow to hug again. She would have him to cling to and to hold. He quickly used the bathroom and brushed his teeth, then shed his clothes as he approached the bed. His cock started to fill until he caught sight of the bruise swelling her cheek, and his gut clenched. The need to comfort her consumed him, and he slid beneath the soft sheets, the cotton smooth and cool against his skin. Though he turned off the lights, they were in the city, and it was never truly dark. The dim glow of street lights reflected around the edges of the curtains. He gently shifted Jessica into his arms, pressed his face to her hair, and inhaled her clean scent. She felt so small, so defenseless in his arms, and his chest hurt, an unfamiliar pain that seemed to settle into his heart as he thought about how close he'd come to losing her. If he'd come out the back door one minute later, it might have been too late. Never, never again would he allow her to be exposed to danger like that. Her breathing was slow and even, her body a dead weight on his as he cuddled her against him. He'd been with many women, yet he'd never had the urge to simply hold one of his lovers and sleep with her curled into his side for anything other than the convenience of waking up with a warm body to fuck. He'd certainly never felt the heat that suffused him as her body melted into his. Tomorrow, he'd have to start setting things up for Jessica's arrival in Rome. Even though he hated it, he would see to things personally, including briefing his men. He knew Peter and Mary would keep Jessica safe while he was gone. That didn't mean he didn't wish he could stay with her, but her safety was more important. He'd do some investigating on his own, contact some sources, and see if he could help steer Peter in the right direction toward finding whoever had ordered her kidnapping. It would also give him time to calm down and, he hoped, give Jessica a chance to heal before he whisked her away to Rome. Sighing up at the ceiling, he closed his eyes and held her, sweeping his hand beneath her shirt over the small of her back, soothing himself with the fact that she was alive and in his arms. He knew she was his woman, made for him, meant for him, just like he'd been made for her. There wasn't a doubt in his mind she would be his wife, the mother to his children, the one bit of softness and light in his dark world. Now, he just needed to make her feel as loved as possible, to fill her life with joy and bind her so tightly to him she'd never want to leave. Chapter 12 Two days later, Jessica tried not to stare at the newest addition to her ever-growing army of bodyguards. A gigantic man with a tattoo of a dagger piercing the side of his neck and shoulders so broad she was surprised he made it through the door without turning sideways. But what really caught her eye, other than his bulk, tattoos, and general scariness, were his sideburns that were so long they bordered on being mutton chops. It kind of made him look like Wolverine, if Wolverine was a serial killer. His name was Crom. No last name. He was the latest addition to her steadily growing entourage of super intimidating men. Most of them were Russian, and throughout the past few days, Mox and Luca had introduced various new men to her. All the new guys she met were very professional in their well-made dark suits and polite, but they made her anxious. She'd become used to the warmth and friendship she had with her bodyguards, not the chilling and professional distance the new guys displayed. When they looked at her, they studied her closely almost as if they could read her mind, but they did not smile. Inevitably, their gaze would fall on the ugly bruises standing out like a beacon on her cheekbone, then down to her split lip, and they'd become even scarier, as an almost offended anger filled them, like they took the marks on her face personally. Mox, bless his heart, 
knew the men freaked her out, so he would introduce her to each one, and she'd give them as much of a smile as she could without pulling too hard at her lower lip. After that, she would shake the new man's hand and thank him for coming, usually much to his surprise for some odd reason. She would then mumble out a quick apology for her troubles, having pulled him to Dublin. At this point, Mox would groan and tell her there was nothing to be sorry about, and the new man would stare at her even harder. By the time the latest guy arrived, she was tired, stressed out, and her head ached. The quiet of the small blue and white study, with its comfortable gray chairs and reading nook, had soothed her, making it easy to ignore Mock standing guard at the door. She pretended to read, but in reality, her mind was just kind of in heavy daydream mode. Her eyes had closed, and she was almost asleep on the oversized sofa when Mox appeared yet again with yet another stranger. If she'd met this latest guy, Crom, first, she might have been intimidated by his scarred face. He had a wicked slash going over his forehead and into his hairline. But after the parade of predators slash bodyguards who'd come through Uncle Peter's home, she was over being afraid. Eck, in a way, she was glad they were so intimidating. Hopefully, they'd scare off whoever was trying to hurt her, and she could move on with her life. Maybe even want to leave the safety of her uncle's place eventually. It wasn't like she'd been a total shut-in. She'd visited her apartment with her Aunt Mary under Mox and Luca's watchful gaze, but only long enough to pack up some things. Hell, she'd even showered at her place today, with an armed guard right outside and another in the hallway and another in the stairway. Yeah, overkilled the extreme, but she was also grateful for their presence, because without it, her paranoia might take her over and send her running to hide in a closet. Almost getting kidnapped might have something to do with that new personality quirk. She grimaced as her head throbbed harder, and she sat up. She pressed her hand to her forehead and tried not to fidget beneath their intense gaze. Since the... incident, any move she made was scrutinized. It was sweet that they were worried about her, but she was being suffocated by their concern. Yeah, it sucked. Yeah, it was scary. Yeah, she'd had some wicked nightmares, and yes, her paranoia had ramped up. But that didn't mean she was going to go into hysterics. She'd survived the death of both her parents, and those horrible times in her life had given her a new sense of what bad was. Surviving an attempted kidnapping wasn't anywhere near having to bury the people she loved more than anything in the world. That didn't mean she wasn't crapping her pants scared when she allowed herself to dwell on her situation, but she wasn't going to let fear rule her life. With a tired sigh, she rubbed her hands on her black yoga pants and wondered how she was going to have a normal existence with all these behemoths breathing down her neck. They would not blend, especially Crom. The guy could squish people with one mighty tattooed hand. Totally freaking out now, but trying to hold it in, she turned and smiled sweetly. Mox, is Alex building an army around me? Crom frowned and looked to Mox, who, she assumed, translated. Then Mox looked back at her with a tight expression. We will do what is necessary to protect. She nodded, then pushed herself from the couch and moved to stand in front of the brute. She was tall for a woman at five foot ten, but this guy dwarfed her. She had to crane her neck to look up at him and force a smile. She needed to remember that he was a fellow human being, and his crazy boss had put him on her already overstaffed babysitter slash bodyguard detail. It wasn't Crom's fault he got dragged here, and he probably had a ton of things he'd rather be doing. So she tried to be as gracious as possible and launched into the speech she'd given close to a dozen times now. Hi. Welcome to the family. You're going to be spending the next few days watching me sit around and twiddle my thumbs. Let Alex know what you like to eat, 
and we'll do our best to keep you fed and happy. If you like beer, Peter's Pub has some excellent choices, and I highly recommend the restaurant on the corner with the blue pepper sign. They serve, oddly enough, a Tex-Mex that is to die for. Mox shook his head and translated, leaving the other man frowning down at her again. He gave a short reply in Russian while he studied her. Tired beyond reason, she returned a stern look and yawned. Krom is old friend of Alex. Mox's voice was unexpectedly serious. Aren't they all? she muttered. He understands English and speaks English, but is not familiar with slang, so please keep in mind. He will be in charge of your advanced security. That means he will be scouting out locations of places you may go for any potential weaknesses. He will go over your security detail every morning with you and asks that, before you go anywhere, to please let him know, so he does not have to hunt you down. Her throat closed up as the reality of her world came crashing in, breaking through the fragile blanket of indifference in which she tried to smother her fear. Since the incident, she'd been on an emotional roller coaster, fine one moment and sobbing the next. She hated it, hated the pitying look she received like she was some broken doll. Her cheek ached as her pulse sped up, and the thickness in her throat became a burning in her nose. Grasping the cuffs of her pale gray wool cardigan, she sat up straight and willed herself not to cry. Mox always grew agitated when she cried, and she didn't need him hovering over her any more than he already was. It seemed like the moment she was awake, he was waiting for her. The handsome man barely let her out of his sight, and she had to fight to keep him out of her room while she was getting dressed. Jessica, are you not feeling well? Her neck sagged as the pain in her head overwhelmed her pride, and she closed her eyes. Headache. She sensed movement in front of her, and she bit back a yelp when she opened her eyes and found Crom squatting down a bit, so she was looking him in the face. He was all up in her personal space, but the intensity of his light brown gaze held her. There was no inflection in his voice as he spoke in Russian, and when he was done, he stayed where he was, watching her carefully. Crom says there is no reason for tears. He is here now and you will be protected and safe. So no crying. It irritates him, makes him want to hurt those that make such a pretty woman sad. No more tears, okay? She blinked rapidly, then nodded and winced as her headache intensified. Abruptly, Crom straightened and said something to Mox, then gently gripped her by the back of her neck and spun her around. Fear caused her to twist in Crom's grasp, and she let out a startled, What the hell? Relax, Crom said in a deep voice that fair shook her bones. We'll remove poison. She stiffened further, wincing when pain exploded behind her eyes with a hard pound. Mox made a soothing noise and moved around into her line of sight. Crom is skilled with, what is word? Touching muscle to make it feel better. To help whole body. Knows how to soothe head. Jessica knew the answer as soon as Crom wrapped his big fingers and palms around her skull, then squeezed. Almost instantly, the pain lessened, then eased to the point that it was just an annoying background hum. She was putty in his hands. Crom knew pressure points, and he was now her new best friend. As his long fingers manipulated her scalp, then her neck, she relaxed and let out a sigh of relief as the aching tightness slowly left her muscles. He was an angel, a sideburn-sporting, tattooed angel with a blessed touch. Then he began to press and massage her tight shoulders, taking away further tension until she was in danger of slumping over. Crom spoke again, and Mox translated. You need to drink more water and sleep. She didn't bother to reply, only let out a languid sigh when Crom took a step back, and she collapsed onto the couch. 
She pulled a comfy teal throw pillow beneath her head and grabbed a furry, cream-colored one to hold against her before she mumbled an apology to the men and gave in to sleep. A few hours after her long nap, she found herself in her Uncle Peter's study with him, her Aunt Mary, Alex, Mox, and Crom. Jessica had just been informed that she would be leaving the country, told she was going like she was a little girl being sent off to stay with a relative. She stared at her Uncle Peter, then glanced over at her Aunt Mary, today wearing a loose red-knit dress with a pretty leather belt. The older woman was clearly not a fan of Alex's crazy plan, but she kept her lips pressed firmly together. Her displeasure with the blank-faced man sitting next to Jessica was obvious. Alex didn't care. He continued to ignore everyone but Peter. She woke up alone after that horrible night and hadn't seen Alex again until earlier today when he'd given her a chin lift, then left the room with a group of men she didn't recognize, all speaking in Russian. That had hurt. She really thought they had something. But once again, he'd pulled back, and she was left with the wounded heart. Jesus, would she never learn? Narrowing her eyes, she frowned at Alex, trying not to notice how handsome he was, how the familiar scent of his cologne soothed and aroused her. No, she needed to pay attention to one thing and one thing only. She would decide where she went and with whom. And most certainly, Mr. Alexander Gorev did not get to tell her what to do. You want to take me to Rome for a month? Yes. He replied like it was the most normal thing in the world, his attention now on his phone as he texted someone. Irritated at his rude behavior, she turned her glare on him, then regretted the action when it made her neck pinch. The day she'd gotten beat up, she hurt. But it was the days after, when pains and places she didn't even know she had surfaced, that she was really miserable. Days when she could have used a hug from a certain man that she thought was into her, or at the very least gave a shit enough to check on her the next day. He confused the hell out of her, and she didn't like it. And she certainly didn't want to have to deal with his bipolar ass in Rome, of all places. I'm not going anywhere with you. You are going. End of discussion. Jessica. Peter said in a low voice, his face heavy and somber. You are going. But... She looked at him. Why? It's not safe for you right now, lass. Until the authorities find out who did this, they could try it again. It's not likely, but I don't want to take any chances. You don't have to go with Alex, her aunt added. We can send you anywhere you want. Alex's anger prickled her skin in little stings, and when she turned back, she found him glaring at Mary. There were undercurrents here that she didn't understand, things she'd been left out of. She needed the truth, and she wanted it now. Struggling to remain calm, she spoke in a measured tone. Can I talk to Alex alone, please? Aunt Mary started to protest, but Uncle Peter stood and went over to his wife. We'll give you a few minutes. Jessica scarcely paid any attention to the door shutting as they left. Her gaze was focused on Alex, who was staring back at her. What is going on? Have you lost your mind? You are in danger. We make you safe. Her nostrils flared and she tried to remain calm as he glanced at his phone again. I'm aware of that, but danger from who? Why am I being targeted? Because you are loved. What? He tilted his head slightly. Do you not want to go to Rome with me? No, I don't. For the first time since she'd entered the room, he focused entirely on her. No? No, she said in a firm voice. Then we will stay here, but it will put a strain on your uncle. What the hell are you talking about? God, for once, can you just give me a clear answer? His gaze snapped with anger 
as did his brisk voice. You are target, and like any target, people will be tempted to take shots at you. If we stay in Ireland where it is easy for them to get to you, there will be more attempts. When we go to Rome, it is much safer. You will be untouchable. The thought of having to live through another attempt on our life was more than she could bear right now. Untouchable. Princess Samoya, do not be scared. Trust me. I, I don't know. This is all happening so fast. Her lower lip trembled, and she gave him an imploring look. Help me understand what's going on. His lips softened, and he came over and knelt before her chair, placing his warm palms on her thighs. Through her thin black leggings, It felt almost as if he was touching her bare skin. A warmth filled her belly, and her breath caught when he moved closer, forcing her thighs apart. Once his solid mass was between her legs, he slid his hands up slowly, glancing the sides of her breasts, until he ran his fingers into the thick hair at the base of her skull. He leaned closer, enveloping her in his scent and rubbed his cheek against her uninjured one. Without even thinking about it, she wrapped her arms around his neck, holding him close, and let out a long, heartfelt sigh. Is better? He asked in a low voice, while tenderly kissing her neck with soft rubs of his damp lips. She nodded, unable to answer, relief filling her at being in his arms. It was all kinds of better may be the best. His breath warmed her ear as he whispered, I want to take you to Rome, not just to keep you safe, but to have you all to myself. Never in my life have I wanted a woman the way I want you. I am greedy for you in a way you could not understand. I promise you that you will enjoy yourself. You will love the city and it will love you. Come with me. Trying to rally her brain, she pulled away a bit. He'd been a real jerk. I don't understand. You vanished, and when I saw you earlier today, you totally ignored me. Those are not the actions of a man who desires me. You don't seem to be attracted to me at all. Then you say these nice things that make me think you really do want me. I have always wanted you, from the moment I saw you. But I had to make sure certain things were in place before I made you mine. What? He sighed, his warm breath ghosting over her. We'll discuss this later. In Rome. I don't want to discuss it later in Rome. If I'm even going with you, I want to discuss it now. Is not right time or place with your aunt and uncle hovering outside of door. I promise you, Jessica, that I will tell you. But not now. Trust that everything I do for you, I do because you are special, important to me. Can you give me time to explain? He was being so nice, so charming and affectionate, that she found herself nodding. I can give you time, but I want answers, Alex. I mean it. And you will get them. He stroked her inner thighs by her knees with his thumbs. Does this mean you will come with me? Now it was her turn to rub her cheek against his, enjoying the tickle of his goatee. I have always wanted to see the Roman ruins, and I've heard Italy is amazing. How long will I be there? He pulled back enough to place a delicate kiss on her lips. A month or less, enough time for your uncle, I mean authorities, to find whoever targeted you. It was impossible to say no when he looked at her with such warmth that it made her body light up and her brain turn to mush. Okay, I'll come with you. He grinned. Okay. You know I'm placing a lot of trust in you, right? I do. And you must know that your trust means much to me, his greatest gift. I will protect you. I will never let anyone harm you. From now on, Jessica... I devote myself to your happiness. The sincerity in his voice undid her, and she drew in a watery breath and pressed her face to his neck as she whispered, Thank you. When Alex had said he was taking her to Rome, 
she had no idea he meant right that moment. He'd given her enough time to pack two suitcases, kiss her aunt and uncle goodbye, then whisked her off to the airport for a first-class flight to Rome, with Mox and Luca riding in coach. Oleg was home visiting with his family, but he would meet them in Rome at some point for a week to give one of the other guys a break. The entire time they were in the airport, Alex had doted on her, holding her hand while she tried to ignore the people staring at her bruised face. It was better than it had been two days before, and she'd managed to conceal the discoloration a little bit with makeup, but thanks to her pale skin, it was still glaringly obvious. They'd stare at her face, then give Alex a look that made her aware they thought he was the one who hurt her. By the fifth time this happened, she wanted to scream that he didn't abuse her. But Alex seemed oblivious to those narrow-eyed glares, so it helped her keep her temper in check. She was usually so mellow and calm, but Alex seemed to magnify her emotions, and she found herself feeling very protective and possessive of him. She was dressed in her usual comfortable black leggings and a pretty navy blue top with lacy capped sleeves and a high neckline, while he wore his usual suit, deep gray this time, along with a silver and navy blue tie that complemented her top. She would have thought it was a coincidence, but he'd gotten dressed after he'd seen what she was going to wear. It's like he wanted them to match. Odd man. Freshly shaved, he was in full-on badass mode, and she found it interesting the way people seemed to avoid meeting his eyes. Then again, the women were too busy ogling all that was Alex in a suit to notice he had eyes. There was something about a dangerously sexy, well-dressed man that flat-out did it for her. So contained and in control. Yet she knew the barely civilized man that hid below the public mask he wore. He rubbed his thumb gently on her hand as they moved through the crowd, his touch soothing her while he constantly scanned the busy crowd. She took that opportunity to study his face, and her heart fluttered. Just looking at him made her happy, and the fact that he seemed equally pleased to have her on his arm was almost surreal. During their flight, they kept the talk light and easy, but there was a sexual tension building between them she couldn't miss. His every touch seemed to burn along her skin, and soon she found herself completely under his control, relaxing as he took charge of her every need. Yeah, his bossiness with other people, like the poor flight attendant who'd annoyed him in some way, was irritating. But she couldn't get too mad, since it was on her behalf. Plus, in an odd way, he made her feel safe, cherished. It was in the way he watched her, how he paid attention to her silent moods, how he took care of her, and how he used any excuse to touch her. At all times, he made sure that she was comfortable, that she had everything she could possibly need. She wasn't used to a man fussing over her like this, and his attention was a soothing balm to her frazzled nerves. Being spoiled was nice and not something she'd ever experienced. Her parents had loved her to death, but they'd been financially conservative, and she'd had to work on the farm for an allowance or get a job whenever she wanted something that her parents viewed as unnecessary while she was growing up, like her senior year spring break trip to Cancun. Waitressing all those tables had provided enough money for her to have a really good time and her mother slipped her an extra $200 before she'd left, along with a box of condoms, which had made Jessica want to crawl beneath her bed and die as her mom lectured her on safe sex. She let that memory play out, smiling a little bit as she remembered her dad also slipped her $200 and told her not to get arrested because he would not be happy to have to fly down to Mexico to bail her out. In fact, he just might leave her there. He'd been smiling when he said it, but she wasn't entirely sure he was joking. Alex shifted next to her as he took his jacket off, the scent of his cologne teasing her. 
Because they were in first class, the flight attendant was there almost instantly, taking his jacket and hanging it up before offering him a blanket in a low voice. Their flight was a late one, and in the subdued atmosphere of the plane, she fell asleep on Alex's shoulder not long after their meal. When she woke up a few hours later, they were in Rome, and when Alex let her out of the airport, a thrill raced through her. Everyone around them was speaking Italian, and she couldn't help but marvel at the fact that she was in Italy, of all places, with Alexander Gorev, of all people. As soon as they stepped out of the airport, she had to brace herself. The bright light pierced her eyes, and a wave of noise from the early morning rush of beeping cars, whistles, and people shouting hit her almost like a smack in the face, waking her fully as the rising sun warmed her skin. Her mouth was dry and her eyes gritty, but she couldn't help her huge smile as she got her bearings. However she'd gotten here, she was in Italy now, with an amazingly awesome man and a pack of scary-ass bodyguards. When Alex smiled down at her, she marveled about how life had certainly changed in the last couple months. Back in Iowa, she never imagined anything like this could actually happen to her. She was so normal, so average, just another college girl whose greatest aspiration had been to figure out her major. And she never, ever would have imagined that a man like Alexander Gorev existed let alone seem to care deeply for her. Alex noticed her watching him and leaned down to give her another soft kiss. Why you smile? How could I not? I'm in motherfucking Rome. This is awesome. She must have said that louder than she intended, because a few people within hearing distance chuckled, while an elegantly dressed woman curled her lip in distaste. Turning away from that woman, she allowed Alex to guide her to a cream-colored Jaguar sedan that had pulled up to the curb. A handsome driver in a black suit stepped out of the car, then held the door open for her, smiling and speaking to Alex in rapid Italian. To her shock, Alex responded in what sounded to her like perfect Italian, and she stared up at him. He noticed her staring and frowned slightly. What is wrong? You speak Italian? His lips twitched in a smile, and his gaze warmed. Yes, along with French and German. It's good to know different languages for conducting business. Wow. He cupped her cheek for a moment, then placed a kiss on her forehead, his goatee tickling her. Get in the car, Princess Moya. I want to check into our hotel, try to get some sleep, then show you Rome. Where are we staying? The Hotel Hustler. Very exclusive, very beautiful. But if you do not like it, we will stay somewhere else. Laughing, she slid into the luxury car and turned to Alex when he sat next to her. I'm sure it will be wonderful. The door closed, and he took her hand in his again, studying her as the driver pulled out into the busy traffic leaving the airport. He rubbed his thumb over the back of her hand. His lips barely moved when he spoke. Jessica, I am making my intentions known to you. What? When he looked up, his gaze was intense and his expression stern and unforgiving. I want you as my woman, Jessica. I am serious about you. More serious than I think you know. Your woman? What does that mean? He hesitated. It means I want to make you mine in all ways. You mean like date me? That and more. More? Everything. Oh. She leaned her head against the soft leather seat and looked at him. Why? His eyes widened, the light catching the silver and making them gleam. What do you mean, why? Alex, you don't date. You said so yourself. And to be honest... I wasn't really sure you would ever see me as more than a friend. I mean, is that what we're doing now? Being more than friends? Instead of being angry, he smiled. You have always been more than a friend, Jessica. 
from the moment we met. I felt a connection with you like nothing I have ever experienced. I have never wanted to simply spend time with a woman, to always have her around me, to care about her every need. The careful rules of how I must live my life never apply to you. Do you not feel this between us? How powerful it is. Taken aback by his sincerity, she nodded, then ran her fingertips down his cheek. I know I've never met anyone like you before, Alex. You're not the man I first thought you were. For you, I am different. He held her hand and brought her fingertips to his lips, kissing them and tickling her with the soft brush of his facial hair. You are only person that gets this part of me. To most, I am someone to be feared, but you, you, my princessa, were never afraid. You intimidated me and made me nervous, pissed me off, but... Grinning, she leaned forward and gave him a soft kiss on his lips, just because she could. I was never afraid of you. He went to touch her cheek and brushed her bruise, making her flinch. Hissing, he jerked back like he was the one that had been struck. Did I hurt you? Hating that the tender moment between them had been broken, she shook her head. I'm okay. He didn't say anything for a bit only stared pensively out the window. In an effort to lighten the mood, she laced her fingers with his. So Peter mentioned that you have to do some work while you're here. Anything fun? His cold gaze snapped to hers, and she blinked hard at the darkness she saw there. What I do is none of your business, Jessica. Um, I'm sorry. I didn't... That is... Never mind. She tried to slip her hand away, but he wouldn't let her go. With a sigh, he shook his head. No, it's I who am sorry. I work with some dangerous people, and I do not want you caught up in their mess. Dangerous people? She frowned, nodding to herself. I guess that makes sense. I mean, why would they hire a bodyguard service if they weren't in any kind of danger? His expression closed down again and he didn't respond. As they drove into the city of Rome itself, she forgot about Alex's odd mood and stared through the tinted windows of the Jaguar, watching the city come alive as the sun rose higher in the sky. The buildings weren't massively tall, but they were packed together. Some districts looked old enough to have been around in the days of the Caesars, while others were as modern as could be. It was so different from America and had an even older feel than Dublin. Some of the side roads they passed were narrow to the point where she doubted even one of the tiny, compact European cars could go down them, and there were mopeds everywhere. It was pure vehicular chaos, and she was so happy she didn't have to try to navigate those crowded streets. They passed monuments, stores, and cafes everywhere each space capturing her attention as she made mental notes to come back here at some point. And the fountains. She'd never seen so many fountains situated in gorgeous plazas in one place. Each was unique, and they added an elegant charm to the city, unlike anything she'd ever experienced. Alex gave her a bemused, indulgent smile as he watched her twist and turn in her seat to get a better view of the things they passed. Jessica had inherited a sizable amount of money from her birth mother that Peter had given her, something about her mother's share of some business stocks, and she wouldn't mind spending some of it on the dazzling clothes she saw in the windows of some of the shops. It would certainly help her blend in with the endless parade of stylish, chic women who strolled through the city with such confidence. Goodness, it was like she'd been transported to the land of beautiful people. Their car pulled up to a curb, and the driver got out, then opened her door in a smooth, practiced move. As he helped Jessica out, her earlier excitement returned. She was practically bouncing at Alex's side while he talked with the driver. Once he was finished, he smiled down at her and held out his hand. She immediately wound her fingers through his, trying to look everywhere at once and soak up the beauty of this place. 
giving her knuckles a kiss. His goatee tickled her skin. You like? Oh, Alex, I love. She gave him an impulsive hug, laughing when he grunted at how hard she squeezed him in her excitement. They stood at the top of a huge set of old marble stairs that led down to a plaza below, with what looked like a big, very old fountain in the center. Behind them stood a tall, creamy beige building with some beautiful towers, and there was a dark stone obelisk. The tourists were easy to spot, not only because of their posing and picture-taking, but because they were dressed far more casually than the residents of Rome. It made her self-consciously look down at her own outfit of leggings with black ballet flats and wish she'd dressed up a little more. Glancing around from beneath her lashes, she released Alex when she noticed people watching them, and she hoped Alex wasn't ashamed of her lack of style and sophistication. Unlike Jessica, he blended right in with the urbane crowd in his perfectly cut suit, and more than one woman gave him a lingering look. Jessica couldn't blame them for eating up the eye candy, but it did send a nickel of doubt through her that she would be able to keep Alex's attention. She couldn't help but feel like he'd soon realize he'd made a mistake, that she wasn't anything special at all. Shit, she was borrowing trouble, as her mom liked to say, and she needed to calm down, go with the flow and all of that. As if she'd summoned her, Jessica's mother spoke in her head, repeating the same words she'd told Jessica on her first day of high school. It was a Dr. Seuss quotation, but it stuck with her, and she could almost feel her mom's hands on her shoulders, squeezing gently. Be who you are and say what you feel, because those who mind don't matter, and those who matter don't mind. She turned her face to the sun, refusing to cry on such a beautiful day, in such a beautiful place, with such a beautiful man. Tugging her hand, Alex broke her melancholy thoughts and began walking towards a building with the words Hotel Hassler on the roof in giant letters. A steady stream of obviously wealthy people walked in and out to the front of the hotel, and she tried to adopt their urbane, slightly bored expression. She didn't want these refined people to think she was some dumb tourist, even though she was. Deja vu struck her, and she paused, glancing around her while she tried to figure out this odd feeling like she'd been here before. Something about the area she was in seemed familiar, and she slowed further, looking behind her. A memory tickled at her, and she stopped altogether, trying to figure out why she knew those stairs. Alex looked down at her. What is it? That place back there looks familiar. She studied the creamy building with the two towers, then the steps, then moved a couple paces closer to the street and looked again. Oh, my God. It's the Spanish Steps from Roman Holiday. What is that? It's an old American movie with Audrey Hepburn. My grandparents used to love classic movies, and Roman Holiday was one of their favorites. Whenever I slept over at their house, we'd always have movie night, and I've seen it at least a half dozen times. Would you like me to bring them here? What? Your grandparents. If it would make you happy, I will bring them to Rome with us someday. She blinked back tears, her throat suddenly thick at the kindness of his gesture. Thank you, but they passed away when I was in junior high. I'm sure they're watching me right now with my mom and dad, totally jealous. Actually, no, they're probably not jealous. They probably pulled some strings in heaven to get me here, with you. The rare public smile he gave her was gentle, and he looped an arm around her waist and pulled her to his hard body. I am glad you like. No, I don't like. I love. She beamed up at him, enjoying how his tension around his mouth relaxed. Thank you. He jerked his head up abruptly, and his grip pinned her to his side. Thrown off by his odd response, she looked around, but didn't see anything that would have set him off. Her heart raced, 
but she only saw people going about their business on a beautiful and unexpectedly warm December morning. Nothing nefarious to her untrained eyes, but maybe he saw something she didn't. When he growled and pulled her closer, she gave him a poke in the ribs. Alex, what's going on? Fucking paparazzi, he muttered, then turned them both and began to walk briskly to the hotel. She went to look over her shoulder, but Alex held her tighter. No, give them no attention. Are they going to hurt us? No, but our picture may now be in gossip magazines. Gossip magazines? Why would they want a picture of me in a magazine? He cast her a sideways glance. He's not you. He's me. Okay. Why the hell would they want a picture of you in a gossip magazine? I am a well-known businessman back home. My father is even more well-known. I thought you ran a security company. I do, among other things. I will discuss with you later. Now is not time. Do not look back, Jessica. Keep walking. Max is taking care of problem. Do not worry. Is merely... What is word? A minor irritation. She wanted to ask him what the hell he was talking about, but they were at the entrance to the Hotel Hassler, and she slowed down to take in the magnificent building with its enormous black wrought iron lamps, the elegant marble slab over the entrance with the words Hassler via Medici, embossed in gold, gleamed in the sunlight. It was impressive, and she tried to smooth down her hair with her free hand while Alex led them inside through the spinning glass door. Once they were in the foyer, she took a couple steps, then stopped to take in the huge space filled with marble columns, gold gilded lights, and gorgeous classic furniture set against a rich red carpet. A few people meandered around, all the men wearing slacks and button-down shirts, some in full suits, and the women looking as crisp and posh as could be. In the comfortable ballet flats that she wore for traveling and her ever-present yoga pants, she was pretty sure she stood out like a sore thumb. Alex, on the other hand, seemed like he belonged here. While he led them across the lobby to the front desk, she tried to keep from fidgeting beneath a notice they'd drawn. A beautiful blonde woman working the desk smiled at them, but kept most of her attention on Alex after giving Jessica a brief glance. She said something in Italian, calling him by his first name, and he chuckled, then replied in Italian. The woman's demeanor was obviously flirtatious, all batting eyes and pouty lips, and Jessica hated how her possessiveness flared to life. Jealousy tightened her stomach as the woman outright ignored her now, practically fawning over Alex, who seemed to be oblivious. After a few moments of conversation with the woman, he looked down at Jessica and said in English, This is my woman, Jessica. She is to have whatever she desires. If she wants a Ferrari, you will get it for her in the color she desires. Open an unlimited account for her in my name for the hotel shops and restaurants. My personal shopper will be arriving tomorrow, but I want something sent up from the boutique for her so we can go out for dinner tonight. Something in purple, I think, that will show off her beautiful body. And you will speak English so she understands. The hotel worker's smile remained professional, but it held none of the warmth it had a few minutes ago and her voice was stiff when she replied in lightly accented English, Of course, Mr. Gorev, you are in the penthouse suite. If you need anything at all, please contact your usual personal concierge. Her blue eyes flicked to Jessica in a slightly catty way, then back to Alex. Isabella. Alex's hand holding hers flexed, and he said something in rapid-fire Italian. The woman paled, then nodded, and wrote something down. When she looked up again, her smile was definitely strained, and her face pasty beneath her makeup. My mistake. Your personal concierge is Piero, and he will be happy to assist you with anything you need. Would you like him to take you to your room? I know way, Alex said in a cold voice, 
and the woman blanched further. Of course, have a wonderful stay. After taking the key cards, Alex led Jessica to a bank of elevators and pressed the button. Normally, she would have been gaping at their surroundings, but her attention was solely on Alex, trying to read him. His reaction to this Isabella and the weighted looks the blonde had given him had made her take notice. Alex, who is Isabella? No one important. He didn't even look at her as he said that or when they were in the elevator and he pressed the button for their floor after sliding his key card. Suspicious. She waited until the elevator had started up before trying again. Did you fuck her? Okay, that wasn't quite as smooth as she wanted. His shoulders tightened, and she knew the answer even before he spoke. Yes, was convenient. Her skin heated with irritation and she tried to shake his hand off. Convenient? Gripping her hand tighter, he looked over at her, and she couldn't decipher his expression. Convenient. Her temper, fueled by jealousy, flared. Will she be convenient while you're here with me? I mean, I understand how things are between us. His gaze turned downright pissed as he growled out, And what is it you understand? That, she looked away, forcing her gaze to remain on the buttons of the elevator. That we're both adults and know what this situation is. And what, Princess Moya, is situation? There was a dangerous purr to his voice now, and she swallowed, gathering her courage and stealing her heart before she whispered, Convenient. At that moment, thank God, the door opened and she practically jumped out of the enclosed space. She'd only had a chance to glance around the elegant hallway with four doors before Alex had her body pressed facing against the wall. He said something in Russian before growling and thrusting his hard cock against her. His big frame totally surrounded her, and a shiver raced down her spine to her pelvis as he ground his thick erection against her ass. A gasp escaped her before she could stop it, and her desire to have him deep inside of her flared to life, even as she grew pissed at the way he was manhandling her. Pleasure flooded her, and she relished his possessive, dominant touch. He whispered into her ear, You are not convenient. You actually make life difficult. Having you here is going to draw attention. I am making public statement with you at my side. A public statement? What kind of public statement? Her voice came out soft and husky. The brush of his lips against the back of her ear made her panties grow damp. That you, Jessica Venture, are my woman. Mine. And I protect what is mine. The anger in his tone helped her mind clear from the lust-induced fog he'd woven around her. Does that make you mad? What? Well, she sucked in a breath and said in a shaky voice, You sounded very angry. Abruptly, he softened behind her, his breath warming her neck. Niet, I not mad at you. I cherish you. Is world that would try to take you from me that I am mad at. He allowed her to turn in his arms, backing up just the slightest bit so she could look at him their hips still pressed together. The muscle in his jaw flexed, and restrained desire rolled off of him, tingling over her sensitive skin. Never had a man looked at her like this, as though he was going to eat her alive or fuck her to death, or both. The urge to rub up against him, to have him sink into her, made her wild for him. She stared into his eyes while dirty, naughty thoughts raced through her. They were in a public hallway. True, there were only four doors, but someone could come out at any moment. They might catch her while she stroked Alex's cock, milking him into a hard, fast orgasm. She actually watched his eyes darken, going from mist to gunmetal gray his pupil expanding while his lips softened. 
What are you thinking about, Princess Amoya? What has you so flushed, has made your nipples hard, your pizda soft and wet? I can smell your arousal, and it makes me hungry. Such a sensitive... He rubbed his cock along her cloth-covered sex, making her moan deep in her throat. Pussy, I cannot wait to have my cock in you. You do not know how many times I stroked myself thinking about you, how many times I dreamed of fucking you. Feeling incredibly bold and aroused and in need of his touch, she slowly licked her lower lip, willing him to see how badly she needed him. Fuck me. Right here, right now. She'd half expected him to argue, but instead he dropped to his knees then spread her legs apart with his firm grip. Without thought, she followed his silent demands and tilted her pelvis to his face. He gave a dirty chuckle, then leaned in and took a deep inhalation of her sex. His scenting her was so dirty yet erotic that she couldn't help but squirm with need. She'd never been with someone as sexual as Alex. It had crossed her mind that she might be some kind of freak for liking the things she did, that she'd never find a man willing to indulge her. But Alex quickly disabused her of that notion. If she was a freak, he was an outright pervert and didn't give a fuck who saw them. She knew this because he muttered it against her pussy before tearing out the crotch of her leggings with his teeth. That only left her sex covered by her white silk thong, and he let out a long groan, sliding his finger beneath her panties and up to her sopping wet core. Instead of finger-fucking her, he only muttered, Soaked. Before standing. Without preamble, he started to unzip his pants, and she reached for him, eager to help him get his beautiful cock out and fuck her. When he took a condom from his suit pocket, she could only pant, stroking him as best she could. He was nice and thick and so hard, it almost felt like she was holding a warm stone in her hands. An amazing big, fat cock for her to fuck herself on. It didn't dawn on her that she'd said that aloud until Alex swore and fumbled with the condom. I see I have filthy girl on my hands. Very, very filthy. You do, she whispered without shame, knowing he meant it as a compliment. Their gazes met, and he easily picked her up, urging her to wrap her legs around his waist. The lighting in the hallway wasn't bright, but it was more than enough to see by. Having sex like this, out in the open, so exposed made her pulse race, but it was the fact that she was doing this with Alex that made it extraordinary. He was her friend, her confidant, and now he was going to be her lover. The hallway was silent except for their rapid breathing, and she let out a soft moan of need as he rubbed his erection against her aching clit. For so long I have wanted you, sweet girl. Going crazy with the need to have him inside, she nipped his lower lip. Then fuck me. Without any urging, she reached between them and guided him to her entrance. He held her poised there, the tip of his cock pushing slightly into her, just enough to give her the tease of being filled by him. She tried to wiggle down, but he held her tight without any strain. His muscles bulged as he kept tormenting her, driving her wild. Sweat beaded on his brow, and his thick cock jerked. You are mine, Jessica. Say it. She met his gaze full on, willing him to know she meant it as she whispered, I'm yours. Her back arched, and a soft scream escaped her as he slid in, pushing his way past her clenching muscles forcing her body to take him. Fuck, Alex groaned as he continued to press in. You will make me come too soon if you do not relax. Your pussy is too good, and it has been too long since I last had sex. Those words danced on the edge of her mind, 
and she almost snapped at him for talking about fucking another woman while he was deep inside of her. But he chose that moment to slam the last few inches in and fill her with his rock-hard shaft. He was stretching her almost beyond her limit, and her pussy stung a little bit. His lips met hers in a gentle kiss, his tongue teasing her, his cock flexing inside of her when she bit his lower lip. Tears prickled her eyes, but she buried her face against his neck and willed them back, overwhelmed by him in the best possible way. All discomfort fled when he began to gently rock into her, his position grinding her sensitive clit with his stroke. Her hands relaxed, nails no longer digging into his suit-covered shoulders. Instead, she laced her fingers through his hair and clung to him as he kissed her harder, his intensity matching the stronger thrusts of his hips. Their panting breaths and moans filled the quiet space around them, and as she imagined the door to the elevator opening and people catching them, her body tensed while her orgasm tightened her belly. A moment later, she was coming hard, and Alex let out an almost surprised groan, his body jerking against hers while he buried his face into her neck. Alex kept her pressed against the wall, still connected as he shuddered. Your pussy is too good, too perfect. I cannot hold back when you grip me like that. He twitched inside of her, and she reflexively squeezed him with her internal muscles, making him jolt. With her heart still thundering and her body crushed against his, she began to rain kisses over his face. She liked the way he stilled and closed his eyes, his expression almost reverent. She smiled happily, affectionately nibbling his ear before whispering, Hi, Alex, followed by a giggle. He pulled back enough to look at her with a gentle smile and kissed each of her eyelids. Hello, my Jessica. It surprised her that Alex was a cuddler, but he proceeded to nuzzle and pet her, making her feel, well, cherished. All too soon, he sighed, gently helping her off his still erect dick. He took the used condom off and secured it, before wrapping it up in a linen handkerchief in his suit pocket. He tended himself while she straightened her clothes as best she could. A quick glance down confirmed her fear that the crotch of her pants had been torn beyond repair and barely hanging on. Crap, I hope our room is nearby. It is. He winked and gave her a lecherous grin. Your pussy gets such a pretty rose red when you are well fucked. A flush suffused her cheeks, something that shouldn't have been possible after their uninhibited, kinky, totally amazing sex. But she was satisfied for the moment, and her urge to get out of the hallway grew. Room, please. He slipped off his suit jacket, draping it around her shoulders. It fell to just below her butt, and she hoped it covered her enough for the walk down the hall. Thankfully, Alex didn't dawdle and he stopped at the door at the end of the hall, flanked on either side by beautiful wood tables and enormous arrangements of real flowers in giant crystal vases. She didn't have time to admire this, because Alex had the door to the suite open, and a familiar, masculine laugh filled the air. Then Dimitri said, It's good to see Jessica is a true redhead. Chapter 13 Alex sighed as Jessica screeched, then frantically tugged his jacket down, trying to hide behind his back. Glaring at a laughing, Dimitri sprawled out on the elegant dark cinnamon damask-covered sofa across the large room. Alex snarled out in Russian. Shut the fuck up. You're embarrassing her. Still laughing, Dimitri stood up and tugged a folded blanket from the end of the couch, then tossed it to Alex. Sorry, sorry, I was not expecting to see lovely red curls when she walked through door. Lucky bastard. I know, Alex said while trying to hide a smug grin, then switched to Russian while Jessica glared around his shoulder at his brother, adorable in her embarrassment. What are you doing here? Dimitri's smile disappeared. Father sent me. Why? Does he know about Jessica? 
Yes, but I convinced him you are playing a complicated political game to strengthen the Bratva by seducing her. Did he believe you? Yes, it helped that Oleg said the same thing. Father might believe I am still a stupid young man, but he trusts Oleg, and it is no secret Peter and Mary adore their new found niece. Father was also pleased with the forged documents you sent. He said they were so good they could fool a doctor into believing a whore was a virgin. Charming as ever. Alex relaxed slightly. His father had given him the task of using the new forgery skills Peter had taught him to make some documents that would, hopefully, get a few of their men into the United States without being caught. Jessica shifted next to him, clearly trying to pull down his jacket to hide as much of her as possible. She smelled like sex, and him. It was an aphrodisiac he wanted to explore by burying his face between her slim thighs. Her pussy was so soft and sweet against his mouth, and on his tongue. Give me that. Jessica snatched the blanket from his hands. Her cheeks were bright red as she clearly struggled to hold on to her dignity while wrapping the blanket around her waist. Where's our room? She happened to glance down and caught his erection pressing against his pants. Since he was not a small man, it was rather obvious. Her breath came out in a gasp, and her eyes grew wide. He'd ridden her hard, and she was probably a bit tender. It would take some effort, but he would have to take things slow with her. They had the rest of their lives to explore each other. Even knowing that, he still wanted to bury himself in her right now as she stared at him with lust in her beautiful blue eyes. Come, Dimitri snickered. I will show you to your room so you may get dressed before Alex defiles you in front of me without offering to share. Greedy bastard. She glanced up at him with shocked laughter in her eyes, and Alex curved his arm around her in a possessive manner. He wanted to punch his brother in the face, but he was also pleased to see Dimitri put her at ease. Is not necessary. I will show her. Dimitri smoothed his black slacks, the gold bracelet on his wrist glinting in the light. You have some business associates waiting for you in the guest suite, Laz Stefano and his wife. It took some effort to ease the sudden tensing of his body. I wasn't expecting him so soon. Shrugging, Dimitri winked at Jessica. Laz is business associate and an old friend of your uncle Peter. It is not surprising he would want to meet you. His wife is American, interesting woman. She is smart, I think you will like. He gave Jessica a quick kiss, regretting he couldn't take her to their room and fuck her properly until they both passed out. Go, get changed. There is wardrobe for you in there. The jewelry is in the safe. Dimitri will help you pick out something appropriate to wear. Appropriate? You are about to meet the mayor of Rome and his wife. She paled. Seriously? Dimitri shook his head and slung an arm over her shoulders while she scowled at him. Is no big deal. They nice people, and Melanie, mayor's wife, will love you. Alex had to hold back a laugh. Melanie was a gorgeous blonde in her late thirties who had a taste for willowy young women, especially redheads. He would have to make sure he mentioned to Laz and Melanie that Jessica was very, very new to the scene, and to not scare her. All he needed was for Melanie to do shots with Jessica, and then attempt to go down on his woman. It might be more than Jessica could handle, and the last thing he wanted to do was make her apprehensive about sex. Then again, Jessica could be far wilder than he gave her credit for. He was certain she kept that explosive passion bottled up inside, a gift just for him to unwrap and save her. He glared at his brother. Do not upset her. The innocent look Dimitri gave him was so out of character that Jessica giggled while his brother protested with his hands up. I am nothing but gentleman. Jessica snorted. Come on, help me find something to wear so I can meet the mayor of Rome. Holy shit balls! my life is crazy. Walking away with Jessica, Dimitri looked down at her with a smile. Crazy bad or crazy good? 
She glanced back over her shoulder at Alex for a long moment and replied, "Crazy good." He loved the way her face glowed with happiness when she said that. Alex waited until they'd entered the master bedroom of the suite before he went into the sitting room and watched Laz speaking quietly with Melanie over by the window, looking out over Rome. The leggy blonde was dressed in a stylish pale blue suit that went well with her fashionable tan and her white, dangerously high heels. Wearing a tasteful amount of expensive diamonds, she was the epitome of elegant grace. Her husband Laz wore his customary black suit. But his red tie had hints of the blue in Melanie's dress. Together, they presented a power couple in every sense of the word. A master and his switch who were supremely self-confident and comfortable with who they were. Laz approached him first, giving his customary hug of greeting. Melanie followed a moment later, softly kissing both of his cheeks, and he noted a hint of her floral perfume. She stepped back and linked her arm through her husband's. Smiling at him warmly, she said, "It has been far too long since we've seen you, Alex." Since she was an American, her Italian was accented, but it had much improved since he'd seen her last year. It is always a pleasure to return to Rome. You've been away far too long. What? I have to be abducted for you to come visit? Sighing, he shook his head and laughed. She had him there. Last time he'd seen Melanie was after he rescued her from her kidnapper. Thankfully, the thug hadn't harmed Melanie, probably because her feminine charms were honed to a razor edge. But she'd been a terrified mess when Alex had found her bound and gagged in a dusty hot attic. I have been busy. So I heard from Dmitri, Jessica, right? He adores her. Says you're happier with her than he's ever seen you. He also said she is young. Laz added with a wry smile on his handsome, angular face. Younger than him and very much the innocent. Is this true? Why? With a laugh, Melanie leaned over and patted Alex's cheek. So suspicious. Relax. Laz slid his arm around his wife's waist, fitting her neatly into his side while she spoke to Alex. We wanted to personally invite you to a private party we are throwing this weekend, but didn't know if your woman will be interested. A hunt, but not a big one. Something smaller, a little more intimate. Would it be something that Jessica would like to attend? If not, we can certainly have dinner at our vineyard instead, like nice, normal, vanilla people. She'd love it. Very romantic. Alex's lips twitched as he imagined taking his unexpectedly bold, adventurous woman to one of the Stefano's infamous BDSM hunts. If someone had asked him six months ago, hell, just two months ago, if Jessica was anything but straight vanilla, he'd have laughed. Her innocence had him fooled. To his delight, he discovered that behind those innocent blue eyes was a mind filled with dirty thoughts. Her enthusiasm surprised him as well. He was used to more cultured lovers, women who were as highly trained in the arts of pleasure and companionship as the courtesans of old, and were just as cynical. Jessica, on the other hand, had a raw passion that fit him perfectly. She had a hunger for sex equal to his, and he looked forward to teaching her new things, protecting her, taking care of her every need, so she could live a life of pure happiness. This time in Rome, these stolen days away from the chaos of his life were his gift to her. It was unavoidable that he would have to work at some point, but the majority of his time was going to be spent with his woman, and the idea made him happier than he'd been in a long time. Alex, Laz was amused, trying to hide his surprise at being caught daydreaming like a fucking woman. He straightened his back and nodded to Melanie. I believe she would greatly enjoy the hunt. This will be so much fun. Melanie grinned, and enthusiasm sparkled in her eyes. Is she a submissive? I do not know for certain, but I believe she leans that way. She is just beginning to embrace her sexuality. For all intents and purposes, an innocent. Laz shook his head and chuckled. And you're taking her to one of our hunts. I hope, for your sake, my friend, that she is made of stern stuff.
My Jessica is a surprisingly adventurous woman, not shy of her pleasure. Just young. Very young. How young? Melanie frowned at him. She is legal, twenty years old, but you will see when you meet her. She was raised on a farm in Iowa, in, uh, what did she call it? Yes, flyover country, small town with strict parents. She has been sheltered but is eager to explore. She enjoys exhibitionism. Whistling, Melanie crossed her arms. Yeah, I know exactly the kind of sweet country girl you're talking about. One of my roommates in college was from Kansas, a state nearby, and she went wild once she got out of her parents' home. If Jessica is anything like my friend, and she's kinky, no wonder you're tied in knots. A woman like that is hard to resist. Some of us prefer more experienced women, Laz said to his wife in a low, husky voice. And some of us enjoy teaching a woman what her body can do. Alex nodded while Melanie laughed softly. Dimitri said she's a redhead, right? Katrine is going to love her. Melanie sighed, then absently smoothed the lapels of her husband's jacket. Poor Nico. He's going to have his hands full with that one. She's a spitfire when she's angry. Excitement at the thoughts of his close friends meeting Jessica filled him. He decided long ago he was going to ease Jessica into his world, and he thought that Rome would be a good place to start. She was here on a vacation of sorts, and vacations generally put people into better moods, so it would be the perfect time for her to meet his inner circle. He knew Ivan was already here, they texted each other earlier, and made plans to get together so he could meet Jessica. He met Laz's amused dark eyes. Dimitri mentioned something about them coming, but I did not know Katrina and Nico were already here. Yes, we believe he's going to propose to her. Dimitri came as Nico's moral support. His jaw clenched, and he tried to keep from being offended about not knowing any of this. I see. Dimitri chose that moment to enter the room. Jessica is getting ready and will join us soon. Fighting for calm, Alex turned to face his brother, watching the bright smile die on his face as he read Alex's expression. Nico is getting engaged. Why didn't he tell me? Holding up his hands, Dimitri shook his head. Hopefully. Don't jinx it. It's not a sure thing. You know how Katrin is, so paranoid, so hard for her to trust. He asked that I keep it quiet so if he gets turned down, he won't have to be humiliated in front of everyone. Besides, he knows how busy you've been. Melanie smiled, ignorant of the guilt hitting Alex that he'd been so involved in his own world he'd ignored his friends. We will make sure he has everything he needs to win her hand. No one can resist love in Rome. Right before Dimitri spoke, he knew his brother was going to say something that would piss him off. Dimitri had that devilish gleam in his eyes that meant nothing but trouble. Sure enough, when he opened his mouth, Alex wanted to choke him. I would have thought you would be in a better mood considering you screwed Jessica's brains out in the hallway. You're welcome, by the way, you lucky bastard. Her body is amazing. Those long, long legs were made to be wrapped around a man. Shut up, Alex muttered, though he agreed, Jessica's body was amazing. While Alex had been fucking his woman, Dimitri had come out of their suite, leered at them, and made some obscene gestures, then let Alex know he was keeping the hallway private. Melanie laughed, then strolled over to her husband's side, slipping her arm into his. Hmm, I think I like this girl. She sounds fun. With a considering look on his handsome face, Laz studied his wife, then murmured. Interested? A woman cleared her throat behind him, and Alex turned to find his woman in a lovely black jersey dress that hugged her hips, then flowed out to mid-thigh. Her hair was swept back and held in place with a thin, cream leather headband that matched her heels. 
Their shoes weren't terribly tall, but Jessica's legs were so gorgeous that the heels made her look spectacular. The dress left a great deal of the expanse of her creamy thighs bare, and he wanted to lick that sweet skin. He remembered how smooth she was beneath his touch, and it took a great deal of effort to force his gaze higher. The top was sleeveless, and the collar was made up of fishnet and dipped low in the front, revealing a hint of cleavage, bearing the lightly freckled skin between her obviously braless breasts. A little bit of naughty in all that elegant class. Then his eyes landed on the sight of her bruise, covered up with makeup so it wasn't quite as noticeable, but still a dark shadow on her cheek and temple. She fidgeted a bit beneath his gaze, and his protective instincts, always so close to the surface around her, flared to life, demanding he relieve her of her unease. He wanted her to know they were all staring at her because she was exquisite to look at, and she should be proud of her beauty. When he met her tilted blue eyes, he smiled at how anxious she was, though she was trying to hide it. Her gaze was wide and kept darting around the room. When she saw Dimitri, she smiled, her loveliness blinding him, and she gave his brother a cute little wave. Laz blinked, then cleared his throat, and held out his hand, approaching Jessica slowly. Miss Venture, it is so nice to meet you. My name is Laz, and this is my wife, Melanie. We are old friends of your aunt and uncle, and we are pleased to meet you. It's nice to meet you as well, sir. Jessica smiled and shook their hands, freezing a bit when Melanie tugged her into a hug and kissed both of her cheeks. When she pulled back, her smile turned mischievous while Jessica blushed a soft pink. Melanie gave Jessica a blatant come-hither look that made Jessica flush harder, now a light red from her chest to her eyebrows. Looking at Alex, Melanie said in Italian, Very pretty, and you are a lucky, lucky man. He offered Jessica his hand, and she clung to it right away. The strength of her grip surprised him, and he realized meeting people like the mayor of Rome and his wife might be a bit out of her comfort zone. He should have paid better attention. Taking care of her was his priority now. With this in mind, he gave Melanie an arched brow, and she immediately started a conversation with Dimitri in Italian on the other side of the room and dragged her husband along. Once they were sitting in the comfortable chairs surrounding the fireplace, he turned his attention to Jessica. She was looking across the room to where Melanie sat while chewing on her lower lip. Jessica? She startled and met his gaze, then blurted out in a low whisper. Am I crazy, or was the wife of the mayor of Rome hitting on me? Unable to hide his laugh, he slipped one of his arms around her slender waist, tugging her close. The scent of an unfamiliar but very nice perfume reached him as her warmth pressed into his body, fitting against him perfectly. Dipping his head closer to the creamy expanse of her lightly freckled neck, he took another deep breath, drawing the crisp scent of her deep into his lungs. There was a definite hint of apples and spice, but also some herb that brightened it. A lovely, unique scent. He nuzzled his face against the side of her neck and breathed deep. You smell nice. She hummed low in her throat and leaned back so she could smile up at him. Dimitri got it for me. Said it was custom made by the guy who does his cologne. I have to say, I really like it. Smells better than my cheap mall stuff, that's for sure. He said he felt so bad about what had, what had happened and wanted to cheer me up. For some reason, the thought of Dimitri buying her anything irritated him. I like, but only I buy it for you from now on. She fought the bemused smile that seemed to want to curve her lips. Yes, sir. His cock twitched when she said that, and he had her close enough that she could feel him pressed against her belly. I like it when you speak those words, Princess Samoya. I would like even more when you call me master. The light in her eyes dimmed, as did her smile. I heard that about you. Quite a few of the bartenders like to talk about serving you.
The fucking bitches Jessica worked with had been running their mouths. Instead of responding, he placed a gentle kiss on the tip of her nose and tried to defuse the situation. Look at you. Hours on a plane, a hard night, a hard fuck, and you are fresh as spring rain. Um, thank you. She looked down, and her hand fluttered up to her cheek, her voice going husky. I, I tried to cover it up the best I could. I hate the way people look at you like you did this to me. It pisses me off. He'd noticed that, of course, and didn't give a fuck less, but it angered him that it had bothered Jessica. People like to make snap judgments, quick assumptions. Is the easy way of life. Just go with personal experiences and prejudices and you will never have to think or notice things. The observant man would know that someone like me would never hurt you, only protect you. Still, I want to yell at them that you didn't do it. Amused by the fierce tone of her voice, he ran his knuckles along the delicate column of her throat. I appreciate your defense of my virtue, but I assure you, he's all right. Giving him a light punch in the ribs, she looked away and crossed her arms. I don't like how they stared at me. They stare because you are the most striking woman they have ever seen. An exotic beauty. Alex. She groaned and looked up to meet his gaze again. The side of my face is black and blue. It's hideous. Dorogaya, you are divine. I would not lie. If you had spinach in teeth... I would tell. Her startled laugh bubbled out of her, the tension draining away, proving once again that his Jessica was born happy. He caught Dimitri, Laz, and Melanie all turning to look at them. With a smile, he lifted his chin up to his friends. Would you like to join us for brunch at the hotel? Of course. Melanie responded in English, and Jessica startled next to him. Are you American? The charming smile Melanie gave Jessica made her husband grin as he watched his wife flirt. I am. I'm from California, the San Diego area. Where are you from? Iowa, one of the most boring places on earth. With a low laugh, Melanie stood then walked over to them with a definite sway of her hips. She took Jessica's hands in hers and gave her a mischievous look. Well, sweetheart. You're in Rome now, and I'm going to make sure you have so much fun you'll never stop smiling. The city is fabulous, and I'm not just saying that because I'm married to the mayor. Alex pulled Jessica back to his side and gave Melanie a stern look out of Jessica's line of sight. Really, the woman was practically drooling all over his girl. Dimitri joined them and looked pointedly at Melanie, who was talking with Jessica about shopping. She was smiling bright and seemed oblivious to the way Melanie kept giving her little touches. Laz was on the phone on the other side of the room, talking quietly but keeping an eye on his wife. Laz met Alex's gaze and he raised his brows, his dirty grin indicating he'd noticed his wife's obvious flirting and Jessica's blushing response. An hour later, they were sitting back and enjoying their drinks, surrounded by people talking and laughing at their tables on the huge patio. Jessica was seated in the shade of the building in deference to her fair skin, but the rest of them enjoyed the sun on this warm winter day. Hanging baskets full of red and white geraniums dangled off the decorative wrought iron railing that revealed an impressive view of Rome lying out before them. Because the hotel was seated higher than most of the city, the view seemed to stretch on forever, and Alex took in the monuments scattered here and there, ancient buildings that were each amazing in their own right. He could not wait to show Jessica the world that now belonged to her. If he could pry her away from Melanie. The blonde woman, now wearing a fashionable white and black hat that shaded her face from the sun, sipped her coffee, set it down, and grinned. So, we'll do shopping in a spa day? I know the most fabulous place where they give the best hot stone massages. I'd love to. Jessica hesitated, then bit her lip, and looked over at Alex, the uncertainty clear on her expressive face. Is that okay with you? 
He'd be a fool to turn down Melanie's offer. No one anywhere would shoot at Jessica while she was with Melanie. Not after the horrible example Alex and Laz had made of the men who'd kidnapped her. The woman was a multimillionaire in her own right, with a father who was part of the Russian mafia, and an uncle by marriage in the Yakuza. Not to mention her husband's political power and good standing with the Italian mafia. Plus, Alex and Dimitri had a virtual meeting tomorrow with his father, and he didn't want Jessica there. Eventually, he'd have to tell her the truth about his family, but not yet. He wanted to squeeze out as much time as possible with her before he revealed she'd fallen in love with a monster and pray their bond was strong enough at that point to withstand the blow. Is okay, Princess Moya. He tucked a few silken strands of her hair behind her delicate ear. Buy whatever you want. I have already contacted my credit card companies. You have full use. I have my own money. Offended, he stared at her. You will not use your money. You will use mine. She glared at him before turning to Melanie and saying with a fake smile, Fine, then I'll just go and do some window shopping. What is that, window shopping? Laz said while smiling and raising a hand in greeting to someone sitting across the patio. Melanie laughed, the sun catching the huge diamond sparkling on her ring finger. It's when a woman only looks through windows at things she likes and doesn't buy anything. Shaking his head, Laz gave his wife a teasing smile. I do not know that word because my wife always buys. Alex could see Jessica getting geared up to argue with him over this. They needed to have a discussion about money, but not in front of his friends. So he stood and placed his napkin on his chair then held his hand out to Jessica. It has been so nice to see you again, but it has been a long day of traveling for us, and we both need to recuperate. Taking the hint, Melanie stood, kissed his cheeks, and then did the same with Jessica. She whispered something in Jessica's ear, and his girl giggled, then gave Melanie a decidedly naughty wink. Adorable. I will see you sometime this week. Smiling, Jessica slipped her hand into his. Absolutely. You have my cell number. Just text me the details. After they made their goodbyes, their vacated seats were immediately taken by people wishing to talk to the mayor and his wife. Alex pulled Jessica to his side and placed a kiss atop her head. She looked up at him, and he found himself drowning in her exotic gaze. You did good. She relaxed a little more as they made their way to the elevator. The hotel was busier now than when they checked in, and the noise level had increased due to the high ceilings. To her surprise, she noticed a larger variety of people now. Anyone who stayed there was wealthy, but that didn't mean they had class. A woman with obviously dyed red hair, dripping in tacky gold and sporting a huge amount of cleavage, sauntered up to wait for the elevator with them. She gave Alex a blatantly flirty smile, which he ignored. How could she possibly think he'd want her when he had Jessica baffled him? Once they were in the elevator, Alex stood behind Jessica with his arms wrapped around her, basically using her body as a barrier to keep the other woman away. This didn't seem to dissuade her much, and she kept staring at him. Thankfully, the woman left after a few floors with a disappointed pout, and Alex finally relaxed. Jessica snickered and patted his arm. There, the bad lady is gone. You can let go of me now. He laughed, glad she understood him so well, even if her perception was a little too good. It wouldn't be long before she'd start questioning him about things she would see or hear, things that would tip her off to the true nature of his world. The thought sobered him, and he silently led her out of the elevator. He worried about what he was going to say to her, but when she paused at the spot they'd made love earlier and gave him a shy smile, his mind was drawn back to the present. He'd never met anyone who could keep him grounded like this, and he found it to be extremely refreshing. Usually he was thinking about the future, trying to prepare for every threat that could be headed his way, but with Jessica, 
He enjoyed being with her so much he couldn't do anything but live in the moment. Especially when she was so close, so warm, alive, and his. Fuck, he was lost in her and couldn't bring himself to give a shit. He wondered if she knew how securely she had him wrapped around her finger. She didn't even know how special she was and had no idea yet of her power as a woman. She was young enough to still be curious and old enough to enjoy the intense pleasures he could offer her. A mental flash of her body writhing against him as he fucked her sizzled through him, and his dick tingled as it started to harden. Once they were in the foyer of their suite, she sighed, then tugged on his jacket. Hold still. She braced her hand on him, leaned down, took off first one shoe, then the other with a low groan while she wiggled her toes in the thick red carpet. Her bare feet were so tiny next to his, and he liked a rose-red toenail polish. Oh, God, so much better. You do not like the shoes? What? No, I love them. Are you kidding? Thanks to you, I now have seven pairs of the most beautiful, ridiculously expensive, amazing high heels and high-heeled boots I've ever seen in my closet. Dior, Fermani, Giuseppe Zatoni, Prada. Basically the rock stars of women's shoes. She gave a sigh that was close to the sound she made while he was deep inside of her. They're so pretty, Alex. I want to wear them all, which means I have to get used to high heels again. He knew better than to argue with her. Even if he didn't have a lot of experience in having a girlfriend, he had been with a lot of women who considered themselves fashion divas. It seemed like women worldwide liked their footwear. He certainly liked the way it looked on her. He looked down at her with a small smile. Are you tired? Very. Those drinks and all that good food knocked me out. Do you think we can take a nap? The gleam in her eyes clued him into the nature of the nap she wanted, as did her hard nipples pressing against her dress. Such sweet little tits and such beautiful nipples. He loved how they got rose red after he'd been rough with them. For a moment, he could taste her skin against his tongue, and his cock began to throb. The need to have her consumed him, but he refused to rush it again. This time they had a big bed, and he was going to use it to explore the beautiful body that had been hidden from him and denied to him for so long. Time to revel in the spoils of his delicious victory. Alex gently pushed her back. Go, wash up, and put on one of your nightgowns. I will be back in a few minutes. She stole a glance at him, and heat rushed through her when she saw the lusty gleam in his eyes. Okay. And Jessica? Yes? Make sure you cleanse your ass well, because I will have my tongue and fingers up it later. Chapter 14 Jessica reclined on the sumptuous crimson watered silk sofa, looking out the wide windows of the master bedroom that showed a skyline she could fall in love with. She couldn't wait to see the view tonight, all lit up and sparkling like a scene out of a fairy tale. Hell, she kind of felt like she was living in a fairy tale right now, a rather dirty one. She'd been taken from her normal, boring life and thrust into this world of class and elegance. Rome, for God's sake, with Alex, who seemed to adore her. It was all very surreal. She was still lazily musing about her situation when Alex came out of the bathroom, dressed in only a pair of black suit pants with the top button undone. Her gaze ever so slowly devoured him, from his dark, thick hair down to his firm lips, following the trail of hair on his chest, past the slabs of his pectorals, and down to where his dick strained against his pants. A rush of heat sizzled along her nerves, and she felt herself grow damp with want. Jessica, Alex said in a soft, chiding voice. Look at me, Princess Samoya. We need to discuss how your life will be from now on. That snapped her out of her erotic daydream, and she sat up straight, 
the silken lilac nightgown with its hip-high slits on either side sliding over her skin. And, because of her lack of curves, the straps almost fell off. Alex watched with great interest as her breast was almost revealed, showing the faintest hint of pink from her nipple. His admiration was enough to make her forget herself, but she wasn't sure she liked what Alex had just implied. Maybe it was a translation issue. What do you mean, how it will be? Do I get a choice in it? Absolutely, he responded at once. I will never take away your free will. I want you with me willingly, always. But you must know, you belong to me now. Uh, what? She frowned and tugged her top back in place, feeling like she needed to be clothed for this conversation. I don't belong to anyone. Wrong. He took a step closer, and her heart rate increased. You belong to me now, and I will cherish you always, but you are mine. Totally confused, she shook her head and looked down at the ground, then let loose with all the questions that had been piling up in her mind. I don't get it. How can I belong to you? Are we dating? What are we doing? Why am I here? Why did you bring me with you? What do you want from me? He crouched down in front of her at the edge of the sofa, sitting back on his haunches, his thigh muscles bulging. Unable to help it, she wrapped her legs around his waist and tugged him closer. Her pussy was in total control, and that little bitch had it bad for Alex. She also had to admit she felt so much better when touching him. Alex drew her like a magnet, and she couldn't be near him without wanting to feel him. All throughout brunch, he'd held her hand or stroked the exposed skin of her thigh, shoulder, neck, or her inner wrist. He'd stolen a few kisses, and each time, she'd flushed so hard her ears burned, which only amused those watching them. You belong to me because I am claiming you as mine. The world I live in is different, not what you are used to. The rules are different also, like fact that once man like me claims woman like you, it means you belong to me alone, and no one will dispute that fact. She went to ask him what the hell a man like him meant, but he cut her off by raising his hand. To answer next question, no, we are not dating. You are mine. Is more than being girlfriend, is being everything. He spoke louder as she opened her mouth. We are in Rome because I have business to do here, and I wanted to share with you. To see this place through your eyes, your wonder. I have so much to show you, but only if it is what you want. Never will I force you to do anything you do not wish. My greatest joy is for you to trust me enough to protect, to keep safe, and to let me take care of you. I want to give you everything you ever desire. Everything. This time, when he paused, she didn't interrupt him. Instead, she curled her fingers through his hair. And what I want in return. He leaned closer so they were nearly kissing as he spoke. Is you. All of you. Heart, soul, and body. I want to wake up with you whenever possible and fall asleep with you cuddled to my chest like kitten. Never have I felt happiness like I have with you. I did not know it was possible to feel like this. Emotion threatened to overwhelm her, and she took in a quick breath, her mouth moving before her mind caught up. Alex, what do you and Peter really do? You're asking for my trust, but I don't think you're telling me everything I need to know about you. You're obviously way more than a bodyguard. He froze, but didn't move away. His breathing increased against her lips, but he was otherwise calm. I cannot tell you. Yet. Irritated, she leaned back so she could study his face in the strong afternoon light. What? Why not? He closed his eyes and sat back, widening the gulf between them. 
I will tell you, eventually. I promise. But not now. Things must be dealt with. Things I do not wish for you to know. It's bad, isn't it? He hesitated. To some is bad. To some is life. So I'm just supposed to sit back and twiddle my thumbs until you decide it's time for me to know? She clenched her hands into fists and stared at him. Really? You talk about how much you cherish me, but you don't trust me with your secrets. A little hypocritical, don't you think? Jessica. The scary tone of his voice clued her in that she might have just really pissed him off. His next words confirmed it. I will tell you when I can, not because I play in game, but to protect you. It's hard for you to understand, but ignorance could save life. You are smart. You will figure things out. But I can confirm nothing until certain events happen. I swear, it's for own protection. I do trust you, more than I have ever trusted anyone outside of my family. Please, trust me. Blowing out a harsh breath, trying to ignore his scent clinging to her skin, she pushed up on her elbows, then frowned while tugging her top back into place. Whatever. Sounds like a total cop-out to me. What happened to you in Ellie, it will happen again if I do not keep you innocent. He leaned towards her, then ran his fingers through her hair with a soothing touch, the sudden fear filling her, probably easy to read. I will do anything to protect you, but I need you to be patient with me. Can you do that? She debated for a moment, then sighed. For how long? I do not know. Let me get this straight. You want us to basically move in together? For me to be your woman? But I don't get to know anything about you? Are you trying to hide me? Her heart plummeted. Oh shit, are you married? Is that why you didn't want the paparazzi taking pictures of us? Niet, I am not married. You are only woman I care for. Only woman I ever care for. You know much about me, Jessica. Feel deep in heart. You met my brother, my friends, and we had public lunch in very public place with two people the paparazzi love to photograph. I would never be ashamed of you. I'm proud to have you on my arm, love to show the world the beauty that is mine. She tried to ignore the warm tingle his words gave her. People took pictures of us? No doubt there are images of you and I on internet by now. He gave her a bitter smile. I am not unknown. Great, she muttered, her gaze tracing over his tattoos, both new and old. Jessica, all I ask for is time in Rome be about us, to learn each other before I move you into my home. Home? What home? You mean move to Minsk with you? Irritated, she frowned at him. How do you know I want to live with you? Loskovaya. I know you better than you know yourself. And no, not Minsk. We buy home in Ireland, or in America, if is what you want. Jessica, you know what is between us is special. You know you want to be mine as much as I want to be yours. God, you can be such an arrogant prick sometimes, she huffed out, trying to ignore the warm, squishy feelings filling her at the tender tone in his voice. The edges of his lips curved upward, and she had to bite back a sigh at the way his eyes grew heavy-lidded. I have studied you, what you like and what you do not. What? We have talked great deal, and you have told me many things about you. Things I remember. He smiled and leaned down, giving her a kiss on the nose that increased the tingling buzz of happiness that kept trying to spin through her. And I told you more about myself than I have ever shared with another woman. She snorted and had to bite back a smile. Okay, so she liked the fact that she was different from the other women he'd been with, and he trusted her with personal thoughts and feelings. She'd done the same with him. Damn, he did know a lot about her because they'd been friends for months before becoming lovers. You're my friend, she whispered 
her heart threatening to burst with the intensity of her feelings. Puzzled, he pursed his lips. More than friend. No, no, I know that. What I meant is I do trust you, Alex, because you're right. I do know you, sort of. I know that you hate sunflower seeds because one of your tutors chewed them and constantly had the husk in his teeth. I know that your first dog was a Dalmatian, and you love the scent of apples. He laughed unexpectedly. I love the smell of apples because it's what you wear. Your scent is like baked apples with spice. She flushed. Oh, yeah. It's just some cheap stuff I got at the mall. To her surprise, he cupped her chin and made her look at him as he lowered himself onto her body, his weight pressing her into the cushions. Nothing about you is cheap. Everything you touch, everything you wear, becomes exquisite because of you. Her lower lip quivered while he gently ran his thumb over her bruised cheek. Thanks. I think I should show you now how delicious you are. Your skin is so smooth I could spend all day petting you, stroking you. Sometime we will go to my home in Siberia. I will lock us in my room with roaring fire to keep us warm, then fuck you until you beg me to stop. I will give you so many orgasms your body will not be able to take it, and you will faint. This, I promise. Ah, uh, well, that wasn't the most eloquent response, but he'd struck her dumb with his carnal words. The faint lines around his eyes deepened. Relax, Jessica. We do this, as you Americans say, one day at a time. Yes? Closing her eyes, unable to handle the intensity of his gaze, she tried to process their conversation, but her body was more interested in having him inside of her again. He shifted slightly, his thick erection pressing into her mound, one twitch of her hips, and now his dick was sliding against her, separated only by his thin pants and her practically non-existent panties. All attempts to focus on anything but enjoying his touch fled when he groaned, then rubbed his hips in a circle against her needy sex. His voice was strained as he whispered, Jessica, the things you do to me. She ran her fingers through his hair, luxuriating in the lush feel of it against her skin, her heart rate slowing as she took in deep breaths. This brought a hint of his cologne to her and she leaned forward to rub her nose against his. He didn't respond verbally, but he did give her a slow, sexy smile when she pulled back. Her whole body ached for him, but she had calmed down enough that she could kinda, sorta think. Before she got carried away again, she took a deep breath, glad to see some of the tension gone from Alex's face. In her heart of hearts, she had a feeling that what Alex and Peter did wasn't exactly legal. It was such an absurd thought, she kept rejecting it. But she was also pretty sure she was in some serious denial. She noticed little things, discrepancies that had caught her attention, like the fact that no one treated Alex like a bodyguard. Oleg, Luca, and Mox, yes. But when Alex was with her, people were deferential to him. She was so googly-eyed over him she didn't notice it at first, but once she'd relaxed around him, she saw that Alex was given preferential treatment all the time. Of course, people kissed her ass because her Uncle Peter was in politics. There was no reason for Alex to have the kind of notoriety like he did. People knew who he was and were afraid of him. Probably for a good reason. But she wasn't. Probably never would be. Something deep inside her belly settled, and a sense of acceptance filled her. She smiled at him, a slow curve of her lips that seemed to coax his mouth into tipping up at the corners. She loved that about him, that he couldn't help responding to her smile. It gave her a heady sense of power to realize she made this broody, dangerous man happy. No man had ever responded to her like Alex did, and despite their differences, 
They blended together just right. I've come to a decision. She brushed his dark hair off his forehead, keeping her gaze on her fingers. I would love to spend time in Rome, Alex. There is nowhere in the world I'd rather be than with you. Just be patient with me, okay? You're a global playboy, but I'm still new to all of this. And promise me you won't keep me in the dark forever. That you'll tell me the truth. I swear to you, Jessica. I will tell you as soon as I can. He held her hand, then brought it to his lips and kissed her knuckles, his facial hair tickling her skin. You have nothing to worry about. I know you do not understand now. You are young, but you will. That took away some of her happy glow. Stop with that too young bullshit. I'm old enough for you to fuck, aren't I? His jaw twitched, but his amused smirk irritated her. Yes, perhaps I need to fuck you more. I think you are a woman with vast sexual appetites, tastes for things you do not even know you crave, things that I will teach you. Her mind skipped back to the overheard conversations about Alex's fondness for being dominant in the bedroom. What kind of things? Her body was tired of his teasing talk, and she wanted him to slip that wonderful dick he kept teasing her with into her wet pussy. She felt tender down there, more sensitive, her arousal driven to the point that she was going to fingerfuck herself soon if he didn't do something. Her hips tilted up of their own accord to grind against him, and his nostrils flared. He captured her other hand and brought it to his lush lips, kissing the veins visible in her wrist through her pale skin. Anything you want to do, Jessica, any pleasure you want to explore, tell me. I want you to be honest about what turns you on. We will only do what you want, but I will ask for your trust to push you a little bit, to expand your horizons. She bit her lower lip knowing there was no way in hell she'd tell Alex about some of the kinkier fantasies she'd had. Yeah, an orgy was fun to imagine, but to actually do? Dirty, explicit mental images of fucking Alex while people fucked around them and watched set her body on fire, and moisture welled between her legs. Thank goodness Alex was kinky, because it looked like she was as well. Looking up at Alex, she bit her lower lip, then whispered, Okay, I'll tell you. Okay. He smirked. Did not sound very convincing. She resisted the urge to squirm beneath his gaze. What? His grin was downright wicked as he said, We going to play interrogation. Chapter 15 Jessica pushed her hair off her face trying to see if he was serious. What? He stood abruptly, hauled her up, and tossed her over his shoulder with her ass in the air and her face against his back. Alex! Hush, my captured spy. You need to know this now. In bedroom, I like complete control. That does not mean we will not play your games or I will not indulge your curiosity, but I own you, and that includes your pleasure. You are mine. She was starting to feel the whole you are mine thing arousing. But she wasn't going to tell him that. He couldn't just haul her around and demand things of her. And if she didn't want to tell him, that was none of his business. The thought didn't even make sense to her. And she sighed, then watched the floor pass as he hauled her to the bedroom. Before he set her down on the bed, he gave her butt a slap. She yelped and glared at him when he gave her nipple a tweak. Stop that! The lines around his mouth disappeared as a smile dropped from his face. You need safe word. What? She rubbed her sore nipple, trying not to acknowledge how strangely good it felt, as her palm soothed the hard tips. You say word, we stop what we are doing and talk. Will allow me to push your boundaries. Is word you would not normally use in sex, so if I hear, I know you are troubled. She considered her boundaries pretty wide, 
so she didn't put up a fight. If he wanted to give her a safe word, that was fine. The very fact that they would need something like that made her nervous, but she wasn't going to chicken out now. Butter. He frowned. Butter? Yes. Her breath hitched when he reached out and flicked her nipple. Hard. On your back, Jessica. Feet on the edge of the bed with knees up, legs spread wide. She balked, unused to anyone being so direct with her during sex. Looking up at him, she did as he asked, glad the nightgown slid between her legs and covered her sex. Although by the look on Alex's face, that flimsy fabric wouldn't be there for long. He shed his pants, leaving himself clad in only a pair of tight, dark gray boxer briefs with his erection plain to see. Arousal lit her nerves, making her nipples pucker up into painful points. He was so built, including his cock. There was something deliciously obscene about the way he filled out his underwear. The fact that his hard shaft stretched the fabric, outlining him perfectly. A damp spot darkened the fabric at the head of his cock, and her belly clenched with need. He was big, so big. Yeah, she'd been with endowed men before, but Alex was thick. He was long enough that he went deep, but it was his girth that made her breath catch. She fisted the soft blue comforter beneath her at the memory of the burn as he stretched her. Sunlight shone around the edges of the closed curtain, slices of illumination that graced his spectacular body. She loved the way his muscles moved, smooth shifts beneath his skin that drew her eye and had her yearning to touch him. Instead of moving between her legs like she'd anticipated and hoped, he stretched out next to her. The bed creaked slightly as it absorbed his weight. There was an indulgent look in his eyes she'd glimpsed before, an incredible tenderness focused totally on her. He spread her hair over to the side, pausing for a moment to thread his fingers through the silky mass. Her nipples tightened until she was ready to lean up and rub her breasts on his chest. She was soaked and so ready for him. Krasavitsa, he murmured. I'm lucky to have found you before you realized how beautiful you are. She sucked in her lower lip and tried to look away, but his hand on her chin made her face him. Um, thanks. He smiled and rubbed his thumb over her lip, making her release a soft sigh. You do not believe me, but you will. One day, you realize I am right. I will help you see your beauty. Looking at his thumb, she enjoyed the way his hips pushed against her, flexing the tight muscles of his belly. Pulling his thumb from her mouth, he ran it down her neck, over her chest, and almost to the peak of her breast. A shiver ran through her, and she marveled at how her body responded to everything he did. She was by no means a virgin, but she'd never felt the sexual intensity she experienced with Alex. To her disappointment, he merely moved the top of her nightgown enough to expose her nipples, but didn't do anything more than stare at them. She started to reach for him, but he shook his head. Hands at sides. Of course, her first instinct was to snark back. You're so bossy. He chuckled. Some day I will spank you for that remark. Make you stand against wall wearing those incredibly sexy shoes that you had on and turn your delicate ass pink. I do not want to bruise you, so my touch will be highly controlled. And I guarantee you will come over my cock while screaming my name. However, I will also take you over my knee at some point, maybe in front of a group of people, and spank you like filthy girl you are. So dirty, so kind, so sweet. It pleases me to know you will try some of my darker desires, that I get to warm your ass with my hand, watch it bounce with each hit, and your pussy will be dripping wet when I fuck you. Oh, 
Her breath came out in a soft sigh, not only from the mental image of Alex taking her over his knee for being naughty, but also because his free hand had reached her hips and was slowly exploring the skin of her inner thigh. She wiggled, squeezing her thighs and sending bursts of warmth from her sex to her lower belly. A soft moan escaped her when he tweaked her nipple hard enough to sting. Be still. It was impossible to keep her hands to herself, with a nearly naked Alex stretched out next to her. When his calloused fingers slipped beneath her panties, they were so close to her clit that they barely grazed her. Her hips twitched up, silently begging for his touch where she needed it most. Another brush, whisper soft over the hood of her swollen nub. His soft laughter made her grit her teeth. Alex, please. I told you, be still. But her words were cut off when he gave her a sharp slap right on her pussy, the pain stunning her before an equally strong wave of pleasure made her whimper with need. Be still. What the hell? Before she could go off, he pinched her clit, then began to rub his thumb ever so gently on the fully exposed tip. Shh, let me take care of you, Princess Amoya. I need to give you the sweet before the bitter. Her lips parted to question his odd word choice, but instead a thick, heated moan rose from her. Alex had such skill in pleasuring a woman. A small part of her was irritated by how he'd gotten so good at it, but he was hers now. At least he said he was. And she wasn't going to let the past ruin the moment. She was beginning to understand the term living in the now. Alex rubbed his thumb on her almost too sensitive nub with just the right amount of pressure and sent her body convulsing into an orgasm. The pleasure struck out of nowhere and she arched violently, writhing as she begged him to fuck her. She didn't care if it was his fingers, tongue, or cock. She needed to be filled. Take me. The words had scarcely left her lips before the tip of his shaft pressed into her, drawing out her climax. Her pussy gladly milked his cock, the orgasm extending, while he slid gently in and out. His movements were languid, easing her down until she stopped twitching from overstimulation and relaxed around his dick. When her body finally unclenched, he hissed out a breath and pulled almost all the way out until only the bulbous tip stretched her entrance. You will make me embarrass myself with your strong pussy. She reached up and cupped his cheek, enjoying the way he nuzzled against her hand as he began to move a little faster, his gaze growing darker. So tight that I can barely move in you, and when you release... He shuddered a topper and leaned down to lick at her nipple. I want to pierce these, and your clit. That thought cleared her mind enough for her to gasp out, Pierce them? With a low growl, he pulled out only long enough to flip her over onto her belly, before surging back into her wet, welcoming warmth. Beautiful, delicate gold hoops would look so stunning and would increase your capacity for pleasure. Her body sure liked that idea, because heat flashed through her, and her pussy contracted, earning her a groan. Turns out doing kegel muscle exercises paid off. Guess that women's magazine was onto something after all. Jessica did kegel exercises because it improved the strength of her orgasms. The more tension, the greater the climax. Giving Jessica an experimental squeeze, Alex froze, then slapped her ass. Relax. The heat of his smack only made her sex clasp him harder, as an involuntary wave of tingling pleasure danced along her nerves. His hands felt huge as they rubbed her heated bottom. You will bruise easily. I will take care how hard I hit you. She let out a soft moan as his cock hit a new angle inside of her. Please don't. Do to me whatever you want. I trust you to make it good for me. 
His jaw clenched, and his hips pushed forward until he was filling her, deep enough that it stung, burned, felt amazing. I do not have to hit you to make it hurt. Rolling her hips, she moaned and moved her body so his cock rubbed her G-spot just right. That intense bolt of sensation made her toes curl, made her wanton. She didn't want Alex controlled above her. She wanted him to fuck her, now. She began to rock back against him, squeezing tight when he was all the way in and relaxing on the slide out. It actually heightened her own pleasure as well to grip him internally. Made his already substantial cock feel huge. Alex went perfectly still behind her, the soft cloth of his pants rubbing against her thighs. Her clit actually twitched as she froze, undone by the command in his voice. Even now, in bed, with his dick buried in her, he radiated an authority she secretly loved. People were wary of him, deferential, and he acted like it was his due. Except with her, he was protective, possessive, and seemed to delight in her happiness. She was falling, or maybe had already fallen, in love with him. Her whole body clenched, and she yelped when he thrust in hard enough to bring back that internal sting, his dick stretching her while her pussy resisted the intrusion. I said, do not move. She whimpered, drawn from her thoughts by the overwhelming sensation of his cock making her ache, the sweat on his skin scenting the air and mixing with the musk of sex. He was a total tactile experience, from the rough brush of the hair on his legs against hers to the magnificent body built for fighting. She blindly reached out and clasped his hand, holding it tight. I'll try, she whispered. He went down on one elbow, still filling her, and moved her hair over to the side so he could kiss and nibble her neck. His voice was thick and raspy as he growled. There are some things you should know about me, Jessica. Some kinks that I have that may be new to you. Understand that even if you do not want to do something, it does not mean I do not want you or I will be disappointed. Only means is off the table for us. Confused by the arousal still coursing through her, thanks to his gently rocking hips and the need to pay attention, she gently shoved against him so she could roll over onto her back. As soon as she did, he moved back between her legs. They both gasped as he filled her once again. Giving her a challenging look, he said, I like other men and women to watch me fuck you, to see the beauty that is mine, to covet you. Seeing you come is a sight to behold, skin flushed, lips swollen, and your nipples begging for my lips. The mental image was so instant, so hot, that she couldn't help her body's reaction. When her pussy spasmed, he chuckled, then nipped at her skin, earning another squeeze. I would also like to watch a woman touch you, taste you, watch you come in her mouth while I play with your perfect tits. Her breath caught at how downright naughty that was, and her hips pressed up into him. The thought of being with a woman while he watched was a little intimidating, and a lot hot. Her imagination conjured images of some pretty blonde woman licking between her legs, while Alex fucked her mouth. Mm, Princess Moya, you never fail to please me. I also want to watch a man touch you, taste you, make you climax. She shivered beneath him, being seduced by his dark talk as his movements began to speed up, drawing her mind back to her body. Maybe I watch him fuck you. Her heart skipped a beat at that one, unsure if she liked the idea or not. It felt too close to cheating, and she would never do that. Ever. Not yet. Alex mused. But the desire is there. Before she could protest, he reached between them, his fingers stroking her mound just above her pulsing clit, their harsh breathing breaking the quiet of their bedroom, along with the occasional car horn from outside. 
while they lounged in bed, the world outside their room continued on, and she found the idea of spending the rest of the afternoon making love with Alex was exactly what she wanted. Her heart lurched as she stared up into his eyes, her fingertips grazing his face as he rocked slowly in and out of her. His body covered hers without crushing her. He easily held himself above her on strong arms, the muscles bulging enticingly while he made love to her. She gave him a small smile, and his breath came out in a low rush, an almost pain sound. Then she kissed him, the gentle strokes of her lips meant to soothe his pain. Perfect, he whispered. She laid back, her hands still wrapped around his muscular neck. I am lucky man. Her reply was lost when he did a twisting thing with his hips that hit her deep inside, just right. A sharp burst of delicious sensation exploded from her belly out, and she cupped her breasts, rolling her thumbs over her nipples. He groaned, and she opened her eyes, watching him while she toyed with her breasts. I will tie you up, flog you, fuck you, and make you orgasm so many times you pass out. Then I will fuck you some more, in front of room full of people, your submission to me on display for them, the warmth of your passion warming their bodies, even though they can only look, not touch, without my permission. I will clamp your nipples, then your clit, special made jewelry for your pretty cunt. I cannot decide if I want to put gold or platinum on you. He traced his fingertips lightly over her chest. Maybe pearls. Her body was too busy chasing her orgasm to filter her thoughts as she whispered, Clamps? Won't that hurt? Yes. His grin was anything but reassuring, more sinister promise than anything else. But I will make it so good for you. Their gazes met, and she forgot how to breathe. Too caught up in Alex's passion, his desperate need for her, and in the way he stared at her like he could never get enough of looking at her. It was all there in his eyes, plain as day, and she knew he loved her, maybe as much as she loved him. She wrapped her legs around his waist and cupped his face in her hands, trying to touch as much of him as she could. The corner of his lips twitched in a smile before he leaned down and kissed the sweet spot behind her ear. Perfect for me, Jessica, he whispered. This feeling I have for you, it consumes me. You are everything to me. Ljubljutebja vsem sertsem vse dushu. He ground his pelvis against hers, hitting her clit just right and making her scream out his name. The taste of his salt filled her mouth as their lips met, his kiss devouring her as she shuddered against him. Her release was building in her, almost there, and it was going to be so very, very big. Come for me. Grip my cock, my filthy girl. Just like that, electricity raced through her nervous system, tensing all her muscles, and she bit his shoulder hard when her orgasm crashed over her. Alex let out a startled bellow and ground himself into her body while he came inside of her. She could feel each pulse of his cock, and he twitched and groaned as she writhed beneath him, her overstimulated pussy tightening every time he surged into her. Once he was finally wrung out, he collapsed next to her and let out a weak chuckle, his hot breath warming the sweat on her face. Damn. Sex with Alex was awesome. Super awesome. Her hormone-saturated brain couldn't think of anything greater than that. Hell, she was struggling to breathe. I think your greedy pussy sucked me dry. Fuck. Floating in bliss, she turned her head to look at him and smiled. Yep. He blinked, then began to laugh, and pulled her to him arranging her so her cheek rested on his chest, his lips against her hair. This seemed to be the spot he liked. She went to curl into him, but felt a bit of him seeping out and grimaced. 
there was no way she was sleeping in a wet spot. When she tried to move, he grumbled. Stay. I have to clean up. He opened one lazy eye. Shower. Bring back washcloth with you. I want you to clean me, then suck me, then ride me. She hurried to the bathroom, eager to enjoy every moment she had with Alex. Chapter 16 Early the next morning, just as the sun was rising, she woke up and couldn't go back to sleep. Blah, traveling always sapped her energy. That, and being Alex's fuck toy last night. He'd used her every way he saw fit, and then some. She loved it all, wanted more, and sucked his cock back to hardness more than once, just so she could feel the bliss of him entering her body. She sighed, the scent of sex still heavy in the air. They should really open a window. If the cleaning ladies came in here, the pheromones might kill them. And if Alex was still asleep next to her when the unsuspecting staff opened the door, they'd get a glimpse of a world-class, perfect ass that any woman in her right mind would want to grope. The temptation to touch him filled her, and she grinned at the sight of her teeth marks on one of his perfect ass cheeks. Alex had become rough and growly at one point, pinning her over and over again as she tried to fight him off. It was pretend, of course, but she loved the freedom he'd given her to really try and give it her all, without fear of hurting him. The moment when she'd finally given in, exhausted and panting beneath him, he'd slide slowly and gently, if such a thing was possible for a man of his girth, into her. Her sex began to tingle, then ache in protest. She was ridden hard last night, for sure and she rode him hard a couple times as well, which might have something to do with her jello legs. Before she moved out of bed, she leaned over and whispered in Alex's ear, I have to use the bathroom. I'll be back. He lazily opened one eye, and when his sleepy gaze found her face, he smiled. You will not run away again. Unable to resist, she leaned forward on her sore arms and placed a kiss on his forehead. I can't run anywhere right now. My body has been well used. The smug look he gave her irritated her, even if it was well deserved. She'd finally found a man with a sexual appetite to match her own. But goodness, her body was not ready to fulfill her greed for him. Even her mouth was sore from endless kissing, and she wondered if her lips looked as swollen as they felt. Take bath. In my bag, there is clear glass jar with some bath salts. Use that. It's special mixture I have for sore body. His words were thick with sleep. She smiled, then leaned back and pulled the comforter over him. Thanks. Leaving him to get some more rest, she wobbled to the master bathroom, sighing with delight. It was the most beautiful bathroom she'd ever been in, and she was totally in love with it. Gleaming bronze marble, antique brass accents, coupled with some of the most beautiful mosaic work done in turquoise and gold. Unusual and gorgeous. The marble bath was deep, and she grinned when she noticed there were two taps for filling the tub up. It was that big. After turning the water on, she stumbled over to the vanity and brushed her teeth, and her stomach growled. She thought that maybe she should eat first but she felt grungy. Their energetic bouts of sex had often resulted in both of them collapsing in a sweaty heap. A quiver of arousal tightened her nipples, and she winced and looked down. Alex had mauled her poor breasts, and she could see his bite mark on the side of her cleavage near her heart. Shit, it hurt to touch it. She should be a little more pissed off at him for bruising her like this, but she'd bitten him worse. His yelp, then growl, had been sexy enough that she tempted him into taking her again. Groaning, she rinsed off quickly in the shower before eyeing the tub. It was more than half full, and she figured that was good enough for her. Steam rose into the air, 
swirling in the diffused light coming into the smoked glass windows. The bath salts smelled like Alex's cologne, and she sank into the water slowly, her body protesting every shift. Man, she needed to take up yoga and start doing cardio. Then again, she could keep having energetic sex with Alex and be in the best shape of her life. She could probably start a new exercise craze, the Nympho Workout. That thought made her giggle as she relaxed her head back on the awesome padded headrest things on either end of the tub. The space was large enough that even stretched out her full length. Her feet didn't touch the other edge of the tub, and she floated. It was absolute heaven, and she let out a grateful moan as her muscles began to relax. The heat seeped into her, calming her as she lazily kept watch on the rising water level. She must have closed her eyes at some point, because the water shut off, the sudden absence of noise startling her out of her doze. Before she could freak out, Alex had her in his arms, pulling her to the side of the tub with him. He reclined back on the padded surface, then pulled her to him so she was floating in his arms, with her back to his front. Too comfortable to protest, she merely gave in to his hold and sighed. This feels so good. His cock twitched beneath her at her breathy tone, and she snorted. If you think you're putting that thing in me anytime soon, you're crazy. I used you rough, he whispered against her neck. I'm sorry I lost control. Don't be. I loved it. No one has ever given me their passion like you do. It's addicting. Good. I want you addicted to me. He kissed her neck. Room service will be here soon. There are a selection of clothes that have been brought in for you to choose from. What? He smiled as he ran his hand over her face, his touch light and perfect. One of my friends is here, Nico, with his girlfriend, Katrin, who is a world-renowned stylist, though she is retired now from the fashion industry. She is familiar with the events we are going to, so she will be able to help you find something for those occasions. Oh. Apprehension filled her at the thought of leaving Alex's side. Are you coming with us? Niet, Princess Samoya. I have business. Oh. Is this business dangerous? No more than usual. She looked at him with narrowed eyes. That's not very reassuring. She expected him to be irritated. Instead, he gently kissed her bruised cheek. I think the sex is good for you. Mark on cheek has faded. She'd noticed that when she brushed her teeth, but she wouldn't let him distract her. Can you at least tell me if the woman I'm going with is safe? Katrin is the beloved of Niko Tetskin, an old friend of mine who was raised in a rough ghetto in northern Russia. First generation Russian. His parents had been brought there from Somalia as workers to fish the barren sea. His father died in storm out at sea, leaving behind Nico, his mother, and his three sisters. Was not good. Nico clawed his way out of ghetto, took care of his family, and now owns one of the best pharmaceutical businesses in the world. Is good man. Does much charity work. Is how he met Katrin. He got out, and she followed suit, wrapping her hair up in a towel while he dried her off, his touch lingering. She patted her hair and watched him admire her body as he dried it. And how did they meet? Katrin's father is boring politician who needed to kiss Nico's ass. They were at one of those dull dinners that seemed to never end, and according to Nico, his eyes met Katrin's across the table, and that was it. He was in love. She couldn't stop the flush that burned the tips of her ears. Love at first sight, huh? Avoiding his gaze, she went into the bedroom and smiled at the sight of three different, lovely outfits on the bed. She dismissed the bright green dress, feeling like she'd glow as she walked down the street, and focused on the remaining two. Alex moved around behind her while she studied the clothes. After her brunch yesterday among Italy's most beautiful people, she had a newfound appreciation for fashion. Of course, 
She'd watch those brain candy fashion shows on TV, but it was a little different looking at it on the screen and seeing it spread out in a bed. The dress on the left was a classic cream strapless sundress. It was fitted through the bodice with a sweetheart neckline lined in yellow ribbon and flared out a bit at the hips. There was an underskirt of yellow silk and a pair of awesome red leather wedge sandals. The dress on the right was a pretty purple confection with lots of embellishments, a little too fancy for her taste. The heels with that dress were stilettos, and she did not want to walk the streets of Rome in those torture devices. The wedges were tall, but they wouldn't kill her feet as much, and she was less likely to fall. She hoped. With her decision made, she began to get dressed, smiling at the sight of the lacy white panties and strapless bra that went with the dress. Thankfully, her hair would dry pin straight, but she tried to smooth it down as she brushed it back, then twisted it up, digging through her makeup bag to find more hairpins while Alex talked on the phone. By the time he was finished, she was slipping in her small gold hoop earrings, a birthday gift from her best friend. Homesickness tightened her stomach for a moment, at the thought of how much she needed to tell her best friend about how her world had changed, how it had become an exciting and frightening place that she sometimes didn't recognize. Jessica, Alex whispered, and she let out a soft sigh at their reflections in the mirror. He stood behind her, and she came up to just under his chin without her heels on. His broad shoulders framed her body. The softness of his black suit jacket brushed against her, and she once again marveled at how debonair he looked. The black and yellow tie he wore complimented her dress, and she wondered if he'd done it on purpose. He bent down and pressed his lips to the side of her throat, lightly licking her skin and causing pleasure to spark through her. You have a beautiful neck, graceful and elegant, like ballerina. She giggled, the compliment making her both uncomfortable and happy. Thanks. You have a beautiful everything, big and hard like a sex god. That made him chuckle, and she beamed at him, enjoying the open happiness on his usually guarded face. There was a knock on the door, and as soon as she smelled the food... She was starving. They ate quickly, almost wolfing down their breakfast. By the time she drank the last of her coffee, she was full and sleepy. Alex smiled at her from across the table. I like that look on you. What look? Pleased. Content. He frowned momentarily. It's hard to find word, so I explain. It is plain for any man to see when he looks at you that you are happy to be my woman, that I am taking care of you and providing for you, that I am doing my job of being your man. It is important to me that you are satisfied, content. If men who wanted you were to see you upset, he might think he could lure you away. Alex, no one is going to try to lure me away. He shrugged. Besides, when I see you like this, it makes me feel good inside. She reached behind her and touched the rough hair of his goatee. You don't need to go to all these crazy lengths to make me happy, Alex. The only thing I want is you. He kissed her wrist. Come, you make me forget myself. I take you somewhere special. The rapid thunder of her pulse filled Jessica's head as they stood before an elegant store not too far from their hotel, down the Spanish steps, and off on one of the side streets. The building she stared at was made of a cream stone, with three amazing brass-lined arches splitting up the facade. The window on her left held glittering diamond necklaces and bracelets, each exquisite and amazing. The window on her right displayed what looked like an emerald jewelry suite with stones bigger than her thumbnail in the necklace and earrings. The marble arch in the center led to the front doors of the famous Bulgari jewelry store. What the hell were they doing here? Her apprehension must have registered with Alex, or he noticed that she was frozen in place. Jessica? Behind her, Mox took a step closer, his eyes, covered by sunglasses, 
constantly scan the crowd that flowed around them. He was also in a perfectly tailored gray suit that set off his red hair nicely and clung to his lean frame. She had to admit, it was enjoyable being surrounded by so much male yumminess. They were in some crazy high-end shopping district, and she was very glad she had dressed up. Gorgeous women strutted their stuff left and right, their swaying walk meant to entice the male eye, while their haughty expression told men to back off. Look, but don't touch. Until they caught sight of Alex, their gazes would warm as they took him in. He ignored them and kept his attention focused on her, more specifically, on anyone near her. Ahead of them, Crom played advance guard, while one of Uncle Peter's men made sure they weren't being followed. It was crazy. It was excessive, but if she was being honest, it also brought a welcome sense of safety. Jessica? Alex asked again, with a little more concern in his tone. What are we doing here? He took in her expression, and the corners of his lips curled up. She noticed that when they were out in public among strangers, he rarely, if ever, smiled. The most she got, usually, was a small twist of his lips. His don't-fuck-with-me vibe was out in full force, seemingly strong enough to dissuade anyone from getting near her. But as he slipped off his sunglasses and put them in his pocket, his gunmetal gray eyes softened to silver while his gaze roamed her face. If I told you, would not be surprised. As they approached the front doors, they were held open by a tall, well-built Italian man who was almost as stone-faced as Alex. Definitely hired muscle. As soon as they were inside, an elegantly dressed brunette woman in her early forties escorted them back to what looked like a private room. She chatted with Alex in Italian while Mox trailed behind them. The lovely scent of lilacs flavored the air, and Jessica noticed a big silver vase on a small table stuffed full of purple and white lilacs artfully arranged with some greens. The woman took them through yet another door and down a short hallway where she opened a door to the left. Once they reached the well-appointed room, Jessica focused on the two comfortable cream leather chairs that had been set before a desk with a pristine black velvet mat. Beautiful classic art graced two of the walls, pastoral scenes that were a soothing blend of colors. A bottle of champagne had been opened and chilled in an ice bucket, along with two glasses and some beautiful strawberries. Jessica was contemplating whether or not she should have a drink. After all, it would go to waste if she didn't, when she heard Alex say her name. Calming the butterflies in her stomach, she turned and smiled, the tilt of her lips becoming genuine when she saw Alex gazing warmly at her, but faded a bit when she noticed they had unexpected company. Next to Alex stood an enormous man with the build of a bulldozer. His nose had been broken more than once, and he reeked of danger. It was only when she looked into his really pretty teal-blue eyes that she noticed he was dressed in a suit as nice as Alex's, and that he was giving her an appreciative look that made heat prickle in her lower belly. She couldn't help but lower her gaze and bit her lower lip, an action that made Alex chuckle. Ivan, she likes you. What is there not to like? Ivan remarked with a slow smile. Goodness, he was handsome in a non-traditional way. No, not handsome. Memorable. She tried to keep her heart from racing, but with Alex and this Ivan guy staring at her, she could almost feel their hot looks like a physical touch. The only consolation over her fluttering pulse was that the uber-professional woman who worked here also looked a little glassy-eyed and stunned as she stared at the men. Not that Jessica could fault her. The chance of seeing two guys this striking together in a lifetime was rare. At least it was in Iowa. Then again, all of Alex's friends that she'd met were hot. Even his bodyguards. Well, except for Oleg because that was just ew, since he was kind of like an uncle to her now. But the rest were pretty fine in their own different ways. Lovely, isn't she? Alex murmured in English. Stunning. Ivan gave her a little incline of his head. 
It is a pleasure to meet you, Jessica. My name is Ivan, and I have known this bastard next to me for as long as I can remember. He does not deserve you. To her surprise, Ivan's English was excellent. I, that is, thank you, I think. But trust me, when I say if anyone is unworthy, it's me. Alex is wonderful. Alex frowned, but before he could say anything, Ivan chuckled and looked at his friend with a raised brow. Lucky bastard. Sweet and charming, with beautiful legs I would like wrapped around me. Instead of being pissed, Alex seemed proud. His shoulders straightened and his chest puffed out as the men chuckled and said something to each other in Russian. She was quickly realizing he liked showing her off, like she was the treasured prize in some mighty conquest. There was a definite possessive gleam in his eyes, yet he seemed almost pleased that Ivan was openly devouring her with his gaze. The fact that this was taking place in the most elegant of establishments only made her body heat faster. So forbidden. So taboo. So hot. Come here, Princess Samoya. Alex purred. The carpet softened her footsteps as she went to him, taking his hand when he held it out to her. He pulled her to his side in a blatantly possessive move. As if to reinforce this, his hand slipped around her waist, his fingers resting on her hip. Ivan took all of this in with an amused look, and she could see Mox across the room trying to hide a smirk. It was good to see him smiling again. For a while there, she thought he was going to be stuck in a constant, pissed-off, I-failed-you angst mode. That attitude would have driven her nuts. Alex looked over at the saleswoman, openly observing them with great interest. Bring me the first two sets from her collection. The woman blinked at his curt tone, then scurried off. Jessica frowned up at Alex. What collection? I had a line of your own jewelry started. Unique pieces that you can pass down to your children. Things that will become treasures they will cherish as the years pass. Alex, that's outrageous. She could feel her eyes grow wide, and Alex frowned when she squeaked out, You can't do that. I can do whatever I want, Jessica. She opened her mouth to argue, but he silenced her with a kiss, then whispered against her lips. Let me do this for you. It brings me pleasure. But it's too much. I don't want you thinking I'm using you for your money. He laughed against her mouth. Jessica, I believe you. I know many, many women that are gold diggers. You are nothing like them. Let me spoil you. Please. Before she could respond, he proceeded to kiss her into a near stupor, sucking on her lips, biting her tongue, mauling her in the most delicious way. By the time he eased off, she was swaying with her hand pressed to her lips. They were tender to touch, but she could still taste him. Will you let me do this for you? Completely dazzled by his kiss, she nodded slowly and murmured, Okay. Ivan laughed, then patted Alex on the shoulder. You will have your hands full with this one, but I think you will be all right. She narrowed her eyes at Ivan, but before she could say anything, the saleswoman returned with two middle-aged men. Each of them carried a small stack of boxes, some long, some square, and a couple small ones. A tremor ran through her, and she fought the urge to flee when they set the boxes down on the table to the left of the square of black velvet. She had a feeling Alex had done something extravagant, outrageous even, and she swallowed hard. Ivan cleared his throat. Jessica, it was my pleasure to meet you. I am glad to see reason behind my friend's happiness. Be good to him, yes? Still dazed by the sight of all those boxes, she nodded, her gaze darting between Ivan and Alex, who now sat in one of the chairs in front of the black velvet table. He didn't look uncomfortable in the least. No, he was the master of his world, in control of every situation. Once again, the clerks were kissing his ass as they waited on her. That only made her more nervous, and she almost jumped when something cold and smooth was put in her hand. 
Ivan wrapped his big hand over hers to hold a full champagne glass in her hand. She noticed the scars on his knuckles. Yep, definitely a fighter. Big time, by the looks of it. Drink. Ivan prompted. There was something about him that reminded her of Alex, an intangible force that compelled her to drain the glass of the crisp champagne. She handed the empty flute to Ivan, who smiled, his blue eyes lighting up. Once she got past his scary appearance, he seemed like a nice guy. I must go, but I hope to see you again soon, Jessica. Nice meeting you, Ivan. He tossed a strawberry at her before he left, which she caught with a grin. Taking a bite of the tart fruit, the champagne already warming her blood, she sauntered over to the table with a sway to her step, thanks to the tall wedge heels. But she wasn't complaining. The way Alex watched her made up for any lingering self-doubt, and his open admiration made her brave. As she sat in the chair next to his, then arranged her dress around her legs, she looked up at Alex from beneath her lashes. Open. She popped the last bite of the strawberry in his mouth, then smiled at him. The woman across the desk cleared her throat. Mr. Gorev, which set would you like to start with? Her nerves began to clamor again, but before she could freak out, Alex leaned over and whispered into her ear. For the last few months, I've known you would be mine, so I began to design your line of jewelry. You... you had this made when we hadn't even... She cut a glance to the people watching them with feigned disinterest, then back to Alex, who was watching her intently. Kissed yet? Yes. He leaned forward his chair creaking slightly as his weight shifted. You already belong to me. I just had not claimed you yet. What? He laughed, then held her hand in his, and kissed her knuckles. Princess Amoya, I am trying to shower you with jewels. The least you could do is pretend to be excited. When he put it that way, she felt like an ungrateful shit. I I'm sorry. Thank you. I'm just not used to this. People don't live like this where I'm from. Guys don't do things like this. Is not true. If your adoptive father had financial means, would he not have done the same thing for his wife? Well, yeah, he would. She sighed in defeat and tried to shake off her negative thoughts. He was right. Her dad would have given her mom the sun, moon, and stars if he could have. Her parents had the kind of loving relationship she wanted but she hadn't realized what being with Alex would mean financially to her. If him giving her nice things was going to be a way of life with them, if he truly needed to do it in order to feel happy, she could at least be gracious about it. Hell, he was giving her a personal jewelry line. And he said he'd had them made just for her. If she wasn't already sitting down, she was pretty sure she would have been swooning, like some leading lady in an old black-and-white movie. Alex, did you really design these pieces? I gave them ideas on what I wanted. We have great deal of jewelry in my family. It's tradition to buy our women beautiful things, and I have seen many pieces that belong to my ancestors. And you, Durgaya, are an excellent muse. A frisson of excitement heated her blood and she gave him a tentative smile. Thank you. Alex jerked his chin. I want the spring collection first. Of course, Mr. Gorev, the woman murmured, giving Jessica a quick, envious look, before nodding to the two men standing on either side of the table. With perfect synchronization, the two men placed boxes on the velvet before Jessica. The boxes were what looked like black leather, with a bulgary name in gold on top. The chair Jessica sat in creaked a bit as she leaned forward, eager to see what she'd inspired Alex to make, more than the actual jewelry itself. The woman slipped on a pair of what looked like white silk gloves and opened the first case. Her English was decent, as she said, The first piece in the spring collection is a pair of pink diamond and pearl earrings, the main stones are one and a half carats, while the pearls are an exceptional South Sea natural pearl. 
Jessica blinked rapidly, dazzled by the elegant beauty of the jewelry. It was simple. The pink diamond studs with the pinky-sized white pearls dangling beneath. But at the same time, crazy extravagant, because those were pink fucking diamonds. She tried to slow her breathing, and Alex squeezed her hand. He leaned over, his citrus and sandalwood cologne somehow reassuring her, and whispered, Someday, you will get used to this, and enjoy it. She was spared from answering by the woman revealing a stunning white pearl necklace with a large pink diamond in the center. The woman rattled on about the details, then showed Jessica a bracelet that went with it, as well as two cocktail rings. Her mind couldn't comprehend that these exquisite things now belonged to her, but that didn't mean she didn't want to clap and giggle just a little bit. They were so pretty. Alex said something in Italian, and the staff as well as Mox left the room, closing the door behind them and leaving her alone with him. It took some effort to tear her eyes away from the sparkly jewelry that seemed to call her name, but she managed to look at Alex with a big, genuine smile. It is amazing, Alex. Really, it takes my breath away. I can't believe you made this for me. No one has ever done anything like this for me before. She didn't even realize she was crying until he brushed his thumb beneath her eye. Shh, no tears. We'll ruin makeup. Crap, she said with a shaky laugh while she got herself under control. Right. Okay, I'm okay. It's just kind of overwhelming, but very much appreciated. Holy cow. He stood and grabbed another box, this one a long rectangle. As soon as he sat down, he tugged her out of her chair, then pushed his chair back. Kneel before me. She swayed on her heels in shock. What? I have a gift for you, but it will only be given to you if you are on your knees. We are in a public place, Alex, a really fancy one. We can't do that here. Jessica, I will not tell you again. On your knees. Now. No one will come in. Max will make sure of it. Swallowing hard, she nervously knelt.